Hello and welcome to Python for Informatics. I'm Charles Severance and I'm the teacher for the course. So I always like to start when I teach a course and talk about who should take the course. And I have written this book and I'm, I'm teaching this course with a with a notion that everybody should know some programming. Not necessarily that everyone is supposed to be a computer scientist or professional programmer, but I really believe that everyone should understand this world that we live in that's increasingly full of gadgets that have microprocessors in them and displays and 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 it, it I think it helps us understand our world and, and and make sense of it to know a little something about programming and most of the jobs that you're ever going to get these days are going to have something to do with technology and so just a little understanding um, you may become curious and you may want to learn more and you may want to learn about the web and databases and all kinds of things but Right now, I just want to give you a basic understanding of how things work. I'd, I'd be real happy if we made you curious. So I always like to start and talk a little bit about myself so you know who, who I am. I am at the University of Michigan, and I'm a clinical associate professor. And you can follow me on Twitter. I generally don't friend students on Facebook until long after they've graduated, and if they're really friends, so don't uh, do that. Um, you, but you can follow me on Twitter. I do like Twitter. I have all kinds of stuff on Flickr and other places, and I live my life uh, pretty openly, and so you can see what's going on. I have a long history in computer programming. Uh, I was one of the leaders of the Sakai Open Source Learning Management System that some of you may have used. Some of you may have used Moodle, the other open source learning management systems. Teaching and learning with technology is my research area, and uh, prior to that, I was a guy that did high-performance computing. That was my research area as well, and I have hobbies of off-road motorcycling, and, and I play hockey every week. You can see a little, uh, you can see a little picture of me there, and uh, the one year that we won the playoffs, and you see that I'm somewhere in there wearing a cast. I, I broke this finger during uh, the hockey playoffs, and I didn't want to get it cast until uh, that I broke it in the semifinals, and uh, I didn't want to didn't want to let go until the final so I played the final with a broken finger and we won and that's the cup that I'm holding there um, and then I got my finger cast uh, another thing like I said I've worked on Sakai a lot and I have even had the audacity to write the uh, a book about that experience and uh, open source is a very passion provoking thing and it's really quite wonderful and uh, so that's my tattoo you see the Sakai tattoo it's on the book. It's a real life tattoo. And as a matter of fact, since I finished as the lead, I still work on Sakai. I'm just not in charge anymore. I, uh, I've i put a ring of tattoos of all the different learning management systems. Uh, Blackboard, Desire to Learn, Canvas, Moodle, all the ones that implement the standard that I helped promulgate, uh, IMS Learning Tools Interoperability. And it is actually featured throughout this class. It's how we plug things together. Um, you might see things flashing by that have LTI in the URL, and that's because of this standard that I spent uh, four, four, four years of my life trying to get adopted, and it has been adopted, and I'm really very proud of that. And then sort of one last silly thing, you may have met me already without even knowing it. I uh, did a project where I had students do viral videos, and I tried to do a viral video myself, and so I did this iPad steering wheel mount, and it... Um, it has <clears throat> caused a lot of people to put a lot of mean comments about me about how what a smart or not so smart guy I'm really I really am. So feel free to take a look at that. I have a sense of humor. I hope that uh, hope that you figured that out by now. I didn't set out when I was young to be a programmer. I'm older than most of you, not necessarily all of you, but older than most of you. And uh, back when I was in high school, the notion of programming as an avocation was a rather rare thing. And I was a pretty smart guy. I knew my way around mathematics and physics and things like that. And I went to college uh, in 1975, in the fall of 1975. And uh, the advisor said, hey, take this programming class. We're putting all the freshmen into it. And so in I go. And um, they put me in this class. And this class started at a outrageously early time. Uh, it was uh, It was 10.30 in the morning. And I was enjoying myself greatly and playing a lot of video games. And that was when you actually went somewhere to play video games rather than played video games at your house. And I was really enjoying college. And I figured out that you could skip class and no one would care. 
And so I skipped, started skipping a lot of these really early 10.30 in the morning classes. And um, at one point, about halfway through the semester, I walk in and they're handing out pieces of paper with a midterm exam on it. And I look at this piece of paper and apparently I missed a lot of class because almost none of the words made any sense to me. Somehow that sort of shocked me into actually going to class and I picked it up quickly after that. Um, I really learned that programming was not so much about trying to please the computer but instead the computer would do anything I wanted if I would just learn its simple language and explain to it in its simple language what I wanted done that it would dutifully go off and do whatever it is that I wanted and uh, so I became a prodigy in the second half of this class and I got all the programming caught up and I did extra extra assignments and did all these cool things and uh, at the end of the class I got a D uh, I, I got a D, but then I changed my major to computer science and I really enjoyed it and it's been a great profession for me. Um, but I understand, I understand how you may be a little bit confused as you're learning this. And so I really understand it as I go through this and I really built this book and this course, this book and this course to address those who might be a little bit nervous. I give you lots of recorded videos, etc. So let's talk a little bit about the course. The book that I just mentioned is called Python for Informatics, Exploring Information. It's a book that I wrote. I wrote specifically to be different than most of the first programming books that you'll pick up. Uh, a lot of computer scientists see computer science and programming as applied mathematics. And when you get into advanced programming, you certainly have to have a really strong grasp, grasp of mathematics for a lot of reasons. But you don't need so much mathematics in the beginning. And so this book is uh, actually adapted from another computer science book. Uh, that was a free and open book that I adapted, but I took the math out, right? I took the math out and I put in all about data, and that's why I call it Exploring Information. It's free. You can download it as HTML. You can download it as a PDF. You can download it on iBooks. You can download it on EPUB Reader. I've got that version. You go to www.pythonlearn.com, and it's all free. Because of some little bits of complexity, I can't sell a paper copy of this book yet, um, at some point, I've got to rewrite a few more chapters of it to be completely belonging to me, and then I can actually sell a printed copy. But for now, it's actually only available to people who can somehow make it to Ann Arbor, Michigan, and buy it from our library. So one of the theories of this book and this course is open content. I, my book is free. My book is remixable. My lecture slides are Creative Commons Attribution. Uh, my recorded videos are sitting there on YouTube. You can use them any way you like or use them inside the context of my class, inside the context of your class. Use them as a study guide. I really don't care. Um, the videos are Creative Commons with attribution. And all the software that I'm using for this class, both the sort of online code and the Moodle and the Sakai that I'm using in the class, it's all open source as well. And when I finish the course, each time I finish it, I will make a zip file or a backup file from Moodle and a common cartridge to the point where if you have a Moodle or a Sakai, you can load this stuff into your, or even Blackboard or Desire to Learn, you should be able to load this stuff in and then remix the course to your own um, satisfaction. And, and the reason is, is that to me, these, these large scale courses, Everyone's so excited about how many students are in these large-scale courses and somehow that the students are going to take the course from me and, and I, be, I become sort of like well-known and et cetera. I, I really believe that the, in the long term, for this to really change education in the way that many of us want to see education changed, we have to teach and empower teachers. And so I'm hopeful that some of you watching this are actually teachers and are going to come in here and figure out how to make sense of this and use it in your own classroom. I want to empower the teachers to take this material and teach with this material and use me as a supplement to their own teaching rather than me doing all the teaching. I think that all these things need to be localized to different cultures, different cultural references, different examples, different languages. Just merely translating slight parts of things into a different language are just not, to me, satisfactory. And, uh, and so if you're a teacher, get a hold of me. 
uh, it, you know, in the early days, I might even want to have you teach on my infrastructure to test it out. Part of this is for me to build the cool stuff and see what everyone thinks, what works, what doesn't work. So this to me is the learning activity and the kind of ways we can use technology to enhance learning is a curiosity to me. And, I'm, and whether you're a teacher or not, I'm always curious about how effective this is working and how it can be improved. Because I'd like to come up with a way, I think we should all come up with a way to help each other teach better. And, and uh, So the Python that we're teaching is, uh, there's two versions of Python. One is Python 3, it's the newest and the latest, but it's not completely widely adopted yet. And so we still use the old Python 2. I, I don't really apologize for that because most of the industry is still using Python 2 and Python 3 is just there and people are slowly but surely converting to it. But it was designed as a many year transition where both Python 2 and Python 3 would continue. So I mentioned that the course that we're teaching is going to use some pretty cool technology and it's all open source and if you look at the URLs you can find where the source to all this stuff is, figure all this out and it's open source and you could adapt it or use it or install it or do whatever. So the, the, the course starts of course with uh, unless you're taking the course uh, on the Michigan campus when you'll start in our C tool system but if you're not taking the course for Michigan campus you start on this kind of enrollment site called Dr. Chuck Online. Dr. Chuck Online is where you sign in, where you put your profile in, you put your location information, and then you enroll in the classes and then it tracks your overall progress towards completion. Um, the actual course instruction is not done with Dr. Chuck Online. I have a copy of Moodle and this is Moodle. Uh, many of you may have used Moodle at various places around the world. I happen to be using Moodle because it's got software that allows me to connect it into Dr. Chuck Online most effectively. Um, I'd like to use more, not just Moodle in this situation, but I'd like to be able to have launch multiple learning management systems. But you'll go through Moodle and you'll see, for example, that um, you know that there'll be there'll be things like a discussion forum, and then things you're supposed to do, and these will sort of be ordered. It's kind of like an outline of the course. Here's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to read this, take this lecture, watch this, do this, turn in the problem. This is just kind of a mock-up right now. Um, as I put the lectures up, it'll, it'll, it'll build quite nicely. Now, one of the uh, interesting things here is I've got an auto grader. An auto grader is, makes it so that you can get immediate feedback on whether your programs are right or wrong. So when you click on one of these auto graders, you actually go into another program. And so this is the auto grader. And the idea is, is that you are to write a program that uses raw input to prompt a user for their name and welcomes them. And I'll, I'll give you some animated walkthroughs so you see this. Uh, the first few I will show you exactly what to do click for click so you get used to it. Um, these first few programs are just simple but it's more to get you used to writing a program and then running it through the auto grader. And so the idea is you've written the program somewhere on your laptop or your computer and you've debugged it and you've got it working and this particular program only has two lines of Python in it it prompts for a name and then prints the name out. But you come and then you would paste in the working program right here and then you would press this check code button. Press the check code button and then it does some thinking. It looks, it runs your code and checks to see if your output matches what it's supposed to say. So this is the output of your program and this is the output your, your, that the program is supposed to produce. And first it checks to see if there's any mistakes and gives little notes and tells you where you're mismatching and then, then it, then it finishes and you matched okay and that's great and then what it does is it does a few more checks to see if you're sneaky or cheating or just whatever so it'll give you little notes to say hey you're supposed to do this and this and you seem to not use this or that both to catch you and <clears throat> but also if you miss something it might help you um, when it's all said and done it'll say congratulations the exercise is complete then you press the submit grade button and then the grade all the grades are zero or one you're it's is submitted back to Moodle so let me go back here so that means that your grade will come back into this Moodle and if you go down a little farther down here you will see um, you will see a grades and then you'll be able to immediately check to see if your grade has been updated and inside of Moodle you will see a bunch of grades and then you will see your progress on each of those grades now, the other thing that happens is that the grade then moves back up. It takes 15 minutes for the grade to make it back here, but this is kind of like your overall course progress.
right? And this little bar moves across. This, this one here says it's one. And that means I've completed it, right? I've got all the points. Actually, that's the Python playground that I've got all the points in. And, and away you go. And so that's how it works. We go from launching into the course. We do all our learning in here. We launch into the auto grader. And then we type our program in here, hit the check, and if it says your exercise is complete, then the submit grade appears, and then you send your grade, and the grades work their way back up, and at some point you pass the class when you reach the passing grade. And again, I'm going to come back and touch on this and give you some explicit instructions on how to do this. There's also a threaded discussion called Piazza. This is a, a code that's uh, that I'm using to help the threaded discussion. You can get help from the other students in the class, give help. It's just a place for us to meet and to talk to each other. And uh, when you're all done, you will end up in a map. And so this is the map sort of early before registration map. We've got 121 students in the class. And here you see all where all the students are at. They're, they're all over the place, right? We've already got students from all over the world in the class. We have 121. By the time it starts, well, there'll be many more. You'll be able to see how many there are. And uh, these change color. They start out at green, and then they move through sort of pink and yellow. It's kind of like horse ribbons. Um, so the uh, when you are successful, you will get a blue ribbon. Now, culturally, <laughs> the ribbon color is not uniform culturally. But for most cultures, uh, blue ribbons are number one, and red ribbons are number two. And I think yellow are number three, and pink are number four, and green is somewhere in the bottom. So basically, you can see this as we all start out as green when we start, and then as we make progress, we go to like things like yellow and pink, and then when we totally achieved everything, we uh, we get a, a a blue. And so this is the Python playground where people can play. So it's a lot easier to get a blue ribbon in the Python playground. Okay, um, and so you, you'll notice I sort of glossed over this. There are two classes. One class is the Python for Informatics class, and that is a structured class where I will be participating in it on a daily or weekly basis and other students and I am mixing my off-campus and on-campus students and so it has to start a certain time because I'm using it both for my off-campus and on-campus students so you'll see another hundred or so students come in from my on-campus class and they'll be going through it too at the exact same time so this is a mixing of my on-campus students and my off-campus students and I think that's particularly awesome and cool um, and so if you're going to enroll in Python for Informatics, you've got to enroll you know, sometime between January 14th and 28th. I'm not going to give you forever to catch up. But if you're t watching this sometime other than January 14th to the 20th, and I'll, and I'll give the class again after that, but the Python for Informatics is when I or someone else is monitoring the class actively. But if you just want to go in and do the problems by yourself, I will, I will as I put the problems into the Python for Informatics, I will also put them into Python Playground. The Python Playground, you can go in anytime you like. Go as long as you like, do it all by yourself, earn a blue ribbon, there you go. You earned a blue ribbon in the Python Playground. It'll be pretty much the same as in Python for Informatics. The difference is Python for Informatics is at a given time, during a given time period. And that's, that's when I'm going to teach the class. That's when I'm going to teach the class. And I hope to have other teachers teach the class, and so they can have their own version of this and they can teach it when they want on whatever schedule that they want and if I get a lot of students that want to join up I can open another thing and if I get enough students maybe I'll teach it in the middle of the summer or something I can do this anytime but I want to make it so that there's a time for me to focus on the class to sort of be in the class with you so you can do the Python playground anytime starting in right now and the problems and the assignments will be pretty much the same um, you can use the Python Playground to pre-study, but I don't have it set up yet. The Python Playground it, it will grow along with the class. Once I'm done with the class the first time, the Python play Playground will be the entire and complete class. And then I might tweak it each time I teach it. That's how I generally do classes. And Python Playground will always have been the last time I taught the class. But you will stay in Python Playground forever and ever and ever, and all your little, all your little blue ribbons and stuff will stay forever and ever in Python Playground. Python Playground is set up so that even if I change the grading rules, if you get a blue ribbon in Python Playground, you could have a blue ribbon forever and ever and ever.
There we go. Okay, so uh, welcome to the class. Bring your friends. I think we will have a lot of fun. This is, uh, it's not as sophisticated as things like Udacity or Coursera or edX because I'm it. I'm writing software, I'm the teacher, I'm the, I'm the everything. But with great responsibility comes great flexibility. And so I am really enjoying and looking forward to this class and looking forward to hearing from you and the comments that you might have as we go through the class. Hello, and welcome to Python for Informatics. Right now we're going to cover Chapter 1. I'm Charles Severance from the University of Michigan, and I'm the author, and I'll be your lecturer for this online lecture of the first chapter of the book. This lecture and my slides and the book, as a matter of fact, are all open. Open content, open materials. They're copyright Creative Commons attribution. And this video recording is also copyright Creative Commons attribution. It's important to be explicit about copyright, and so I say it right at the beginning. So if you have not yet done it, please install Python. You're going to have to do it sooner or later, and you actually might as well do it before this lecture. Uh, you can listen to this lecture, obviously, without Python, but it allows you to play with some of the things. And, you know, we might even do a little bit of Python in this lecture and show you Python in the lecture. And so, you know, you can go along if you have Python in another window. Um, there is pythonlearn.com slash install.php. has instructions for Microsoft Windows and Macintosh. And it's not on this slide, but I just uploaded... Uh, instructions on how to do this on a Raspberry Pi, the new really cool $25 uh, computer. And they are really easy and straightforward. They're complete screen recordings, step by step, 10, 15 minutes at the maximum. You can stop them, you can start them, you can download them to your hard drive. They will walk you through what it takes to install Python if needed, install a text editor if needed, and then run your very first Python program and you're going to have to run a Python program. So this is as good a time as any to stop and get that done and then come back, okay? So now back to the introduction. So computers basically want to be helpful. They are programmed. Matter of fact, this is a microprocessor. This is really just an electrical part. It's got wires and circuits inside of it and Somebody spent a lot of engineering time to make it so that these pins in the back take instructions from us, from operating systems, from the hard drive, from the memory. Instructions come into here and then results come out. It's really sort of a very programmable hand calculator and it's our job to put instructions in. This thing, in a sense, is wired to be curious about what's next, right? It's like, it, it's like, Tell me what you want to do next. What do you want to do next? What do you want to do next? And after that, what do you want to do next? And it just happens to do that a billion or so times a second. And so that's sort of the, the low level piece. And But you can also think if you have like a PDA, something like this, all the buttons on here are some kind of, you know, what's next, right? Each of those is sort of something begging for my attention. Some application developer who's built a really cool application and says, Please use me. Please click me. I am sort of nothing without you. We com humans are the things that sort of cause computers to start doing something. And this will sit here happily until I've caused it to do something. Now, whoa, whoa, hope it's still okay. Yeah, seems to be fine. Seems to be fine. Takes a lick in and keeps on ticking. So these anyone can use, right? They say even animals can use a Macintosh. Uh, smartphone. Um, and so you don't have to be a programmer. But to get this to do what you want, you need to learn a different language. And we need to learn the language of the instructions to tell it what to do. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to learn how to talk to this. Yo! Because it's asking us a question, we have to give the answer. So what's a programmer? A programmer is somebody who writes a program which is a script or a set of instructions that tell one of these kinds of things what it is that they're supposed to do. And sometimes you're writing a program like Moodle, an open source learning management system, or Sakai, another open source learning management system, 
And sometimes you'll even get paid to do that, right? Sometimes you do it for free, sometimes you get paid. Sometimes you write things for yourself. And, uh, and, but if you think about it, all these applications on my iPhone, somebody's making some money off of these. They may not be able to quit their job, but a surprising number have been able to quit their job or start small companies. Maybe not gigantic companies, but small companies. So these, these people that can put applications inside of our computers are programmers because they understand the way that we talk to these computers. And part of what I'm going to try to do is to get you to move from the mindset of the end user who thinks of this as something just to click on to the mindset of the programmer who's kind of on the inside trying to get out to you. So that's as we sort of move from user to programmer, we move from outside to inside and we think of the world out there. It's like, what are they going to put? push? What button are they going to push? So here's kind of a picture of that. So on the outside, we're users. We click on buttons. We click on websites. We click on buttons on our phones, et cetera, et cetera. But what's really going on inside of all that is there's a computer with a bunch of hardware inside of that. And it has inside of it data, networks, other information. And software is what makes all that make sense. And so part of what I want you to do is I want you to stop thinking about how to use these things from the outside and we move to becoming a programmer. We're someone on the inside. We're with the CPU. We're with the memory. We are with the network connection. We are doing things on behalf of the user and presenting them back up to the user. So why be a programmer? Now, this class is specifically not trying to turn you into a professional programmer, even though I'd be very proud if after five, ten more classes, you were a professional programmer. But that's not the purpose of this class. Sometimes you just want to get something done. You got an Excel spreadsheet at work, and the data is not right. You got the data from somebody else, and it's got like extra spaces where it shouldn't have it, or the missing fields, or something. You got to do something to it that Excel can't do, and you're you're stuck like saying, "Oh, I want to, I want to mess with this data and put it in Excel so I can do my job," but it's a pain in the neck, and I have to sit and bring it into a text editor like Microsoft Word and go line by line and make all kinds of mistakes and clean the data up. You can write a program to do that. And that's the kind of programs we're going to do. Programs that serve our needs inside the computer, but to serve our needs. Professional programmers tend to build things for other people to use, right? They, they tend to build things that everyone else does. But we're going to build stuff primarily for ourselves. So what is code? What is software? We use these words pretty much independently, a program. It's really a sequence of stored instructions. We learn the language that this talks, and then we will feed the instructions in one at a time. It takes them one at a time. It gives us back a result. We give it a next one. To give it back, in, out, in, out. So it's really a sequence of stored instructions. But it's kind of more than that. It's, it's sort of like our creativity. And if you've been using some of my software, like my MOOC software, I spent about a month writing all that stuff. And it's like, it's me. I mean, I'm, it's my vision of how cool stuff ought to work, right? And so it's more than just getting something done. It's also a sense of pride and a sense of accomplishment, especially if you're giving something that other people can make use of. It's really, I think it's very creative. And it's what attracted me to being a programmer in the first place, is that I could, I could leverage the capabilities inside of here, and I could do things, the cool things, on behalf of the user. So code, software, a program. So let's get a non-technical example of this. So I'll have you link out to the YouTube <coughs> for this. This is the Macarena. The Macarena is a song that has with it a well-known dance that everyone seems to know or either get taught very quickly. So I'll, I'll stop and let you uh, watch the Macarena and then come back. So welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, in a sense, what we've got there is a program, a program for human beings. Um, and maybe you learned that at a club or something, and they told you what to do next. Well, I can teach you how to do the Macarena by writing a simple program right now. So here's my Macarena. While the music plays, means you do it over and over and over again, to the beat, that's kind of like computers. They do things in a beat. They happen to have three billion beats a second, but as it were. So we're going to do this multiple times. So we have this whole group of instructions that we're going to do, right? 
Uh, left hand out and up, right hand out and up, flip left hand, flip right hand, left hand to right shoulder, right hand to left shoulder, etc., etc. Now, this particular little program has a mistake in it. Actually, several. I want you to look and see if you can find the mistakes in the program. Okay, so here are the places that have the mistake, right? The mistake is right hand to the back of the head and left hand to right hit, not hip. Now, if you're in a bar and you take a ham and you hit somebody in the back of the head, that's not very nice when you're dancing to this song. These are what's called bugs. Now, a human reading this would say, oh, I think they meant to say hand here. But a computer is much more literal than people. We'll, we'll see a couple of exercises where we'll see that people can correct little mistakes like this, but computers, they cannot, right? So we have to fix these bugs, and we have to say right hand, and we have to say hip when we mean hip. So we have to be explicit. Computers do exactly what we say. They don't do what we mean to do. So let's clear that. Here's another example, okay? Let's see how this comes out. You're supposed to count the number of times the word the appears in this sentence. Count it. And the word the, how many times? Okay. It's your turn. Now here, this is not something humans are good at. I moved it around, I played a little music, I confused you, I put a picture of a clown car in the upper left hand corner, etc., etc., etc. Now it turns out that computers, once we tell them what to do, are very good at concentration. It can easily go through 30 words and find the most common word, or three million words and find the most common word. And it'll never make a mistake. But we first have to give it a set of instructions. So I don't want you to learn this right now, but this is a Python program. Let's say that I wanted to let you count words in files. Okay? I say, hey, I know how to program Python. I'll send you an email and I'll send you this program. Just stick it into Python and it'll count words for you. Right? You got a million words, a million lines in a file. You want to find the most common word. And so, so here we go. So I will send you this file called words.py. I spend a little time. It's a friendly gift to you. And this is what I type in. Now I'll give you a kind of an outline of what this is going to do. The uh, first thing it's going to do is open a file and read it. Then it's going to split the lines and files into words based on the spaces. Then it's going to run through and accumulate numbers like, you know, this word is one, this word is one. Oh, I saw that one again, so I turned that to two. That's what this does. It's a loop. It goes round and round and round, one for each word. Then what we're going to do is we're going to another, write another loop that's going to figure out which is the most common word by looking through all those little histograms that we built up. And then it's going to print those things out at the very end. And this can certainly do Python words.py and read clown.txt and tell us that the word the occurs seven times. But you know, it can go, it can find out that a different thing has the word two and occurs 16 times. And it's just as fast. And it's so, so, the, so yeah, you have to learn a language and you have to tell it what to do. But once you do, it'll do it for a million or a billion words and be happily. And so you don't have to do menial work once you understand the way to instruct the computer to do menial work. So, we always start all programming classes with hardware architecture. I, I don't think it's essential, so don't get too excited about it. It's a good use of terminology so we can have some words. I can say like CPU and you don't freak out, or memory, or RAM, or a disk drive, and you don't freak out. Um, I don't want to turn you into a hardware nut. I just want you to kind of have a few words so we can talk about what's going on inside because, in a sense, we're going to be writing programs to do stuff, both data, instructions, etc. So, 
here's some hardware that I just bought a couple of weeks ago and I'm really in love with and that is the Raspberry Pi. This is a single board, board computer. Um, it's got storage on an SD card right there. That's the operating system and the data. And it's got the uh, uh, um, both a microprocessor and the memory is in here as well. And it hooks up with USB and HDMI and various things. And if you want, in this course, you probably can do all of the homework using a Raspberry Pi if you so desire. So this is what hardware really looks like. It's kind of the inside of something. Normally it's in some kind of case and you don't get to see it. And that's what it looks like. It's kind of got this green and little silver and gold. It's, I think they're very beautiful. They're very pretty. A lot of engineering goes into making these things. And, uh, and so we kind of have a block diagram of what's going on in here. And there's some, just some terminology. The, the brains of it all, well, we draw this block diagram partly because, and here's is a, a, from a, well, parts are coming off of this. Eh, I don't know what that was. It's okay. He's broken anyways. And if you have a desktop computer, this is more like what it looks like inside. This part is called a motherboard. And it's kind of like the thing that connects and brings everything together. It's got a bunch of wires. Each one of those little lines here is wire. It's covered with sort of a lacquer. And then there are things that penetrate the board and then connect to various chips. And this whole thing is what this picture is. But it really is connecting a number of different components. The central processing unit that I've spoken of before, put that back down, central processing unit is the closest thing a computer has to a brain, but it's barely a brain. It's really just a super fast programmable calculator. It, we make it flexible by our creativity when we write programs. We make it seem intelligent. It's people that make it intelligent by taking our own knowledge and putting it in. This is not itself intelligent. There's nothing to fear from this. It's just not that smart. So this is the thing that's programmed to ask the question, what's next? And then we have to have a set of instructions that feed this thing really fast, billions of times a second. And that's what this is. This is the random access memory. And we have memory chips, and, and they're connected together through the motherboard. So we have the main memory, and we have the central processing unit. And this is where our high-speed instructions come from. This is where our high-speed data is stored. And this is the thing that asks what next, and it reads its instructions from here. And you'll see they're kind of like, they're not quite connected together, but eventually they're kind of connected together. Don't feel too bad about this hardware. It's all old, and it's all broken, and it can't be hurt. So, the next thing we got is input-output devices. I'll go back to my Raspberry Pi. So the Raspberry Pi has a USB that you can connect a mouse or a keyboard. It has a HDMI that you can connect a monitor to. It has an Ethernet connector. So these are all examples of input-output devices. And, uh, and then the last thing on the screen is the secondary memory. So this RAM on the Raspberry Pi, the CPU, the central processing unit, and the RAM are all in this one chip in the middle. It's called SOC or system on a chip where they put more parts there. So in a sense, they collapsed this and this and a lot of this all down in a Raspberry Pi to one little guy. But it's still architecturally the same thing. There's a central processing unit, there's main memory, there's graphics cards, etc. So input-output devices, oh, and this, big, this guy has input-output devices too, like USB and keyboard and monitor, etc. So they're, they're very similar, it's just this is new and this is old. Everything gets smaller when it gets newer. Okay. Okay, so the last thing we've got to talk about is the secondary memory. Oh. When the power goes off, these things sort of go away. The data in this RAM goes away. It's just designed to be really fast, but not permanent. So we need a place that's permanent. That's what secondary storage is. That's what, that's what this secondary storage is for. This is permanent. This is fast, and it cha-cha-cha-cha-cha really fast. And, um, but this is permanent and this is slower, okay? So the secondary memory, I've got two kinds of secondary memory. Oh, dropped it on the floor. Two kinds of secondary memory. I'll start with the Raspberry Pi. The secondary memory of the Raspberry Pi 
is this SD card. It's like a disk drive. It still is permanent, does not require power to maintain its data. The data stays permanent. So in the future we will see more of these flash style drives and SD style drives. So the Raspberry Pi is kind of alluding to the future. There's a disk drive in here. It's not really a disk. It's also flash memory. But in the old days, in the good old days, back when I was a kid, we, our secondary memory was a disk drive and it had platters and it spun and it made a satisfying noise and it would move in and out to read data and I'll show you a video of this just in a bit and so this would record the data on the magnetic platters and then when the power is taken off the data would still be magnetized and then it would go and move to the right spot spin it around and read the data and again this is kinda messed up in a pretty bad way so there we go central processing unit brains of the operation main memory fast but goes away when we power off input output devices keyboards etc and then storage that has maintains its data across power cycles okay and I just said all that okay so then the question is where do you belong in this where do programs live where do we write and the answer is we kind of live in the memory right what we do is we put our programs into the memory and then the CPU pulls the programs out of the memory so we have to write our programs and put them into the memory when we start them and run them we're really loading them into the memory so they can be fed rapidly to the CPU now the computers don't really execute Python like if X less than 3 print but that's what we tend to want to write because what the computers really execute is a thing called machine languages which is a series of zeros and ones that pretty much translate directly to what's on these pins there's voltages that go up and down that's called machine language source code like Python is written in a way that's most convenient well at least more convenient machine language is what's most convenient for the hardware so we either we have to translate from source code to machine language and that's what the Python program does for us. We write in Python and Python translates to machine language for us. So I got a couple of videos that give you a sense of how this all works. We'll start with uh, CPU and what this is going to do is this is going to show you the intensity of how much electricity. The thing that go, gets hot inside your computer is this little guy right here and we're going to see in this video just how hot it can get. Okay, so welcome back. So the next thing I'm going to show you, I showed you a hard disk that sort of didn't work, but we're actually going to show you a real short video on how a hard disk works that someone took the cover off and actually applied power to it. You don't want to do this yourself if you have a hard drive. Um, I've read, and some people say that you can do it for a, for a few minutes and then the drive kind of destroys itself if you run it with the, the cover off. So let's take a look at this. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about Python. Python is a programming language. Python is a way that we communicate. Now, Python wasn't invented by computers. We invented Python as humans as a way to encapsulate our instructions. And there's lots of different programming languages. Python, JavaScript, C++, tons of them. Python, just one of them that we were happy to teach in this class. Now, I'll start with a little Harry Potter reference. Parcel tongue is the language of serpents and those who converse with them. An individual who can speak tar's parcel tongue is known as a parcel mouth, and it's a very uncommon skill, and it may be even hereditary. Nearly all known parcel mouth are descended from Salazar Slytherin. There's our Harry Potter reference. Python is the language of the Python interpreter and those who can converse with it. We're going to converse with the inside of a computer pretty soon. An individual who can speak Python is known as a Pythonista. It is an uncommon skill and may be hereditary. It may not be hereditary too. Nearly all known Pythonistas use software initially developed by Guido Van Rossum. Guido Van Rossum, this guy right here, 
Yo Guido, what's up? Uh, let's put a mustache on him. Yo Guido. <laughs> Sorry, I should be nice to him. He is the inventor of Python. Python's over 20 years old. He invented it to make it an easy language, but was both easy and powerful. And that's why it's a great language to start uh, your learning with. It's a powerful language, but it's also designed to be easy to use. Can anyone guess what the reason for the Python language name is? So let's see. Python was named after a famous British comedy show that was in the 60s and 70s and 80s, I think, named Monty Python, Monty Python's Flying Circus. And so, I, and I, I think he was trying to capture a playfulness, a certain kind of silly, fun aspect of Python. And, uh, and so there we go. Enough of that. We done? Yeah, okay, the music's done now. Thank heaven for that. Okay, so again... This is a language, and this Guido, he made it for us. He made choices. He said, we're going to put a colon here, and I think we should like indent this and do these things, and he made, he's made choices. And, <clears throat> and some languages have people like some different better than others. It's kind of an artistic choice. And, and I like to kind of equate this to learning a language to speak with people, with humans, you know? Um, you know, when we're a baby, we don't know how to talk, and we start babbling, blah, 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 blah. Maybe we even just start crying is the first thing that we do. But we're like, we're like on this strange planet. we got to talk to this thing. So we have to learn its language, and we're not going to learn it right away. You don't go like, hey, study all night, and you know this language. There's no way you can do that. Although Rosetta Stone might be a good way to teach programming. Maybe I should take some of their ideas. So... The thing that's different about learning a human language versus learning a programming language is that when we're learning a human language, we're talking to a human, and they're going to do correction for us. So if, if I say a word incorrectly, like mama, right? I don't know. That was pretty dumb. Someone listening said, oh, I know what he said. I know what he said. But Python and computers aren't really listening. They're kind of dumb. They can't really correct our mistakes for us because they don't know what we're trying to say. They really don't. They're very literal. And so it is really common um, in the beginning to get upset because we say something we think is cute and it says syntax error. And we go like, okay, uh, let me try this. And it says syntax error. And so we, we get this notion. I had this problem when I was first programming. It's like, I would like, here's my program. Do you like it? It would say syntax error. Now, the, the problem is, is this, they could reword the messages to be a little nicer, perhaps. But the syntax error isn't really a judgment on you that says you're a failure. The syntax error is really saying, I, I don't know what you're saying. I'm confused. I only know a few things. And what you just said is not something I understand. So instead of thinking of the program, uh, the Python is some kind of evil, demonic monster that just hates you and just keeps saying syntax there, think of Python more like a dog, right? The dogs, what can you talk to a dog? Can you say, lovely sunset we're having to a dog? Because dog's not going to understand that. The dog does understand some things like food, bath, walk, but it doesn't understand the accumulated works of Shakespeare. So when you talk to a dog, you got to be careful to talk the subset of the vocabulary that the dog knows. And so this is a key thing when you're first learning. There's only a certain set of things that Python understands. It turns out it's easier to teach you Python than to teach Python to listen to whatever you have to say. Things like Google make it seem intelligent. So that you can kind of type anything to Google, right? Well, yeah, billions of dollars later, Google, for at least like short things, can seem like it knows what you're talking about. In terms of programming, it's a lot easier for you to figure out the exact precise way to say it rather than make it so that we have to spend a billion dollars on something like Python to figure out what you mean in your programs. 
So let's start talking to Python. We're talking to Python. So if you've installed Python properly, whether it's on a Mac or a Windows or on a Raspberry Pi, uh, at some point you'll be in a terminal program and you'll type Python to make Python run in interactive mode. You might have to type C colon backslash something something Python on Windows, but at some point you're running Python. Now Python itself is a program. It's a program that is asking you to type the Python language. Now the interesting thing is, is you've got this Chevron prompt here and it's kind of another version of what's next. I told you that this hardware was designed to always want the next instruction to come in. Well, Python, once we start it, it really has no idea what to do. It is, is waiting for you to tell it what to do. Okay, so let me see if I can pop something up here. So here we go. Clear that. And now I'm going to type, get this a little closer, I am going to start Python. So it's the operating system now is asking me what next, and I'm saying, oh, the thing I want to do next is I want to run Python. So here we are, we're sitting in the Python interpreter, and it's asking what next? Okay, now I, it's like I just landed on a, on like a planet, and it's like, take me to your leader. Take me to your leader. That's what you always say when you land on a planet and are confronted by some kind of a robot. And it says, syntax error. Remember, it's a dog. It should just say arf, right? You could say, take me to your leader. Roof! Okay. Um, are you friendly? I don't need to spell the thing I spelled friendly right. Syntax error. Are you dumb? Syntax error. Pretty dumb. I hate computers. Syntax error. It doesn't seem to have a sense of humor. Try this. Knock, knock. Knock, knock. No sense of humor. So here's the problem. It wants us, it's, it doesn't hate us. It, it just wants to know what we want done. So we need to know the Python language. Luckily, I know a bit of Python. So I'm going to say, hmm, hey, Python, I'm going to want some data. I want to make a variable named x, just a little place in your memory. Go find it. Go find one of your spare places in memory. And I want you to put uh, 100 in that, OK? Do that. Now it's happy, because I know the language. Bonjour. So we know the language. Now, but it's saying what next? So we have to put a program in. So let's see. I'm going to say, hey, Python, I'm going to make a variable called y, another area in your memory labeled y. And I want you to go back and remember that x I gave you before? Go get that one back and add 50 to that and put that in y. So now I've got something in x and I've got something in y. And uh, let's print y out. What's in y? Go look in y where you put that and let's print it out. 150. So we're doing simple things, and actually most programming is a series of simple things. The, the number of statements, different statements you can do is, uh, is, is relatively few. So we are talking to Python. Come back, let's run back to the slides. There we go. And so we give it a series of commands, and you can do the same thing sitting on your computer. And you type exit or quit with parentheses to get out of it when you're done and that ends the interactive session. Now, this is interactive Python, where it's asking us command by command, and then interpreting or running those commands as we run the command, as we finish. So, they'll be, you'll be doing it in some kind of a window. There's a different way to do it on Windows. My install documentation on pythonlearn.com gives you all of this, tells you everything to do. So now we're basically talking to Python. So, what language? I gotta still teach you this language. 
So what do we say when we get a hold of Python? What kinds of things? Just like any language, a human language, there's like vocabulary, there's basic words, there's variables and reserved words in Python. Then we kind of combine those in lines to make sentence-like structures that themselves are not a full story. And then we kind of make a story out of it. Now, the story is in the Python language, not sort of English or French or a, or, or a human language, but it still is kind of a, a sequence of small pieces that build to make bigger pieces that then build to make a whole program. So here is, again, that same program, right? That same program of how to count the most common word in a file. And I mentioned before that it starts by opening the file. It reads the data from the file, splits it into words, counts them all up, and then finds the biggest one and then prints it out. So, you know, name is like a word. Equals is another word. Raw is a word. All these things are words. Each of these things is like a sentence. There are blocks of stuff that are kind of paragraphs. There's kind of a paragraph, a paragraph. I for sure different color here. Here's like a paragraph, and a paragraph, and a paragraph. And then at the end of the day, once you kind of understand it, and you will understand this before it's all over, this is kind of like a story, right? It holds together. It has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Again, don't worry about the detail. We got plenty of chapters to cover this detail. Don't worry about this particular program. I'm just sort of getting into the sense that you'll get it. But we'll start simple. So the first thing that you got to know how to do in Python is know what not to do. Or when you use these reserved words, they have very special meaning to Python. It's like when you say, I don't think you're going to get any food today to a dog. The dog hears the word food and nothing else. So food is a reserved word for dogs. Walk, bath, there are other reserved words. So what it really means is you can't use these for anything other than what they mean to Python. So print tells it to print things. Uh, return is used in functions. Else, if, these are words that if Python sees the word if, it's like this means something. Don't use it for any other purpose except its stated purpose. We'll learn what those are. Now if we talk about sentences, sentences are kind of in Python like a line that kind of have pieces to them. So here is three pieces of code. One is x equals 2. That says, take and find me a piece of memory in your RAM, allocate it, label it x, and stick 2 in it. This is kind of like a move 2 into x. Then this says, go get x, add 2 to it, and then put the sum back into x. Again, little sentences that are kind of like subject predicate, right? Especially with this assignment. It's kind of a, and then print, print's a reserved word. This one of the, was on the list in the previous slide. And then go read that variable. So these are like three sentences in our new little language. OK, so that's sentences. Now paragraphs. Let's talk about paragraphs. Paragraphs are the combination of sentences to make sort of a thought together, multiple sentences, multiple lines. So the interactive Python that I just showed you is fine for running one, two, or five, or six commands. But ultimately, we're going to write much longer bits of Python. And so we write what's called a Python script or a Python program, and we put these in a file. And, we, and, and if you went through the prerequisite, you will see have seen me edit in a text editor, save the file, and then run from the Python file. Okay. And so we call these files, put .py on the end of them, .py on the end of them, and we're giving Python a script to execute. <clears throat> so interactive, you're typing directly into Python, and it's doing it right as you're talking. You're still doing it in an order, and the order does matter. In a script, you type it all into a file once and say, Python, do it all. Now, when you write one of these things, there are patterns for combining these. There are things that we do to these lines that sort of treat them differently. It's like a recipe, a set of instructions. Start at the beginning, but it's a little more complex than that. Some steps are just sequential. Some steps might be skipped. Some steps we do multiple times. And other times we have kind of like a set of steps we do over and over again. 
So here's some pictures. And here's a four lines of Python, a little simple paragraph. And it's got a sentence that says x equals 2. Print x, x equals x plus 2, which says go grab the old value of x, add 2 to it, stick it back in x, and print x. So the output of this program is 2, then 4. Because x was 2, we printed it, then we added 2 to it, and then we printed it again, so it was 4. Now, these flowcharts, don't worry, I'm not going to make you draw these. I just draw these in case, cognitively, it makes it easier for you to understand what's going on. So, x equals 1 is the first step. Sequentially, it just continues on. It runs the print. x equals x plus 1 runs the print. So, this is just straight through. It'll make more sense when we see a little more convoluted things. So, this program just starts naturally. Python starts at the beginning and works its way down through the end. That's sequential stuff. That's the normal order of business. Now, a conditional is a step that may or may not get executed. If all we did was sequential steps, programs would be kind of dull, right? They would just be like, blah, 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 stop. So there's things like, oh, what if you do this or what if you do that? And so we do things like, if, if you have more than 40 hours, I'm going to pay you a different rate than if I have under 40 hours. Those kinds of things are if, the word if. So in Python, the way we express this is we use the keyword if. So we say x equals 5, and then we say if x is less than 10, this is a question that's being asked. Is x less than 10 or not? Yes or no? If it is, we execute the indented bit. If it's not, we skip it. In this case, since x is 5, we execute it. And then we come back here, and we're going to do another one. If x is greater than 20, well, this turns out to be false. So we skip that. So bigger does not run. That line never runs. So we, the output is smaller, fini. Now, here we can take a look at it sort of in the picture diagram. We run x equals 5. We ask a question. This doesn't hurt x to ask the question. Is x less than 10? The answer is yes. So we kind of drive down this little path. We print smaller, and then we rejoin the freeway is x less than 20? No. So we skip and we continue. So this never gets executed. So you can think of it either way. You can think of it either sort of like gestalt, say if this is true, do what's indented. Or you can imagine sort of a little car driving down a highway making turn choices as it goes. They're equivalent. Over time, it's probably you'll just start seeing this and start thinking this way. But sometimes it helps to think about it this way for a little while. Okay. Now, the next thing I want to show you is repeated steps. Steps that happen over and over and over again. Okay? And that again, when I said, oh, computers are good at handling a billion words, well, that means it has to have a loop or a repeated section, one for each word. It's going to do something for each word. And so, um, so here we go. And in Python, Let's pick a different festive color. Let's pick purple as a festive color. So here's our program. Starts at the beginning, sets the variable n to 5, and then a keyword, reserved word while. While n greater than 0, again, this is asking a question. This is asking a question. Is n greater than 0? That's a question. If yes, we're going to do this. If no, we're going to do that. Over here, if it's true, we're going to execute the indented part and then come back and do it again. If it's false, we're going to skip down. So it's kind of like an if, except it keeps doing it over and over and over again. So it comes in, sets n to 5. Is n greater than 0? Yeah, sure. So we print n, out comes 5. Then it says n equals n minus 1, so n becomes 4. Oh, we can change colors. Then it goes back up. Goes back up and asks the question again. n is 4. It's still greater than 0, so it comes through. Prints out 4, subtracts 1, so n is now 3. Goes back up. Is n 0? Is n greater than 0? Yes, it is. Print out 3, subtract 1, now it's 2. So out come 3 and 2. Then it goes back up. Still greater than 0? Yes, it is. Print out 2. Or oh, wait, now it's 1. <coughs> Now we subtract 1, it becomes 0. 
Is it greater than zero? No, and we finally leave. And we finally drop down. And so the last thing that comes out is the print of blast off. So this is a loop. The notion that we're going to run this little bit of code five times. <coughs> Excuse me. We're going to run this little bit of code five times. And loops have these things we call iteration variables. And that is this n. It's a variable that specifically is changing each time it goes through the loop. And that way we can sort of control the loop. We can decide when it starts and when it stops. We can tell if we're at the beginning or the end, or the first one or the last one. We'll do a lot of stuff with loops. This is an iteration variable because we iterate, repeatedly iterate through the loop. Okay? Any questions? <laughs> Can't do questions. Okay. So now, if we go back to the little story that I... You've got several chapters to understand. Don't worry. You actually got like through chapter 9. So don't try to understand this program right now. I'm just trying to give you a sense of what the picture is going to be, right? So, so here are some sequential statements because they aren't indented. Those five lines are sequential. They just go one after the other. Then we have four, and it's indented. This is a loop. This is going to run a bunch of times. Then we're done with that. We do some more sequential stuff. Now we have a for loop, and that's going to run a bunch of times. And then we have an if, which may or may not run. So these, this little block of code is conditionally executed based on something, and here's the question that we're asking. So that's the question. And then at the end we do a print. Now again, don't try to make too much sense of this. I'm just trying to show you sequential, repeated, repeated, conditional. Okay, just those concepts show up in every pro pretty much every program that we build. Okay, so <clears throat> let's do a couple more little exercises that get you sort of in the mindset of being a programmer and how programmers tend to have to think about problems a little bit differently. So here we go. This I call this an animated short story. And your job, I'm going to give you a diff se several sets of numbers, and I want you to find the largest number in the list of numbers. Now, it's not so important to know what the large number is, but also to think about how your mind attacks the problem. What your eyes are doing, what your mind is doing, how you break a bigger problem down into smaller problems, how a human solves this problem. And then we'll focus on how a computer might have to look at the problem differently. Okay? So don't just like get the answer. That's not so important. Think about how you get the answer. So don't just like scroll ahead in your YouTube and cheat and go get the answer. Think about actually solving the problem and then monitor what your brain is thinking as it goes. So here we go. So I'm going to give you a list of numbers and you are to tell me what the largest number is. Ready, set, go. I didn't make it easy. You're looking for the largest number. Did you get it? Did you get it? Did you have to go back a couple of times? Actually, I don't care what the answer is. The question is, how was your brain solving? Okay, you probably want to know what it is. The answer is 198. That was the largest number. Of course, what I was doing is I was moving it to make it difficult. But here's the thing. How do humans look at this? Like, do humans, like, did you look at 25, then you looked at 1, then you looked at 114, and did you just look at them slowly, one at a time, like this? Or no? I doubt it. If you are, maybe you're a computer. Maybe I'm talking to computers. Maybe you're all computers. I'm certainly not a computer. Maybe you're all computers. Okay, enough of that. No, that's probably not how you did it. What you probably did was you had your eyes move around the whole thing very rapidly, and the first thing that you figured out is that there were one-digit blobs. There were small, medium, and large blobs of purple. And the first thing you knew right away was there was no point 
at looking at any of the small blobs. Your brain just threw the blobs away really quick. Then you say, okay, given that it, there's no four-digit numbers, they're three-digit numbers, then what you probably did is you started looking for the first digit. You say, look, there's some ones. Is there any twos? Quickly you decided there are no twos. So you knew that you had to look for the big blobs, and the second digit was probably the thing that mattered. Then you start getting to the nine. You say, okay, there's some nines. So that means it's, it's one nine something. Then that was the part that you probably had to go check to find the, oh, where the heck was the 190? Ah! Oh, 198 right there. <laughs> yeah, I color-coded. I couldn't even see it. Okay? But the point is, is humans are great at eliminating sort of bad solutions really fast. And you probably looked at how big, how much purple was on the screen, eliminating the areas that were less purple because you knew that your brain quickly and instinctively knew that the more purple meant a larger number. Computers don't do any of that. They don't do any of that. So, in order to make you feel a little more like a computer, I have another test. And again, the goal is not just to find the largest number, but to, to monitor as you go what your brain is thinking while you're doing this. Okay? Do you get it? How are you attacking the problem? What is your feeling as you're attacking the problem? Are you a computer or not? Here we go. I'm only going to give you a few seconds. So, what did you get? My guess is that most of you just said, I don't care. This is such a hard problem. It's a stupid problem, or I'll try to turn my head upside down, or something. It's a really hard problem. The other one was kind of easy. Not that you might, you might not have got it, but you had this natural instinct that allowed you to approach the problem. Okay, I'll show you what the right answer is. The right answer is right there. It is 197. Yay. Right? I, you can't even, even if I tell you, it's, you know, there you are. What, you know, what is this? Is this 500 or 200? <laughs> Actually, the only way I can do this is I flip it to find it. I mean, it's just not what humans are good at. This is a little bit more like how computers see the world, but the, the fact that the data is frontwards or backwards should sort of make no difference, right? Computers d need a strategy. We need to give them a strategy. Okay, so here we go. <clears throat> One last experiment. Now, I'm going to show you numbers one at a time. And at the end, I want you to tell me what the largest number that you saw was. Ready? Here we go. First number. What was the largest number? As a matter of fact, how did you solve that problem? You solved that problem most likely because you didn't you couldn't look at all the numbers at the same time, so you probably created a variable in your head without even knowing it. And you put into that variable, you called the variable the largest number I've seen so far. And you hadn't seen any, so the let's say the largest number you've seen so far is negative one. Then I showed you three. And you said to yourself, well, negative one is no longer the largest number I've seen, so I'm going to keep that one. I'll keep three. That's the largest I've seen so far. And now I see 41. Ah, 41 is larger than three, so I will keep that. 
and now I see 12. Now 12 is crap because it's nowhere near as good as 41, so I'm keeping 41. 74, oh nine, nine, not nearly as good as 41, so I'm gonna throw that one away. 74, better, better, keep it, keep that one. So I'll keep 74, and the last number is 15. Don't even know it's the last number, but we don't wanna keep that one. And so now we're done. And so we know that at the end, what was during the loop, the largest so far, is the actual largest of all the numbers. And we don't remember exactly how many numbers there were. So that's kind of like thinking like a program. You have this kind of sliding window. It didn't matter if I gave you a billion numbers or five numbers. I think there were five numbers, actually. This notion of the largest so far is a powerful notion. As a matter of fact, it's central to the program I've been showing you. I don't want you to try to understand this, but this part in the purple, this part in the purple is really saying, I'm going to loop through the counts of all the, all the words. So it's got a word like the is 15 times and clown is four times. And it's going to look through all the pairs of word value combinations. And it's going to basically say, I'm going to go through the counts that I have and I'm going to check to see if the count I'm looking at is bigger than the biggest count I've seen so far. And if it is, I'm going to remember it. Now, don't worry about this. We haven't even covered any of this stuff. That's what chapter 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. But this is an algorithm, a paragraph, a pattern that allows you to find the largest number. And we'll look at this again in great detail in upcoming chapters. So this is kind of thinking like a computer having a sliding window across a long list of numbers and coming up with something that is the answer that you need. Okay, so that's the end of this lecture. Read chapter one, write your Hello World program. Make sure if you haven't, get Python installed. As you read this chapter, and even as you install Python, and even as you write the first program, don't get too stuck on the details. I was confused for like eight weeks, or probably six weeks in my first programming class. You'll be confused too. Just sort of wander through with me. Keep at it. It will start making sense at some point that's up to you. I can't tell you when it's going to make sense. So if, don't sort of stare at everything until you get it. Just kind of keep digging in and keep understanding and keep playing. And sooner or later, this will make a lot of sense to you. I promise you. See you next lecture. Hello, and welcome to Chapter 2. Hope you uh, enjoyed Chapter 1. It was a, one of the longer lectures, uh, trying to motivate you a little bit. Um, and now we're going to kind of go back to the basics. Uh, the chapter, chapter 1 covered sort of the first four to five chapters of the book. So, um, as always, these, uh, this video, these slides are copyright, creative commons, attribution, as well as the audio. And so, now we're going to talk about sort of the really low-level things that make up the Python language. Um, constants. So, I'm gonna, some of this is terminology just so I can, like, say the word constant and you won't freak out. Uh, constant is, as contrasted with something that changes, is variable talk about variables in the next slide, but for now, constants. Constants are in things that are sort of natural and instinctive, things like uh, numbers, 123, 98.6, or hello world. And so in, in what, what I'm doing here is we're, we're using the Python interpreter, and that how you, that's how you can tell the Chevron prompt. And I'm saying print 123, and then Python responds with 123. Print 98.6, Python responds with 98.6 and print single quote hello world single quote so the constants are the 123 98.6 and quote hello world quote so these are things we can use either single quotes or double quotes to uh, make strings and so programs kind of work with numbers and work with strings and we have these non-varying values that we call constants so the other side of the picture is the variable and the way I like to characterize a variable is it's a place in the memory of the computer. Uh, we give it a name as a programmer. We pick the variable name. In this I'm saying x equals 12.2 and uh, y equals 14. I am choosing the name and I'm choosing what to put in there. 
this is a statement called an assignment statement. And the way to think of the assignment statement is that it sort of has a direction. We're saying, dear Python, go find some memory. I will use the label x later to, re to refer to that memory and take the number 12.2 and stick it into x. Then this is sequential code. Then the next thing I want you to do is I'd like you to go find some more memory, call it y. I will call it y later. And uh, stick 14 in there. Okay, and so that ends up sort of with two little areas of memory. You know, one labeled x, and here's a little cell in which we'd like a drawer or something. And one labeled y, and we put have 12.2 after these lines run. We have 12.2 in one and 14 in the other. Then, for example, if there's another line that's down here, so there's this third line after this has happened, after this has happened, x equals 100. Remember, this has kind of got an, a direction to it. Say, oh, remember that x that I had? You know, I would like now to put 100 in that. So as I'm thinking this through, I think of that as sort of removing the 12.2 or overwriting the 12.2 and putting 100 in its place. And so at the end here, x is left with 100 and y is left with, one four, uh, with, with 14. So these variables can kind of have one value in them, and but we can look at them and we can reuse them and put different values in if we want. There's some rules for naming your variables. Again, you get to pick the variable names. Um, often we pick variables that make some sense. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, in Python, uh, variables can start with an underscore. We tend not to, as normal programmers, use those. We let libraries use those. Um, it has to have letters, numbers, and underscores, and and uh, start with uh, start with a letter or an underscore. A case matters, so uh, spam is good. Eggs is spam good. Spam twenty three is good because the number is not the first character underscore speed, that's also perfectly fine because it starts with an underscore or a letter. <coughs> 23 spam starts with a letter, uh, starts with a number, so that's bad. This starts with something other than a letter or a underscore. And you can't use a dot in the, in the variable name. It turns out the dot has meaning to Python that would confuse it. That would confuse it and wouldn't understand <clears throat> what we really mean there, and so that would be a syntax error. That would be a syntax error. Um, because case is sensitive, that means that things like all lowercase spam is different than an uppercase s and all uppercase. These are three distinct variables that are unique. Um, most people don't you choose variables that might be so confusing. So this to you as you write it and as to anybody that might read it would find three variables named as very confusing. So it's a bad idea. Don't do it. But I'm just showing you as an example that case can make a variable name distinct. And again, this variable is a place in memory that we are going to store and retrieve uh, information, whether that be numbers or strings or whatever. These are things that we control. Now, Python also has a set of reserved words. And what it really means is you can't use these for variables. These words have very special meaning. And, for, is, raise, if. So you can't make a variable named if. It'll be like, oh no, that is if. I know what if is. And so these are words that Python has as its core vocabulary and forbids you to use them for other purposes like variable names or later function names. So that's kind of the vocabulary, constants, variables, and uh, reserved words. Now, we take these and we start assembling them into sort of sentences, statements, Python statements that do something. So we've already talked about an assignment statement. It has kind of an arrow here. It says, hey, Python, go find me a place called x. Take the number 2 and stick it in there for later. Then continue on. Now, because there's, a, there's an arrow, the right side of this is done first. And so it's a, so this right side, you can kind of ignore for the moment the left-hand side, and it calculates the right-hand side by looking at the current value for x, which happens to be 2, then it adds these two things together, and then gets 4, and then at the point where it knows 4, that this number is 4, it will then store that back into x. And so then later we print x, and we will get the 4. And so again, this is a sequence of steps, and the 
the variable x changes as these steps continue. And when we're saying print x, that really means print the current value for x. So operator, we can do a number of different operators in assignment statements. We calculate this right-hand side. This is sort of all calculated, whatever this is, based on the current value for x does this calculation and then when it knows what the answer is it assigns that into the variable that's on the left hand side of the assignment statement. Again, calculate the right hand side completely and then move it to the left hand side. Some early languages actually didn't use the equal sign for the assignment operator, this assignment operator, and in, in a way it kind of um, some languages, an early language actually used an arrow arrows aren't really on people's keyboards. Uh, another language used colon equals as this assignment operator, but we use equals. Now if you're familiar with math, this can be a little confusing, like x equals 1 and then x equals 2. That as mathematics would be bad math because in a proof or a problem, x can only have one value. But in programming, if this was two statements, that means just x had a value and then the value for x changed later. Okay. So just kind of go through this. Because it's working from the right-hand side to the left-hand side on assignment statements, it is pulling out these x values. So x may have 0 0.6. It pulls the values out before it's sort of ignoring this part right here. And it's just going to try to resolve this expression. And it has multiplication and parentheses and things like that. So it basically pulls the 0 0.6 into the calculation, does the 1 minus x, which gives you 0 0.4. Then it multiplies these three things together, giving 0 0.93. And then when it is all done with all of that, it takes that, oops, takes that 0 0.93 and then puts it back into x. And so this is just sort of emphasizing how the right-hand side is computed to produce a value. Then it is moved into the variable. In, and that is why you can have sort of x on both sides, because this is like the old and this is the new. This is the old x participates in the calculation and then when the calculation is done it becomes the new x. Hope that makes sense. So this on the right hand side here is a numeric expression. So we have a number of different operators. Some of them are instinctive intuitive, um, the plus and the minus. The reason some of these are so weird is in the really old days we didn't have too many things on the keyboard and a lot of programs were very mathematical. And so they figured out what was on the keyboard of the computer equipment of the day, and then they had to uh, fake certain things. So it turns out that plus and minus were on the keyboard, and so plus and minus are addition and subtraction respectively. There was no kind of times operator for multiplication, and dot was used for decimal points, so they used asterisk for multiplication. So in computers, languages, nearly all of them, uh, they basically use a multi a times for multiplication. Slash is used for division. So we say like 8 slash 2, which is 8 divided by 2. Um, raising something to the power like a 4 squared, that is double asterisk. And then remainder is if you uh, do a division, uh, that gives you the remainder rather than the divisor. So 8 over 2 is 4, remainder 0. So the remainder is what you get with this particular operator. There's a few cool things that we can do with remainder that we won't talk about right away, but uh, it's there. And so here's just a couple of uh, sample expressions. Um, let's give me green. Okay. So so again, I'm using the Python interpreter. So you can kind of just is just the prompt. These chevrons are the prompt. Uh, create the variable xx and assign it to two. Uh, retrieve the old value in an addition, then print it out, and put it back into xx, so xx has 4. yy, this is a multiplication, 440 times 12 is 5,280. yy over 1,000, now this is a little counterintuitive. This, because yy is an integer, it then does it in a truncated division, and so 5,280 divided by 1,000 is 5. Now, if and, and so that's, that's an integer division. We'll see in a second about floating point division. Um, now we take the variable jj and we set it to 23. And now we're going to use the modular or modulo or remainder operator 
to say what is JJ, what is the remainder when we divide this JJ by 5? And so if you think about this, we take old long division, 23 divided by 5, you end up with 4, and then remainder 3. The modulo operator, or the percent, or the remainder operator, gives us back this number, and so that's why KK is 3. It is the remainder of 23 when divided by 5, or the remainder of the division of 5 into 23. And the raising to the power, 4 cubed, no, that's not so nice, 4 cubed is 4 star star 3, and so that ends up being 64. So that's just operations. Now, just like in algebra and mathematics, um, we have rules about when to, uh, when, which operations happen first. In general, things like uh, the power happens before the multiplication and division, and then the addition and subtraction happen. And so there are some rules that when you're looking at an expression and trying to calculate what its value is, if you don't have parentheses, it follows these rules. And so the the most imp the, the the rule that sort of trumps all the rules is that parentheses are always respected. So a lot of us just write these with parentheses in place, even sometimes though you don't need it. Then after parentheses have been handled, then it does exponentiation, then it does multiplication, division, and remainder, and then it does addition and subtraction, and then when it, all else being equal, it just works left to right. So let's let's look through an example. So here is a calculation that is, you know, one, 1 plus 2 times 3 divided by 4 over 5. And the question is, what order does this happen? Okay. And so let's, let's sort of take a look at this. And so we start with, uh, are there any parentheses? And the answer is no, there are no parentheses. So let's go next. Um, power. And so the, the power says, OK, let's look across and find those things that are raised to a power. And the 2 cubed, or 2 to the third power, is the, the power. So we're going to do that one. Okay, And then we can, the way I do it when I'm sort of doing these slowly is I rewrite it. So the 2 to the third power becomes 8. So it's 1 plus 8 over 4 times 5. And then now we can say, oh, power, that's taken care of. Now we're going to do multiplication and division. And we go across. Now, we have both a division and a multiplication. Okay, and multiplication and division are done at the same time. So that means we do left to right, which means we do the first one that we encounter first. And so that will be <coughs> 8 over 4 because of the left to right rule. And so we find that one, and that's the one that gets computed next. And that turns into 2. And again, I like to rewrite these expressions just to keep my brain really, really clear. After a while, you just do it in your head. But I rewrite them when I was first learning it. At least I rewrote it all the time. And, uh, and so next, looking at this, there's a multiplication. We're not done with multiplication yet. So the 2 over 5 is the next thing. And then we do that calculation, and that becomes 10. And again, we rewrite it. And now we've done the multiplication. And we're going to do addition next. And that's just 1 over 10. And that becomes 11. And so basically this big long thing through a series of successive steps becomes 11 and indeed when we print it out that's what we get okay so there's the rules that are parentheses power multiplication addition and then left to right but smart people usually just put parentheses in you know so here's this here's an exam oop go back go back here's an exam question now i wouldn't write this code, right, I wouldn't write this code this way. I would put a parenthesis here and a parenthesis there. Be it's the same thing, because that's exactly the 2 times 3 is going to happen, and the 4 over 5 is going to happen, and then the plus and the minus will happen left to right. But why not make it easier on your readers and just put the parentheses in? Because they're redundant, they're not necessary, but away you go. Now, if you don't want it to happen in that order. Of course, then you have to put parentheses. If you want the addition to happen before the multiplication, then you have to put parentheses in, which you can. But we tend to recommend that you use more parentheses rather than less parentheses. Now, 
Python integer division in Python 2, which we are using Python 2 for this class. There's a new Python 3 that the world is slowly transitioning to, and a lot of people are using it and teaching. Um, but it's not as common sort of in the real world with libraries and utilities. And so we'll stick with Python 2 for a few more years until Python 3 uh, really kind of turns the corner. Um, it's nice to have it there, but there's so much Python and it's so popular, Python 2, that it's uh, just kind of hard to get everybody up to Python 3. So in Python 2, integer division truncates, and you saw that before, um, where I did the 5,280 by 1,000 and I got 5 as... It. And, but we can look at a couple of examples that make this really very quite quite clear. So 10 divided by 2 is 5, as you would expect. 9 divided by 2 is 4. Not exactly what you'd expect. You kind of expect that to be 4.5 instead of 4. But in Python 3, it will be 4.5. But for now, in Python 2, 9 over, 9 over 2 is 4. And um, 99 over 100 is zero. Now that seems rather counterintuitive, but it is a truncating division. It's not a rounding division. It's a truncating division. Now, interestingly, if you make either of these numbers have a decimal, make them what we call floating point numbers, um, then the division is done in floating point. So 10.0 over 2.0 is 5.0. Now, these are different. This is an integer number, and this is a floating point number. It's 5.0. And then 99.0 over 100.0 is exactly as you would expect, and it's a floating point number. So Now you can also mix integers and floating point numbers as you go. So here we have 99 over 100. Those are both integers, integer, integer. And, or, and that comes out with 0 because it's truncating. Now if we have an integer and a floating point number, 99 over 100.0, then that comes out as 0.99. And either one, if we have 99 over 100, that's a floating point, and that's an integer, we still end up with a floating point. So this is a floating point, floating point. And even in complex expressions, as it evaluates when it sees an integer, so the first thing we evaluate is this would become a 6. So it'd be 1 plus 6 over 4.0 minus 5. Then it would be doing this 6 over 4.0, and that would be 1.5, 1 plus 1.5 minus 5, and so this is an integer, and that's a floating point, and the result becomes a floating point, and then the rest of the calculation is done floating point to the point where the ultimate is a floating point negative 2.5. So you can throw a floating point into a calculation, and as soon as the calculation touches the floating point, the remainder of the calculation is done in floating point. It kind of converts it to floating point, but it doesn't want to convert it back, because it considers floating point sort of the more general of the representations. So here we are talking about integers and floating points. These are a concept in programming languages and in Python called type. Variables and constants have a type. We can see that if you say 1 versus 1.0, they have different, they, it works different, it functions differently. And so Python keeps track of both variables and literal slash constants and having them have a type. And we've seen this, right? Now the interesting thing is, is Python is very aware of the type and can use the same syntax to accomplish different things. So if we look at this line here where we say dd equals 1.4, well it looks at the 1 and looks at the 4 and says, oh those are two integers, I will add those together and give you a 5. So it gives you an integer, an integer, and an integer comes back. Okay. And then ee -E equals hello plus there. Well, these are two strings, hello and there. And it says, hmm, this must be a concatenation. Right, so I'm going to concatenate those together because those are strings, and I know how to concatenate strings, and that's kind of like string addition, right? And so we see a hello there as a result. Now, the interesting thing is where did this space come from? Let me change colors here. Oops. Where did that space come from? Well, the plus does not add the space. There's a space right there, and that's the space. So I can concatenate it, hello space, plus there, and that's how I got hello there. But the key thing is, is this plus operator, clear. This plus operator looks to either side and says, oh, they're strings. I think you mean concatenation. Here, it looks either side and says, oh, 
Those are integers. I think you mean addition. So Python is very aware of type, and type informs Python what you really mean. And so it looks like those are kind of the same, but they're quite different operations. So the type can get you in trouble. Remember, Python is looking at the type. So here we have a little problem. Our first traceback, first of many tracebacks. So here we have uh, e, e, which is hello there, which is exactly what we did. This is a string, and this is a string. So e, e, e should be a string. And then we try to add 1 to it. And again, Python is saying, oh, I see an, a plus sign here. So I'm look over here, yeah, that's a string, and we'll look over here, and that's an integer. It's like, ah, and this is a traceback. Now, here's a good time to talk about tracebacks. Tracebacks, I color them red, because you might think that Python dislikes you or thinks that you're, you know, unworthy of its brilliance. And certainly the way these things are worded, it sounds like, you know, the, you're being scolded. It's like, hey. Type error. You can cannot concatenate stir and int objects, right? That's I'm, I'm scolding you. You're bad, bad programmer. And it does feel a bit like you're scolded. But if you go back to lecture one, this is also the moment where really we shouldn't think of this as like scolding. We should think of this as Python sort of asking for help. It's like, wow, you gave me this line, and I, Python, have no idea. In all your greatness, could you give me some possible clue as to what you really mean for me to do because I'm so lost. And given that I'm Python and I'm lost and you are the only purpose for my existence, uh, I must stop until you give me better guidance. So don't look at tracebacks as scolding. They sound like scolding. I'll stop coloring them red after a while. So if Python is so obsessed with the type of things, you should be able to ask Python what the type of something is. And so there's a built-in function called type. This is part of the Python language. Type parenthesis, and you can put a variable in here. What's the type of the variable ee? E? And it says, oh, yeah, I know what that is. That would be a string. And then you can also put a constant in here and say, what's the type of quote, hello, quote? And that's a string, too. And what's the type of the number 1? Well, that would be an integer. So it's picky about the type, but it'll also share with you what it believes the type is. And there's several types of numbers. As I've already mentioned, there are integers, which are the whole numbers. They can be positive and negative and 0. And then there are the decimal numbers, the floating point numbers, like 98.6 or negative 2.5 or 14.0. Python knows these as well, because it does division different if it's presented with two integers, or an integer and a float, or a float and a float. And so here we have x is 1, and we say, what is it? It's an integer. And we say it's 98.6, and we say, well, what's that? It's a float. And you can ask for both variables and constants. So what's the type of 1? It's an integer. And what's the type of 1.0? And it's a float. You can also convert types. It has a bunch of type conversion functions built into it. So there's an implicit conversion going on when you're sort of saying, you know, divide an integer by a floating point it says okay I see I look to the sides and I will make the con I will make the conversion for you but you can also be explicit so in this case we're gonna say take this 99 and convert it to a floating point version of itself which is 99.0 and then do the division so Python looks out here and goes oh after that that's a float and that's an integer if I look over here and then that means that the result is a float and the division is done as a float so we are force converting the 99 integer into a 99.0 float. And we can even do this like and just stick it in a variable. So we can put 42 in i, and that is an integer. Then we can say, hey, convert float that i into a float and stick it into the variable f. And so we can print it. And now it's 42.0 instead of 42. Right? They're not the same. They're both kind of 42, but one is a floating point 42 and the other is an integer 42. And we can ask, and that is a float. And you can also do the same thing in the middle of a calculation where you have 1 plus 2 times float of 3. This float is done quickly, so the first thing that happens this is 1 plus 2 times 3.0 over 4 minus 5. So the first thing that happens is these floats are done because they're parentheses, so they matter. So this is a built-in function called float that takes 
as its argument a non-floating point number and gives you back a floating point number. We'll talk more about functions in chapter 4. You can also convert between strings and numbers. And, uh, and if you recall, I, we did the example where we took a string. In this case, I'm being a little confusing because I'm making a string with the characters 1, 2, 3. Now, this is not the same as 123. This is a three-character string with 1, 2, 3 in it. And I can ask what kind of thing is in there, and it says, oh, there's a string in there. I know about that. And then I can try to add 1 to it. And it seems intuitive that, quote, 1, 2, 3 plus 1 would be somehow 124. But it's not. Python takes a look at the plus and says, oh, there's a string on that side and an integer on that side. I am going to freak out and tell you that you cannot concatenate a string and an integer. Okay? But there is an int function that converts various things, including strings, to an integer. So we can give as its parameter its input the string value, then it converts it to an integer, and then we'll put the result in the variable iVal. We can ask what the type of that is. It's a, I, it's a integer. And now we can use it in an expression, print iVal plus 1. And so now Python looks to both sides, sees an integer, sees an integer, and gets 124. Voila. Now, if I make a new variable and I stick hello Bob in it, and I say, hey, let's convert hello Bob to an integer, as you might expect, it blows up. And it says invalid literal for int. These, these tracebacks, again, once you kind of get used to the kind of harsh wording of them, because they're not saying, sorry, comma, they're trying to tell you what's going on. So cannot concatenate string and integer and invalid literal for int. It's trying to be as helpful as it possibly can be to give you a clue as to what to fix. So again, not scolding. Okay, so that's variables and types and type conversion. Now we'll talk a little bit about user input. And uh, there's a function that's built into Python called raw input. And what happens when raw input runs is it it has as one of its parameters a prompt, which is something that shows up on the screen. Who are you? And then it waits, sits and waits. It says, what next? And then you type a string, da, 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 and then you hit the enter key, the enter key. And then whatever you typed here goes into a variable. And it is a string, and then you then you can use it. So I'm going to print the string welcome, comma. So that means I'm printing two things now. The comma adds a space between welcome and then nam. And so welcome is a literal, and then chuck is coming from this nam variable. So this is a two-line program. And I think this is one of your assignments, actually. To uh, well, it's one of the exercises in the book to a prompt for a user's name and then welcome them. Okay. So raw input is a function that issues a prompt, waits, and then takes whatever string that's entered and then returns it and then puts it into that variable. So now we're going to create kind of the first useful program. It's not a powerful program. It is a, an interesting problem of uh, the fact that for some reason um, there's a difference in the numbering scheme of United States elevators and European elevators. Uh, European elevators, uh, the floor that you walk out on is the zero floor. The floor above that is the one floor and the floor below that, the basement, is the minus one floor. And so you walk in and you can either go up the elevator or down the elevator. Of course, in the United States, the floor that you walk in is the one, and then there's the two floor above that, and then there's like the basement. So this is the this is the imagination that the Americans have as to how to number floors. All right, the Europeans go zero, one, minus one. So children who go to hotels learn instantly the notion of zero and the notion of positive and negative numbers and the symmetry between positive and negative numbers. I mean, I just wish the United States hotels would switch to this to teach young people zero immediately 
and negative numbers. So we somehow think that numbers all in the United States start at 1, and then there are no no negative numbers. There's the basement. I wonder why that is. But whatever. For people who travel a lot, they may be confused by this. They need a way to convert back and forth between the U.S. and European numbering system. So this is a simple program that demonstrates a real classic pattern of input processing and output. It's just three lines, but it has the essential things that all programs that are useful, they generally read some data, do some work with the data, and then produce some kind of results. And so, so the first line is a raw input that effectively that puts out a prompt and then it waits it says please enter your Europe floor it sits there we type a zero then zero goes into imp but it is a string it's not a number it's a string so we can't add to it but we can take and convert it to an integer with the int function int of imp that's a string being converted to an integer so now it's a real numeric zero and we can add one to that and we sum that together and we put it in to the variable USF and then we print US floor comma and then whatever the variable for USF is and out comes US floor one. So we've written a very simple elevator floor conversion from a European floor to a United States floor. Don't ask about negative numbers, it's not really good at that, but from zero and positive numbers it works great. So another thing to uh, think about in any programming language is comments. Comments are like commentary, come, you know, and, and, and basically it's a way for us to uh, add notations for ourselves or for other humans interspersed in the code. And so in Python, anything after a pound sign is ignored. You can have a pound sign at the beginning of the line and then the whole line is ignored. There are two or three reasons why you can do this. One is sort of like paragraph headings where you can say what's going to happen in English um, or, or your language. And you can write documentation that says this code was written by Charles Severance December 2010. Um, and you can also just hide a line of code to test and, and turn it on and off without actually deleting the line of code. It's a real common thing in, in debugging. So for example, here is a here is a, the program that we've been playing with. This is our word counting program that we've been talking about from the beginning. And here is an example of four comments. One, two, three, four. Four comments that basically tell us what these paragraphs are going to do. Now, they don't have any effect on the program whatsoever. But this one says, get the name of the file and open it. Kind of helpful, right? Count the word frequency. That's what this little bit does. Find the most common word. That's what this little bit does. And all done, print this out. So it's really can be very helpful just to add a little tiny bit of stuff. You don't want to overuse comments. You don't want to say like x equals 12. Take 12 and put it into x. Sometimes people teach you and try to say, oh, you need a one comment every three lines. I don't believe in any of those rules. I basically say if it's useful to describe it, then describe it. So that's comments. So uh, <clears throat> some Operators apply to strings. We've already talked about plus. It's kind of silly, although useful in places. You can actually multiply strings. Where this is the, the asterisk looks and says, I got a string and an integer, and it prints out the string five times. Not a lot of use for that. Now, let's talk a little bit about choosing variable names. This is something that is really confusing. So I said like x equals 1, x equals x plus 1. What does x mean? And the answer is, it doesn't mean anything. I chose it. I wanted to make a variable, and so I picked x. We pick x a lot, probably because we learned in algebra in sixth grade that x was a variable. So, and it's short, and so why not call it x? But as your programs get larger, this gets kind of frustrating to have all your variables like x and y and z. And so the notion of mnemonic, it means memory aid, we choose our variable names wisely so they remind us of what the variable's going to do internally. And so it, 
as I go through this lecture, in the beginning, if I choose a variable that's so too clever, you're going to think that it's part of the language. And so I sort of switch back and forth between well-chosen variable names and stupid variable names to kind of re-emphasize the notion that I can choose. Mnemonic is a good practice. Okay, so here we go. Let's take a look at a bit of code. So the question is, what is this code doing? What will it even print out? Is it syntactically correct? Now you could probably cut and paste this into your brow into Python and figure out that it is syntactically correct. There are three variables. This one here and this one here match. This one here and that one there match and these two match. So it's taking these two numbers and multiplying together and then printing out the product of the two numbers. If you're real careful and like look at every very every character. Now this would be called non-mnemonic variables. They're really messy. Now Python, it's happy because all it wants is to say, oh, here's the name that I, the programmer, decided I wanted to call this piece of memory and I'll refer to it down here. Okay? And so Python's happy. Now, if you hand this to another human being, they're going to be really unhappy because they're going to be like, what are you doing? So one better way to write it would be to make the variables very simple. And then cognitively, we humans can figure out which is which. Because again, it's still only about matching. The A has to match the A, the B matches the B, and the C's match. It's actually the exact same program. A equals 35, B equals 12.5, C equals A times B, and print C. It is these, Python sees these as the same program. It doesn't care what we name them. Now a human will be much appreciative if you say, here, you can either have this one or this one. This one will make them a lot happier. Woo. Okay, so that is certainly cognitively easier, but it's not really giving you any sense of what's going on here, right? So an even better way to write this exact same program to do the exact same thing would be to choose variables named hours, rate, and pay, if indeed that is what you're doing. Now you can look at this and you go, oh, well, shoot, 35 is the number of hours and 12 and a half is the rate and the pay is the number of hours times the rate. And then we're gonna print out the pay. That makes a lot of sense. So this is really a awesome and wonderful characterization. And this, if that's what you're doing, and if those are hours, rate, and pay, it's a great thing to name your variables. But this is where beginning students get confused. And so sometimes I'll write it this way, and sometimes I'll write it this way. Because you look at this until you get a little more sophisticated, a little more skilled, and you say, like, does Python know something about payroll? Is hours a reserved word? Is rate a reserved word and pay a reserved word? Are these things that Python knows about? And the answer is no. Python sees these three programs as exactly the same name. It's just this person really made a very bad choice of a variable name. This person made a less bad choice of a variable name. And this person made a really awesome choice of a variable name. So the only difference between these two things is style. They are the exact same program and Python is equivalently happy with these. But humans are most happy when the variables are easy to remember and they are somewhat descriptive of what their expected contents will be. That's mnemonic to help you remember what you were meaning to do when you write the program. This is still a bit cryptic. Having these really short one character variable names is still a bit cryptic. So you have a couple of uh, assignments at the end of the chapter. One of the assignments is to write a program to prompt the user for hours and rate per hour and compute pay. So I won't do this here, but just a couple of sort of uh, things. Um, you're going to be using raw input. But remember that hands a string in. So you're going to have to use float function to convert it to a floating point number so you can actually do a calculation. 
and then you're going to have to use multiplication and print. So multiplication and then print. So it's some combination of raw input, float, multiplication, and print constructed to, to make your program do exactly this. So this is the end of uh, chapter two. We talked about types, reserved words, variables, the mnemonic, how you choose variable names. We'll hit this a couple more times because choosing variable names is always problematic. Operators, operator precedence, which just means like does multiplication happen be before plus, parentheses. Integer division is a little weird because it truncates, whoops, truncates, right? 9 over 10, 9 over 10 equals 0. That's the integer division truncating. Conversion, this is like the int float. And then user input, which is raw input. And then comments, which are ways for you to add human readable text to your program. Okay? See you next lecture. Hello and welcome to chapter three of Python for Informatics. Chapter one, chapter two, now we're going to get to something kind of programmy. I mean, assignment statements and reserved words, that's just kind of gurgling. Now we're going to start seeing composition. We're going to start seeing the conditional execution uh, gets us started sort of seeing the power of computers where you're starting to make decisions. So as always, this lecture and uh, audio, video, and slides are also available. Our copyright creative commons attribution. So um, conditional steps are steps that may or may not be executed. So here's, here's a bit of code. So, and, and I draw these pictures. I, I won't draw too many of these pictures on the left-hand side. If you've taken a programming class, you may have seen these. They're sometimes called flowcharts. Uh, sometimes people really think these are important. I don't think they're all that important for understanding. I, the, the Python code is here on the right-hand side, and this picture is on the left-hand side. And, and the reality is, is that this may initially make more sense cognitively to you than this. But this part on the right-hand side is what's important. I like to call these like roadmaps, so you can sort of trace where the code is going by driving down a little road. Um, that's kind of a, something that you do once or twice, and then pretty soon you just start reading the code. So I'm going to start on the right-hand side here and just walk through the code. Remember, code operates in sequence. Well, there is a if, which is a special reserved word. It's one of those things that you can't, you can't name a variable if. And it is our indication that uh, to Python that the next statement that we're going to do may or may not be executed, if. And the thing that comes on the same line as the if, up to including the the little colon the, is a question. This is a question. You're asking a question. So an assignment statement is moving a value into a variable, and a if statement is asking a question. In this case, we're asking a question about a variable. So always think when you're sort of here that this is a question to be asked. And you'll notice when I'm doing the same thing over here, I put a question mark there. Is x less than 10? Yes or no? It's a question that has a yes or no. And so the way this works is this statement that's indented after the if is either executed or not executed based on the result of that question. So the way to sort of read this in English is set x to 5. If x is less than 10, which it is because x is 5, then we're going to execute this. So print smaller comes out. And then we come back out and we continue and say, oh, OK, now I have another if statement. And then a bit of a block of indented code. If x is less than 20, that's the question. The answer to that is no. And so it does not run that line, and so it runs fini. So the printout of this program is smaller, followed by fini. What happens is this line never executes, because the answer to this question is false. OK? So let's go through that a little faster. Set x to 5. If x is less than 10, print smaller. Then, if x is greater than 20, which it's not, skip that, and then print fini. That's the short version of it. Okay? Conditional steps. This step is conditional. This step is conditional. They may or may not be executed based on the result of the question. Now, if we're thinking of this as like a GPS roadmap or something, we can look at this right-hand side. So the, com the CPU comes roaring down here, x equals 5. Okay, I'll run that. Then it's faced with a choice. 
Do, is x less than 10? Yes or no? If it is yes, and it is, I will go this way. If it was no, I would go that way. So if it's yes, I go here and I run this little thing, and print smaller, great, and I follow the little road, and now the road takes me to here. And it's asking another question. Is x greater than 20? This time the answer is no, so I'd come down here. Right? And so this bit of code is never executed. Now, this is a very simple example, but you get the basic idea. Okay? So that's conditional execution. Now there's a number of conditional operators that we want to use, just like we had multiplication, division. Um, some of them are, are uh, pretty, uh, pretty intuitive, and the others you just kind of have to memorize. Uh, like less than and greater than make a lot of sense. Um, the one that probably the easy like less than or equal to or greater than or equal to, those kind of make sense too. They're less than or equal to, um, just because we don't have a less than or equal to sign on a symbol or a greater than or equal sign, which we would use in mathematics. Um, equality, asking the question of whether something is equal to something else or not, is double equal. And that's because we're already using single equals as assignment. So when we say x equals 3, that is an assignment and sticks a value into x. This is the question. Is x equal to? If I was building a language, I would make it be equal question mark or something like that. I'd be like, huh? Is it equal? Kind of a question mark. But that's not what we do. I didn't invent this, so we are double equals is the question. Is something equal to another? A single equals changes something. x equals 5 changes x. Okay, and then not equal, exclamation is commonly used to mean not in computer context. So if something is not equal to something, it is exclamation equal. Here are some examples. Just kind of running through them. Uh, they're all, they all turn out to be true because I said x to 5. If x equals 5, print equals 5. Come out here, if x is greater than 4, which is true, print greater than 4. If x greater than or equal to 5, yeah. If x less than 6, print less than 6. Now here's a, there are two sort of syntaxes to, to the if statement. One is where the if statement is down here on a separate line and it's indented. And the other is where there's a single line and it's right on the same line. If x less than 6, print less than 6. So this is true, so this whole thing executes. Then it continues down. If x less than or equal to 5, yep. Print less than or equal to 5. If x is not equal to 6, which is true because it's 5, then not equal to 6. So all those will turn out to be true, and all those will execute. And so the, the tricky bit here is you know, just knowing, seeing this syntax for an if statement where it's all one line, and this syntax where you end the first line with a colon and then indent the second line. This you can only do one line. We will soon see that you can put more than one line in an indented block. Okay. Here we have more than one in line in the indented block. These are called one-way decisions. And so we say x equals 5. We print out before 5, so that prints out. If x equals 5, remember the double equals is the question mark version of equality. Single equals assignment. It says yes. So we indent. And the convention is to indent four spaces, although it doesn't really matter as long as you're consistent. Then it's going to run all three of those. Is 5, still 5, third 5. These lines all come out. And then it comes out and prints. And the de-indenting, the fact that this print has been moved to line up with the if, that's what indicates that this little block of conditional executed code is, uh, is finished. So then it prints out afterwards 5, some more, before 6. Then it asks another question, if x is equal to 6. Again, that's the question mark version of it. And if this is false now, because x happens to be 5, so the answer to this expression, the logical expression, is false. Then it skips all of the indented bits. So none of this executes. So since it's false, it skips all of the indented bit. But then it, this print lines up, and so then it picks back up with afterwards 6. So we call this a one-way decision where you have the question, and then you have a couple of things that you're going to do on this true, true thing. Or if it turns out that you're false, you're going to skip all those things. So Python uh, is actually one of the few languages that uses indentation as syntactically significant. Uh, we like to indent code to, for ifs, and in a moment we'll see you learn about loops. We like to indent code as a way to 
makes sense of stuff. It makes it easier to read, um, you know, if this thing's inside. And so it, it's really quite nice. And then we sort of use it as a matching to help us cognitively understand what's inside of, uh, of a program. But in Python, it's really, really important. And it's almost, it's, it's, you have to think of like, when you are moving in, you mean something. And when you move back out, you mean something. So you can increase the indent, which you do after like an if statement or any other statement that ends in a colon. You increase the indent. And then when you're done, you decrease the indent. You maintain the indent sort of for sequential code. Now, blank lines and comments are ignored. So you can have a blank line, and it, it, the indentation just goes right past it, and the comments don't affect it. And so while we're here, we'll interrupt us for a, uh, a, a recommendation. In your text editor, Notepad Plus, or Text Edit, or Text Wrangler, or whatever you're using, um, it may be set when you hit the Tab key to move in four spaces. Sometimes you also might move in four spaces by hitting spacebar four times. Python will see that as different. And it is possible in all of these word processors to say, hey, don't actually put tabs in my document. When I hit the tab, put in four spaces. Then whether you're hitting the spacebar or hitting the tab, at least you are putting the same thing into your document and, don't, and not freaking Python out. If you don't, you may get indentation errors. Indentation errors are syntax errors to Python. And what's really frustrating is if you it looks good to you in your text editor, you have an if, and the block goes in, and it comes back out, but one of them is four spaces, and one of them is a tab, then Python will yell at you. And this is really frustrating when Python yells at you about that. So what I'd like you to do is go into your text editor, whatever it is, uh, <clears throat> into the properties or the settings. And here is, you know, your, your may be different, but here is where you set this. Auto expand tabs. That is on the Mac in uh, Text Wrangler. And then in Notepad++, there is replace tabs with spaces. And that's underneath preferences. So you have to find it. Stop right now and go set this so you're not going to make yourself crazy. OK, so this is kind of a busy slide, but it gives you this sense that you have to explicitly think about indenting and de-indenting. OK, and so I'm just going to walk through this. So when you have two lines lining up, that means they're going to run sequentially. If you see an if, or later here we'll see a for. We haven't talked about for yet, but it's, it's like if. So the fact that we go from this second line to this third line and move the indent in, we're actually creating a block that has to do with this if. And it, you can always kind of tell these, the if and the for end in a colon character. Now, we could pull this print back out, but we want it to be part of the if, so we maintain the indent. And then we're done with the if by pulling out. So we line the P with the I, and that means this is outside of the if. This for, which we haven't learned about for yet, for is another statement that ends in colon. And afterwards, you have to indent. And you maintain the indent. Here's an if. But now we have an if, and we're already in. But that ends in a colon, so we go in farther. And now this is the block. Now we come back out, and we line up with that if right there. Okay. And now at the end of this, this indent, this x here, comes all the way back out, so it lines up. The rest of these are kind of weird in that comments don't matter, blank lines don't matter, and so it just is sort of, you have to get mentally get used to the notion that these don't count. They can really cognitively mess you up, so these don't count. And now if I look through it without with the comments hidden, it starts in column one, ignore, ignore, goes in, stays in, ignore, 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 comes out. So that's, it all makes sense. Those comments and blank lines are just kind of confusion. So increasing and decreasing indent has meaning in Python. We'll learn more about this in a bit. Our programs won't get this complex right away, but it's important to think these indents aren't just pretty. They actually are communicating something to Python. And what they're communicating is basically what's in a block. And it shouldn't take you very long when you start looking at Python to sort of visualize these blocks. So 
here, there, here's a big block, this block here that's got these three things. And then this is a block as well. And you can kind of say, well, here's an if statement. And then these are the two statements that are part of that if statement. So mentally, you kind of make these block pictures. So here's another block. This is that for loop. This part's the indented part, but then there's a block inside of the block. So you've got to kind of start seeing that as well. So this is a block that has to do, this green block is the, the one that has to do with, uh, with the if. And then there's a block here, and then this is a great big block because this is where it finally de-indents. So don't worry about it yet, but at some point you're just going to start seeing this indenting and de-indenting as defining blocks of code uh, for various purposes. Now we don't have all the purposes yet, but we'll get there. So um, we saw in that previous thing one block within a block, and and we're going to do that. We can have ifs, we can have loops that get indented, but then we can indent even more. We call that nested, where there's an indented area that's in an area that's already indented. So here's a nested decision, and it might be easier to start on this side, where I'm going to have uh, first choice, is x greater than 1, yes or no? And if it's yes, I'll do some work. And then I'm going to ask another question. And if that's yes, then I'm going to do this. Then I'm going to come all the way back in. And the way we encode this in Python is x equals 42. If x is greater than 1, it's true. So we continue working in the indent. And now we say, oh, if x is less than 100, which is still true. So we go in farther and we do this. And now we come out. We don't come out to here. We actually keep going all the way to here. So that ends both blocks. And so if you sort of think about this, again, this is where I want you to start seeing what's in a block of code and what's not in a block of code and how the indents sort of like put a boundary on the blocks of code. And so the first thing you should see is sort of like that purple part, the, the x less than 100 print. That's kind of a box. And you can see the box on the on the sort of flow diagram as well. The boxes are there. They're, the boxes on the flow diagram are places where there's one entrance and one exit. And then there's also sort of the larger box, right? There's this if box that includes the smaller box. So, so there's this nesting, which is boxes within boxes or indented areas within indented areas. Now, that was a, what we call a one-way decision, where you're doing if, and this code either runs or it doesn't run. <clears throat> it is extremely common to want to basically say, look, I'm going to do one of two things. I'm going to ask a question. If the question is true, I'm going to do one thing. If the question is false, I'm going to do another thing. So that's what we have shown here. Uh, we say is x equals 4. Is x equal to question mark? If it's yes, we're going to go here. If it's no, we're going to go here. Going to execute one or the other, and then we're going to continue. So we're really at a fork in the road here, right? We're, we're at a fork in the road, going to make a choice, and one or the other, but never both, right? So we're going to do one thing, or we're going to do another thing. We're going to do one of the two, and depending on what the question that we ask, the question that we ask is which one that we're going to do. So here's a little bit of code. x equals 4. Is x greater than 2? The answer is yes. Then we come out and hit this else, and we automatically skip, right? Because we're only going to do one of the two. And here's the picture. x equals 4. Is x equal 2? Yes. Print. Done. Which means we'll never do both this and that. Never do both, both sides. We're going to do one or the other of the sides. And just sort of going with the box, that is our box. Oops, go back, go back. This is our box, right? It's sort of the, the indent followed by the final indent. The else is really kind of part of it. And then we can draw the picture here. It has one entry and one exit. OK. So we have one-way ifs, and we have two-way ifs, and now we have multi-way ifs. OK? So here is a multi-way if, and it introduces a new reserved word, elif, which is a combination of else and if. And this one probably is just as easy to talk about the picture here. The first question is asked. There's still going to only be one. There's only going to be one. One and only one of these three choices are going to run. 
once it's run one, then it's done. Okay. So the, the way to think about this, if x is less than two, we're going to run this one, and then we're going to kind of flush all the way out to the bottom. If x is not less than two and it's less than ten, we're going to run this one, then flush out the bottom. And if x is not less than two and x is not less than ten, we're going to run this one and flush out the bottom. So one of these three, one, two, three, one of those three is going to run. And it's going to run based on the questions that are being asked. The questions do get asked in an order, and the order does matter. Okay, so that is a multi-way if. If, else if, else. So this is kind of like an otherwise, the else is like an otherwise, you know, one way or another, we're going to run something. And if none of these first two have run, we will run this one. We call it a multi-way if. Okay? So here's an example of our multi-way if, that if we say x equals 0, x equals 0, is it less than 2? Yes, it is. So we run small, print small, and then we flush out the bottom. If we switch instead x to 5, x is 5, is it less than 2? No, it is not less than 2. Is it less than 10? Well, 5 is less than 10, so the answer is yes. So we print medium, then we flush out the bottom. One and only one are going to execute. Now, in this case, we got x is 20, and so we come through here. Is it less than 2? No, it is not. It is less than 10? No, it is not. So we're going to do this one and then flush out the bottom. If we go here, it's false, false, go here, all else being equal, we run that one. So this one doesn't run and that one doesn't run, right? Because these are like gateways. If it were true, it would run it, but it's false, so we're going to skip it. This one, if it's false, so we're going to skip it. But then we hit the else, that's like a catch-all, and then if none of these were true, then it will run the else. Any questions? Okay, well, I'm going to ask you a question in a second. Okay, so just a couple of things that probably you're wondering about. Um, you don't actually need an else. You can have a multi-way. X equals 5, if X is less than 2, there is no else here. You'll notice that this print just comes back. And so this way it could, if both of these are false, it could skip them both and just run right through here, and there's no else clause. Okay, so in this case, if this one's going to, the way this one's going to run is x equals 5, if x is less than 2, it's, it's not, then it skips to here, if x, else if x is less than 10, which it is, it will run that one and come here. But for a different value of x like 95, uh, if x was 95 or 59, this would be false, it would skip it. This would, LF would still be false, it would skip it, and the only thing it would print out would be all done. Okay? Okay. You can also have many LFs. So, better change to green. It checks this one. If it's true, it runs the first one. If it's false, it checks this one. If that's true, it runs this one. And then it skips, right? And so, so the way to think about this is is it just goes through and checks this one false, this one false, false, false. Oh, I finally found one, and now I'm done. It still is going to do one and only one of these. This one has an else, so that sooner or later it is going to do one. And it only will do the else if all of these are false. All have to be false. Then it will actually come and hit the else clause. It's great, because there are lots of situations where you're like, oh, is it before 8 in the morning? Or is it between 8 and noon? Or is it between noon and 5? Or after 5? After midnight? I don't know. Okay, so here coming up is a question. And there's two puzzles, and I'm going to stop so you can look at them for a while. And I want you to figure out, in both sides of this, which of the lines will not execute regardless of the value for x. So in both sides, there is a line that won't execute regardless of the value for x. Which will never print? There's two problems. Problem A and problem B. Okay, I'll have some coffee while you think.
Okay, hopefully you paused it so that you could actually think for a bit. So, so I'm going to guess you probably got the first one right. That's pretty straightforward. I, I mean, actually, you're in great shape if you got both of them right. If you got any of them right, you're in great shape um, because that means you're starting to get it. It's starting to like, oh, I'm seeing kind of this flow picture. There's a picture. I look at these characters that seemingly look like gibberish and a picture arise or a pattern of excess, uh, uh, execution arises. That's what we want to see. So, the, uh, in the first one, which will never print. Well, we're looking for kind of a value for x, which will be uh, defective. So if x is less than 2, we're going to do this. Else, if x is greater than or equal to 2, we're going to do this. Else, we'll do that. Well, here's the problem with this one. For all values of x, it is, is either going, x is less than true is either going to be true or greater than or equal to, be, to true, greater than or equal to be, for x to be greater than or equal to 2 is going to be true. So it's going to run this one, or it's going to run that one. So for big numbers, numbers above 2, it's going to run this one. Below 2, it's going to run that one. So this one is never going to run, okay? Because the one of the first two is going to be true, and so the third else situation is not going to run. Hope you got that right. Okay, so let's take a look at the next one, okay? So the question is, you know, is x less than 2? Do this. If x is less than 20, do that. And if x is less than 10, do this, and otherwise do that. Well, the one that will never execute is this one. And x equals 15. Uh, no, x equals 15 is a bad one. x equals 5 is the one that will sort of cause it to behave badly. And so if x is 5, this is false. If x is less than 20, this is true and then it's done. So the problem is this is the one that will never execute because if a value is less than 10 it's also less than 20 so this will be true. So for a value like 5 which happens to be less than 10 which you would think would cause that line to execute it does not. This one executes because it's checked first. Now if we just moved this code took this code and we moved it down here then it would make more sense. Okay? Oops. We moved it down there, it would make more sense. But basically the answer to these is change color. This one won't execute, and this one will never execute for any value. So there's the answer. Okay, so we're almost done with conditionals. I want to show you one more kind of conditional. It's a little bit different. It's not a bit of code structure that you make. It is it is dealing with the fact that some things may blow up. Like if you read a number from a user and you try to convert it to a floating point number, as you may have already done in some of your homework, um, it can blow up. You know it's going to blow up, but you don't exactly want to kill your program. So the concept of try and accept are, hey, this is a dangerous thing. I know it might blow up. I know exactly what it might blow up, but I don't want to die. and I don't want to stop my program when it blows up. I want to continue. And that's the purpose of the accept block. So here's a little bit of code. And, you know, it's, we've done this code before. This is a code that's kind of similar to like your rate and pay homework, where you read a string using raw input, you converted it using float, but then if you typed in Fred, the thing blows up. So we're kind of simulating that right here. So here we have a variable a string called hello Bob, and then we try to turn it into an integer, and then we're going to print that out, and then we have another string called one that has the letters one, two, three. We convert that to an integer, and then we print that one out. The problem is, is that when this runs, this is going to fail. It's going to fail with this traceback. Okay? And the problem is, is when the traceback happens, the program stops executing. The traceback is Python's way of asking you, hey, this would be bad. I don't know what to do. I'm stopping. So that means that the rest of your program is gone. Right? It, the fact that we had stuff down here doesn't matter. This line died with a traceback. It stopped. It doesn't like give you a traceback and then keep going. It gives you a traceback and that's the end. Now this might be something instead of just the string hello Bob, which is insane, data might have come from a raw input where the user was typing and you're saying give me a number and they type something that's not a number. 
And this would blow up. It's like, hey, I know it's going to blow up. The problem with this is that you don't... Oops. Derp, clear the thing. Oh, now I have to start it on fire again. Okay, it's on fire. The problem is, is that in a sense, this program is you. If you recall, we have you as the typing these commands into these scripts, feeding the central processing unit, answering the question, what next? So you should take it a little personally when your program gets a trace back. Because that means you, in the form of your program, have been vaporized. And you're not present to give any more instructions. It stops. It stops dead in its tracks. You are gone. So we want to make sure we control this behavior. We know it might blow up. And we want to capture the situation where it does. And execute alternate code. OK, so here it goes. It's a bit of syntax. I mentioned that it uses the try and accept keywords. These are reserved words in Python. And then it's a little indented block. So a string equals hello, Bob. Great. Try means we're about to do something dangerous. Let's take out some insurance policy on it. And that is we're going to convert this to an integer. Take a str, convert it to an integer, put it in i str. If that works, great. We'll just continue on and ignore this except. If it blows up, we're going to jump into the accept block. And then we'll have alternate substitute code. In this case, I'm going to set the variable to negative 1 as an indicator. Then I'll print it out. I'll do it again. Try this code. And away we go. So when this runs, we know exactly how it's going to run. It, whoop, whoop, come back. We'll set this string. The try takes out the insurance. This blows up. So it runs down to here and runs this part. And then it'll print first minus 1. Then it sets the string to 1, 2, 3. Not 123, but 1, 2, 3 is a string. It takes out an insurance policy. This time it works. And that puts i uh, ister is going to be 123. So we don't run the accept code. And so out comes the second 1, 2, 3. Okay, so the try is take out insurance on this little bit of code. And if it fails, run this alternate code. If not, skip the alternate code. So it's kind of conditional. If you put multiple lines in the block between the try and the accept, it runs until one dies. So if it doesn't come back, okay, it's not taking insurance out on separately on all three statements. It's like, here's a block of stuff, and if anything blows up, stop. And the things that run do run. So if this is really kind of bad code, because you really don't want the print in here, it's, it's actually a good idea in the try except to have as little in the try block as you possibly can. So you're real clear on what's going to fail. Um, but so here we come in. It's Bob, so it's going to fail. We run this. That runs successfully. This blows up. So it quits and jumps into the accept blocks and continues. The point is is that this code never executes. Never executes. The other point is, this code does execute. Just because this blew up, this is already executed. It might have done something other, more complex than print hello. OK? So so there you go. So uh, if we look at this kind of in a picture, we, we set this you know, the try block. It runs, it runs. And the, the try accept kind of has this escape hatch that says, if there is a explosion somehow, then it runs this alternate code, and then it comes out and finishes. OK? And again, this it doesn't go back and finish the block, and it doesn't undo the work that is done by that. So it, it doesn't unexecute it. If it executes and works, it just keeps on going. Then it blows up and then sort of flushes its way out. OK? So here's an example of how you might do this in a running program, like the programs that you're about to be assigned, where you're supposed to check for user input having errors. So here is a little conversion of a number. And, uh, and so we're saying, you know, enter a number. And we're putting a string into raw stir. It's a string. And, uh, and so it, we don't know. And here's where we're going to convert it to an integer. And we're just not sure if it's going to work or not. So we know how int works. It either converts it or it blows up. So we know it's going to do that. We just don't know what the user is going to type. 
we don't know. So we have to take out insurance on it. So this runs, and then we do a try, and then we try to convert it. And if it works, it's great. And if it fails, it runs this and sets it to negative 1. And if afterwards, we either have the number or negative 1. And so if the person enters 42, it says, nice work. Now well, let's show you where it runs. If the person says 42, it runs through here, gets the string 42, converts that to an integer, skips here, and then says nice work. And that's how it runs. If, on the other hand, they type 42 the words, this gets to be the string 42, it runs here, this blows up, so it comes and runs this part here, and then it says if iVal is greater than zero, which is not true, so it runs this part and says not a number. So this is our way of compensating for user input that might have errors in it. Errors that we're anticipating, right? You, 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 you'd rather at least put up some kind of a message rather than just have a traceback if you're writing code for somebody else. It just kind of is not very classy. So, the classic program to do this is a time and a half for overtime pay. So you get some pay rate like $10 an hour for your first or 40 hours and then you get 15 hours for any hours above it. So you have to sort of say, oh, okay, if this ends up being, this ends up being some kind of a thing where, let me draw that picture a little better, hours greater than 40, you're going to do one thing and if hours are less than 40, you're going to do another thing. So you have two payout calculations. If the hours are greater than 40, then you're going to do uh, an overtime calculation, which is kind of like 40 times the regular rate, and then the number of excess hours, like five overtime hours, times the reg rate times one and a half. So this is kind of the calculation that happens if the hours are greater than 40. And then if the hours are less than 40, it's just pay equals rate times hours. So it, you're going to do one or two calculations depending on how it works. So that's one of the programming problems for this chapter. That's a classic. It's the classic if-then-else. You can actually do it with an if-then if you're tricky. There's a lot of ways to do this. So pick, a, pick one and do it. Now, the next thing I want you to do is I want you to uh, take that same program, do it again, and another another uh, assignment or another problem in the chapter, and that is uh, have some kind of a non-numeric input and have it blow up. So if they type, you know, something like nine, put out an error, or if they type something here, put it out an error. Now, don't write a loop. No loop. This is one execution of the program, and this is another execution of the program. Later, we can write loops. We haven't even talked about loops. So this is running it twice. All I want you to do is exit. So take a look in the book as to how to just get out. So it, it's, it, I don't want you to try to say, I'm going to prompt for these numbers until I get a good one. We'll do that later. I just want you to deal with the fact that you read a thing, you, tr you, pr you use the try to convert it to a float and see if it works, and if you don't, you just quit. Don't, don't, don't try to be tricky and repeatedly prompt. So don't repeatedly prompt. One prompt and then quit. Okay? So this is conditional execution. If, if then else. And then I added a little bit with the try and accept as well. And the try and accept is really a limited, cap limited kind of a problem. It really is to compensate for errors that you anticipate are going to happen and you can imagine what you want to do as a replacement for what those errors are. Okay? See you next lecture. Hello and welcome to Chapter 4, Functions, in my book Python for Informatics. As always, these slides and this audio and this video are copyright Creative Commons attribution. Now we are to the point, you know, Chapter 4, we're sort of well into the class, so I figure I should introduce myself a little bit, let you know a little bit. Um, as I said before, uh, I think in the beginning, uh, we're taking, I'm taping this in a wonderful building at the University of Michigan called uh, North Quad. It's a relatively new building. It's uh, 
got uh, some residential sections and some academic sections and some classrooms. And one of the classrooms that I typically teach in is uh, uh, actually 2255 North Quad. It's a really beautiful room with great ways for people to interact. And so sometimes I'm teaching, you know, little tiny Dr. Chuck down here with a smile on the face. Um, and sometimes my students are taking me on, uh, taking my classes on campus, and sometimes students are watching me through uh, lecture. Um, and so this building, building is really beautiful, and if you ever get a chance to come to Ann Arbor and take a look at it, maybe walk through it, it's really, it's really quite nice. One of the things I like about it is that I think it's really uh, highly inspired by Harry Potter. The kind of, of course, Oxford and Cambridge are the real inspiration for Harry Potter, but our, our cafeteria, for example, it kind of looks like the four tables in Hogwarts, and you can kind of imagine a snowy owl flying around and a uh, sorting hat at the, at the front sorting people. And so uh, the, nickname, the nickname for the place is Quad Warts, because it's North Quad quad warts that's like hogwarts and north quad kind of jammed together and of course given that we sort of think of ourselves a little bit as harry potter uh people when they first come in the september uh, often sort of decide to sort themselves and uh, a few years back when the, we first started the building uh the students decided that i did not get to be in gryffindor as a matter of fact it's probably time for me to to show you who I am and who I've been sorted to be. So the students decided that I couldn't be in Gryffindor, that I had to be in Slytherin. And that's because of my name, Charles Severance, and Severus Snape. What's even cooler, of course, is given that I teach Python, Slytherin's house is a snake, right? So makes a lot of sense. I even have this really fancy Slytherin teacup that I use to drink tea during lectures. Sometimes I drink coffee, sometimes I drink tea. Oh, wow, this thing itches, so let me just get rid of it. If I had any hair, that would mess my hair up, so let me get rid of this for the rest of the lecture. Uh, so there I am. Okay, enough of that. Back to, back to Dr. Chuck. So, with that sort of brief, brief interlude, the, um, the topic of the actual topic of this lecture is functions. And so storing and reusing is basically an idea that we will often have a series of steps that we will want to use over and over in a program, increasingly complex. Um, the things we'll use in this lecture are kind of silly um, because I have to keep them short so the slides don't get too long. But a good example of you know the kind of work is uh, maybe I'm going to use uh, Google's geocoding service and I'm going to send some unstructured data back and get a, a GPS coordinate back. And that's a service that I want to call and it would maybe be about this much lines of this many lines of code and I'm going to want to do that all over the place. So that, do I want to put this many lines of code 40 places in my program or do I want to put it one place and then call it in the various places that I need it? And so that's why I call it the store and the reuse function. So if we take a look at the simple syntax here, um, these things are called functions, and some languages are called subprograms, but we call them functions in, <coughs> in Python. And the keyword that we're really going to focus on is def, which stands for define. And uh, what happens here is it, when Python sees this def keyword, it actually doesn't run the code. It says, oh, you're going to make a function, and you're going to kind of turn on a recorder and start recording this code. So it has a colon at the end of it, so it has an indented block afterwards. And so the indented block becomes recorded. So instead of running the code, like if, if we just put print hello and print fun, it would run it. But instead it says, hey, don't run it right now. Name it hello. We give it a name. It's kind of like a variable. We choose the name. We've chosen hello as the name of this. Define it as hello. Have it have these two lines of Python in it. And we'll use it later. Okay? And so that's the function definition. That's the store phase. That is, it's sort of like, it doesn't really run those lines. It sort of makes a variable called hello 
that actually contains Python code rather than containing like 12 or a string or something like that that we've worked with before. So this is the store part and then the reuse part is we then have extended Python. We now can call our bit of code. So we say hello, hello name is what we came up with, parenthesis, and then that says remember that code that I put in there under the name hello? Run it now. And so so, so if I start looking at that and then it just continues. So let me kind of clear this and start over again. And so if I watch what Python does from the beginning, is it reads here and goes, oh, you're defining a function named hello. Great, I will sort of remember, remember. I got that remembered for you. Let's continue on. Oh, hello. You want me to run that stuff that you just got done storing under the name hello. So then it kind of goes and runs it and out comes hello fun. Then after that, it runs to this print, and then out comes print zip. Then we say, you know what? I want to reuse that again. I stored it once. I can reuse it as many times as I want. And now, hello, and then these two lines of code run a second time. So we stored them once, gave them a name, and then ran them twice in the context of wherever it is we wanted. Now, this is not sort of a profound uh, a profound reason to use it in this. I'm just trying to give you the notion that there is a way to store and name code that then you can retrieve later. That's really what's going on here. So there's two kind of functions inside of Python and we've actually been using them almost from the very first lecture and that is there are built-in functions that Python provides to us like float, raw input, int, those kinds of functions. Those are just part of Python but we call them as functions. The difference is we don't write them. And then there's user-defined functions, functions that we write, functions that create functionality that we want them to make use of, like encapsulating the ability to compute pay for time and a half for overtime. And so we name these things and we treat them as new reserved words that we've created. They're kind of an extension to the language, as it were. So when we're coming along, we define a function with the def keyword, right? The def keyword is a reserved word. It's one of the many reserved words back in chapter one that we talked about, and it indicates to Python the beginning of a function. We define it, and then when we call it, it's called invoking. It's like we're building it, and then we're invoking it. And you can build it once, and then invoke it many, many times. So, for example, here is a built-in function called max that finds the largest character, the sort of lexicographically largest character in a string. And so it's like, okay, tell me the maximum character. And so max is not some code that we've written, but we are invoking a function here. And we're passing in an argument to that. So the argument is the stuff in between the parentheses. So the max function can find the maximum of many different things, at this moment, we wanted to find the maximum of that particular string, the highest character in that particular string. So this is a left hand, a right hand side of an assignment statement too. So that has to be evaluated to a value. So it goes into the function, does whatever things the function wants to do, and then the function gives us back a value that becomes the value for max parenthesis hello world, and that value in this case is the letter W. Okay, because the letter W is decided to be the highest letter, and that's what max gives us back. And then we're done, when we're done with that, then that W ends up being assigned, the assignment statement completes. And so you can think of the function evaluation as happening as part of the right-hand side expression calculation. There could be a plus here and other stuff, and it's just at some point a big expression. In this one, it's a simple expression with just one function call. Now, if we look at this, there's some code somewhere. Somebody wrote some code. It's part of Python. You didn't write it. There's a max function somewhere, and you can think of a function as having some input. It's kind of like a program. That's why some languages call these things subprograms, because they have an input. They do some kind of useful works, whatever that useful work happens to be, and then they produce some kind of an output, right? So hello world is the input, the string, the arguments, the thing we're passing in, hello world is what's being passed into the function. The function is running and then something comes back and is sent back. So it has input, processing, and output. Input, processing, and output. So that's how a function, some stored code, whether we wrote it or not, they, they work the same 
when we call functions. Right? So you could think of this as somewhere inside of the Python library is some code that maybe has a little def in there and the name they name the function max and it takes a single parameter and it does some blah 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 loopy blah 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 stuff whatever max wants to do whatever we need max to do based on the specifications that max is supposed to support but somewhere there is code inside of python that actually represents the function definition it's a built-in function because it comes with python and we didn't have to do anything to add it so some common built-in functions that we have been using all along uh, good examples are the float which takes as input anything and returns you a float tape floating point numbered version floating point number version of that type which takes a parameter of a variable or a constant and says what is the type of this float again converting type again and float so these are all things that we've been calling functions all along and it passes the input value into the function the function runs and then gives us back a return value which then participates in the rest of the expression on the right hand side you can think of it as pausing the calculation on the right hand side calling the function getting the result of the function back and then continuing the evaluation of the right hand side then coming up with whatever value and then printing that value out okay another thing <clears throat> that we've done is we've done string conversions right so we've converted in this case a string to an integer and ask what type it is we've converted a string to an integer so int converts its argument whatever that happens to be into an integer so that's just some of the built-in functions that we have talked about so far. Now, this becomes more interesting when we can make our own own functions. Oops, there goes my T bag right in the middle of the thing. Here, let me take the T bag out. I think it's, whoa. Hang on, be right back. bag okay there's my key so so we want to make a new function like I said in the other example we use the def keyword the def keyword here and then we have some indented bit we create a name for it and then have some parentheses these parentheses will later tell the inputs that we're going to pass in but this function has no input so we just go parenthesis parenthesis and then the all-important colon character which indicates the beginning of an indented block of Python that then is the, the text of the function. So it's important to remember that while this is executing, when Python first looks at this, it doesn't run these lines of code. It just remembers them and names them print lyrics. So it doesn't cause any printout. It just causes Python to remember it. I probably said that a few too many times. So, so here is a difficult problem um, and I'll, I'll let you think about it for a while I want you to kind of mentally go through and execute this code and ask what ask yourself what the output of this program would produce how many lines how many lines of output would this program produce so how many of you said three how many of you said five well the right answer is actually three you see five print statements two three four five but two of the print statements are sitting inside of this and we never called we never invoked the function down here okay so this one let's clear this this one prints, these two get skipped, this one prints, and this one prints. So that's why there are three statements that print. There is, stored, but we never used, a function called print lyrics. And it's got two statements in it, but we never used it. So the output of this is hello yo7. And that's because we never actually invoked it. We had to say print lyrics parenthesis or whatever to cause it to call this. Okay, that's just to emphasize that as it looks at it, it does not execute these lines. So, 
Once we defined a function, once we have given it a name, given it code that is a part of it, then we can invoke it or call it as many times as we like. So now our little example works a little better if we actually call our function. Python really doesn't care if you don't call your function. It's like, I, you told me to make one, I made one, you didn't use it, there you go. But if you look at this one now, so here we go, x equals 5, print hello, out comes hello, define, nothing happens here, nothing happens here, it's just remembering. Okay, then it says print yo, then it calls the function print lyrics, which sort of stops us here, runs these two lines of code, so out comes that and that, then it sort of finishes this and it comes back, x equals x plus 2, then it prints x, uh, that must mean x is 7, and so out that comes. And so, so, so again, uh, it, it's on the first time through, oh, go back, go back, go back. On the first time through, it doesn't print, but then when it hits this, it prints. You could say the print lyrics several more times and it would run this as many times as it did, and that it needed to as many times as you want, and it would make output for you. So you can invoke, this is the definition, let's clear this, this is the definition, this is the call or invoke. So we're in, invoking the function, we're calling the function, we're causing the function to execute. Here we are just causing the function to be looked at and defined, but not actually executed. Hope that's clear. Now, when we pass data into a function, and, and, and functions that don't take data are, are not as useful as they could be. There's plenty of things that do. Uh, times that you build a function that doesn't take data, but the most interesting functions are the ones that you can hand them something to work on and they can do their work and then come back with uh, whatever. So this max function is a good example of this, one that's taking an argument. We call the things in between the parentheses when we're invoking the function, we call the things in between the parentheses arguments. Okay, So that's passing into the function, feeding data into the, into the function. So we put arguments in between them. So for example, here we have a little program that, uh, that is, it's a function named greet. And now we are going to define this function and we're going to say, you know what? I would like to take a parameter. Let's take a parameter. Let's have one parameter come in and we need kind of a placeholder for that parameter. So within the function, we're going to use lang. Now this isn't actually a real variable. It's kind of like a, it's a placeholder variable. So this first parameter, whatever it is, when it's called, is going to be lang. And so if that first parameter is equal to es, we're going to print hola. And if it, else, if it's equal to fr, we'll print bonjour. And otherwise, we'll print hello. So there's apparently three languages in the world, uh, Spanish, French, and English. And if it's not Spanish or French, then it must be English. But I have to keep this kind of small so my screen doesn't get too big. So this is, again, just the definition. And if you type this into the interactive thing, it gives you this dot, dot, dot prompt. And so we now have this thing called greet. And now we've extended Python to add our own function to Python. And now we can say greet en. And so it runs this code, except that en is lang. And so that comes, and, and then it prints hello. So out comes hello. Now later, we can say, oh, I would like to do a greeting but this time I'm going to pass ES in as it. So lang becomes, for this execution, ES. And then it prints out hola. And then the next execution, lang is FR. So it executes this three times, but lang is different each time because we've passed in different parameters each time. So that's how we can kind of write general purpose code inside the function and then reuse that general purpose code in different ways. Okay? It's a real powerful, powerful mechanism that makes functions far more useful. Now, functions don't necessarily just have to do stuff. A real powerful mechanism in a function is what we call a return value. So a function can take its arguments, do some work, we've seen that, and then it can return a value. And the key to the return value is when we call the function, like we were calling max, it gives us back some value, like the little w. Okay, So here we're going to make a function called greet that takes no parameters. Doesn't take parameters, 
But it has another keyword. It's another reserved word in Python. And whatever we put on this return statement shows up as the replacement in this expression. So whatever greet is, it runs greet, and then the return is kind of a residual value. So if we say print greet comma Glenn, it says hello Glenn, because the return value for the greet function is the string hello. And if we say greet Sally, it says hello Sally. And so, and, and it's run the code twice, and the return function, return value has been put in here instead. And so the hello came there, and the hello came there, so we get the two lines. So return is a statement that both terminates the execution of the function and defines the value of what will be replaced when the function call comes back in the line that the function was called from. So here is a, a little smarter version of our greet function. It's, uh, it's very similar. It's called greet still. It takes lang as a parameter. And uh, if the language is ES, then it returns the string hola. If the language is French, it returns bonjour. Otherwise, it returns hello. So we're not actually doing the print. If you go back on the other slides, we were printing. But now we're just returning a string. Okay, And so now I can call print greet and pass en in. So then that runs the code once with lang equal to en. And I get back hello and then comma glen. Then I call it again and I pass es in. And then that time it returns the return value here becomes hola, a string hola, hola Sally. And then Michael, I pass in one more time. Lang now is fr, the string fr. And so it returns uh, bonjour. And so the, the residual that is here is bonjour, and so out comes bonjour Michael. So there's a lot to this, right? You're passing stuff in, you have this kind of placeholder variable, and you have this return that sort of appears where it was called from. It goes in, does its work, it comes back, and there's sort of this residual value that sits here. You don't have to have a return in a function. But if you want to do something with a value, then you have to have a return in the function. We call the functions that produce values fruitful, and the other ones are called void. <laughs> so that's a good name for them. So to review sort of this arguments, parameters, and results, if we look at max, the original thing where it's looking for the largest, uh, largest lexogra lexographically largest letter, um, it looks hello world is the argument that's passed in. We have this sort of formal parameter here called imp, which is not really a variable. It just happens to refer to whatever is the first argument when in, the, in any particular call. And then it does its little thing and runs loops and does all these things. And at some point, it returns w so that the thing that comes out when the function quits that becomes the replacement value here is a lowercase w string. And then that is the w that goes over into big. So the return is what defines what comes back here. Because you think of this as it's looking at this, it suspends for the moment, it runs this code, it's holding, it's holding itself here, it's running this code, and then it comes back to here. Okay? And the return value is what defines coming back. So, of course, you can have more than one parameter, and they are in order. So here we have an A and a B. Uh, these, the name of these things doesn't really matter. They're just relevant inside of the function definition. So we are going to add two numbers together by taking A plus B and then returning the sum. The added variable is just kind of local to this function. And now we can say, you know, add to 3 comma 5, and then this will come back as 8, and then 8 will get assigned into X, and so that'll print out 8. And so you can have as many of these as you want, and the order matters, and there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. Uh, 3 goes to A and 5 goes to B when the thing is called, and then the return value, again, comes back. Okay? So that's sort of arguments. And like I said, uh, not all functions have to return values. We call them void functions when they ret don't return anything. It's uh, totally fine for that to be the case. So at this point, you might be thinking to yourself, OK, great. Well, I still don't quite get why to use functions. And in reality, in the first 10, 11 chapters of this book, other than using lots of functions, we're not really going to spend a lot of time making functions. Because most of our programs are going to kind of be that long. And we're not going to do a lot of reuse in the program. 
And there'll be a time when your programs become complex enough that you'd be like, oh, thank heaven for functions. I think it's premature to say you must use functions, even though there are some exercises that just say, hey, do this with a function, just so you kind of get the understanding of a function. Um, you will find soon enough, as your programs grow, you'll go like, oh, I keep doing the same thing over and over again. Let me pull that up into a function and pass a parameter in, have a return value, and away you go. Or you might find that you're moving from one program to another and you have this common thing that you want to do, so you make yourself a library that you drag along. And we will do lots of libraries. Uh, the book in the second half does lots and lots of library stuff, doing things like parsing XML and, and this, that, and the other thing. So, so don't feel like you need to use functions on every assignment because they're a natural thing when a program gets big enough. So, so, so just kind of understand them on a mechanical level, but it'll come to you at the right time when it's time to start building your own functions. So in this class, we kind of, you know, talked about functions, just got you started, talked about parameters, talked about built-in functions, talking talk about return values, the store and reuse pattern. So um, the, the problems at the end of the chapter for this particular chapter are, are relatively straightforward in that, I, I, like I said, I, it's, we don't have a real strong need to do functions yet in this class because the programs aren't large enough. But I just said, okay, take, take one of your previous assignments and refactor the code so that at the top there's a def, compute pay, and you put like the if and whatever in here, and then later on, you do your code and then you call compute pay. So you took code that you already had, you move it up into a function and make a function. And I've also online got sort of a sample of this because it's a, it's a little complex. And so uh, you should be able to find on Python Learn or on the course site, um, you should be able to find a good example because I really want you to sort of get this. Um, they'll, like I said, there will come a time when functions will make the most sense to you. But up, coming up next, of course, is chapter five, and that's loops, and loops are going to rock the house. And so we really, that's our fourth major pattern is loops, and, uh, and I'm looking forward to it. And so we'll, uh, we'll see you at the next lecture. Hello, and welcome to chapter five, loops and iteration. As always, this lecture is copyright Creative Commons attribution, including the audio and the video and, and the slides and the book even. So... Now we're getting to our fourth basic pattern. Uh, we've talked about sequential, where steps happen one after another. We've talked about conditional, where steps may or may not happen. In chapter four, we talked about the store and retrieve pattern. And now we're going to talk about the looping pattern. And the looping pattern is the last of our really foundational ones. And it, it potentially is the most important one, because it's the thing that allows us to get computers to do lots of things that, say, humans might get tired of, but computers don't tire of. And so after this, we'll start sort of becoming a little more skilled in the basic language capabilities. We'll uh, talk about strings and, and then start talking about files and start doing some real work um, after we get done with this. So bear with us. It's going to be a while, but uh, we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. So welcome to uh, Repeated Steps. This is the example that I had uh, in the first first lecture, chapter one. And the basic idea, just to review, is that you have this while keyword. The while keyword sort of functions like an if in that it implicitly has a decision that it's going to make. And it's either going to do the code in the indented block or not do it, or skip it, basically. Right? So you either do it or you skip it. The difference between the while and the if is that it's going to do it many times as long as this question that we have remains true. Okay? And so in this case, n is 5, while n greater than 0 functions like an if. So yes, it's going to run it. Prints out 5, subtracts 1, so it's 4. Goes back up, goes back up, and asks the question again. Is n still greater than 0? Well, since it's 4, yes, we'll continue on. Out comes 4, then n gets subtracted. 3, 2, 3, 2. And then we come through, we print 1, print 1. We subtract n to 0. We go up. We go back up. n is now not greater than 0. So we come up and we execute outside the loop. We leave the loop. And that really means in the Python code, we skip to whatever's lined up with the while statement, the in same indent level as the while statement. 
And so that's how it works. And I just print n at the end here to remind ourselves that n ended up at 0, not at 1. The last thing we printed out in the loop, the last thing we printed out in the loop was the 1, but n ended up at 0 because it was this loop was going to run as long as n was greater than 0, so n had to sort of be not greater than 0 to get out of the loop. Okay? So that's basically a review of what we've done. Now, oh, wait, 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 something else. Um, iteration variables. Okay, so the key to this is these loops can't run forever. We don't want them to run forever. We want them to run in t as long as we want them to run. They may run a very long time, um, but not forever. There's got to be a way to get out of them. Otherwise, we call them infinite loops, which we'll talk about in the next slide. And so the iteration variable is generally some variable that is changing each time through the loop. And we are changing it by subtracting one to it, from it. And, and so this thing is going to keep running. And we can pretty much see that, oh, this is going to exit, right? Whatever n is, it could be a large number. But eventually, it's going to get to 0, right? So the iteration variable controls how many times the loop runs. And it also allows us to do something different inside the loop. And of course, this is like a trivia loop where we're just printing the iteration variable. But it just means that this loop is going to run five times, and it's going to do something potentially different each time. Uh, if you just ran the loop that did the same thing over and over and over again with no data changing, that's kind of dull and pointless. So just because you have an iteration variable doesn't mean that you've properly constructed your loop. It's a, it's a common problem, or something we want to avoid, is an infinite loop. And here is a, a carefully constructed loop. We start n at 5 at the beginning. We have a good question at the end, while n greater than 0. It's going to run this as long as n is greater than 0. Um, but the problem is, is we don't change in the little block. We don't change the n, which means it's going to come back, and n is going to be 5. And then it's going to run this, and then it's going to be 5. And n is going to run this, and it's going to be 5. And so this is an infinite loop, which means this loop will never exit. It will never get out. It's just going to run forever in here because n's not changing. Neither of these statements change n. So part of the iteration variable is there needs to be something that changes so that the loop will ultimately make progress to accomplish what it is and know when to stop. So this is an infinite loop. And of course, lather, rinse, repeat is commonly put on shampoo and conditioner. Uh, and so, uh, you know, you can, next time you're in the shower, take a look at your shampoo and conditioner and find the in infinite loop that's, that's on most bottles of shampoo and conditioner. Now, here's another loop, just to emphasize that it's possible to structure these loops in a way that they never run. So this function is as an if. The while functions as an if. And so when n is set to 0 and we ask the question, it is literally going to make the decision based on n greater than 0. Well, it is not greater than 0, so it's going to go right by it. Over here, it's going to come in here and go right to there and never run these lines of code. And that's, we call this a zero trip loop. And that's okay. I mean, this is a silly one, of course. Um, it just shows that the test, the question that's being asked, is above the lines of, that make up the body of the loop. And if it's false, it, the loop never runs. So it's possible that these loops have zero trips. Okay? So that's a loop. Now, there are more than one way to sort of control the flow of a loop. Um, the basic flow of the loop is when it gets to the bottom, it goes back up to the while and, and does the check. This is a different way of getting out of a loop or controlling the execution of a loop. There is a keyword or a part of the Python language called, um, what color do I got? Oh, green's over here, uh, called break. If you looked back at reserved words, break was one of the reserved words. Break says, Hey, if I'm in a loop, stop the loop, right? Get out of this loop. I'm done with this loop. And so here's this loop. Now, the interesting we, thing we've done is I just got done talking to you about infinite loops. We have just constructed an infinite loop because the question is right there, and the answer is yes, true, true. And that's a way to construct an infinite loop. We've done this because we have a different way of getting out of the loop. So we've constructed a loop that just on the face of it, just looking at that line, looks like an infinite loop. So what this loop does is it reads a line of input, checks to see if it's the string that we've entered is done. And if it is, we're going to skip out with his break and get out of the loop. Otherwise, we're going to print it. So at a high level, what this loop is going to do is prompt for, for strings of characters. 
until we enter done. And that's exactly what it does. It prompts, we say hello there, it prints that out. We say, we say finished, it prints that out. We say done, and it's done. So it, when we say done, it comes out and finishes the loop, and, and that's the end of the program. Okay, so to look at this in some more detail, um, the first time it comes in, does the raw input, because true is true, so it's going to run it, and then we enter hello there. It checks to see if what we'd entered is equal to the string done. It is not, so it skips, and it does the print. And we do this one more time, and we type finished, and then the line is not done. That variable line does not have the value done in it. So we print that. We come in one more time, but this time this is true, and so it goes in and executes the break, and then it escapes the loop. And so you can think of, right, here is the body of this loop, because that's where the indentation starts and ends. The break says, break me out of the current loop that I'm in and get to that next line that has the same indent as the while. So whatever it is, break says we are done with this loop. When that statement executes, we are done with the loop. We're finished with the loop. It'll run until that executes because we've got this set to be while true. Okay, so there's a simpler, I mean, this is sort of a simple way to draw this. Break is sort of a jump to the statement immediately following the loop. If you really want a picture of this, I think of this as kind of like a Star Trek transporter, where you kind of come into break and then poof, your molecules are sent to the four corners of the universe and you reassemble outside of the loop. And so if we look at this sort of in my little roadmap version of these things, right, the while loop is going to run for a while, yada yada. There can actually be more than one break as long as they only get this. But the moment that somehow some if or whatever hits the break, then it gets out completely, and so it escapes the loop. And so it's sort of like um, you 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 you're, you're zoom 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 zoom. You come in here, and then you are you are rematerialized outside the loop. That's what the break does. Okay. So break is one way to control the execution of loops. Now, another way to control the execution of loops that doesn't actually exit the loop is called continue. Continue basically says, hey, I'm done with this iteration of the loop. Now, each time through the loop is we call that an iteration. Continue says, I don't want to stop the loop, but I want to stop this iteration and advance to the next iteration. And so what we have here is we have the same basic loop, a while true, which kind of makes us an infinite loop. Um, we're going to read a line, prompting with a less than sign. Um, and if it's done, we're going to break. That code is down here, and we're going to print it if we fall through. So normally we'll be reading and printing, and if the line is done, we're going to break out. That's what we just got done doing. But the new part is right here. And this is, we'll learn this in the next chapter. If line sub zero, if the first character of the line is a pound sign, we're going to continue. And what continue says is it doesn't actually get us out of the loop, it jumps back up to the top of the loop, which means that it ignores, for that iteration, the rest of the loop, right? So if execution comes in here, uh, let me clear that. If execution comes in here and hits this line, it goes back up to the while, okay? which means it, whatever this is, it's not coming out of this if. It's going back up to the while. Okay, So continue ends the current iteration and jumps to the top of the loop and starts the next iteration. And so if we look at how the code runs, hello there prints. Pound sign with the first character doesn't print, so there is no printout right here. Print this is not done, and we enter done, and then the loop ends. Now another way to sort of draw this is that continue jumps to the top of the loop. It it does run the question, right? It does check the question. So here's another way to, to draw that picture. And so here again we have a loop and it's happily running and there can be breaks in there and there can be continues in there. And as long as we don't hit a break or continue, the loop just sort of runs and goes up to the top. And at some point, some if, we hit the continue and like a transporter, Instead of going out of the loop, we go to the top of the loop. But it's important that we go and we check the question, right? So the continue is not likely to exit the loop unless the question has become false. So the continue is likely to come up here, run some more, then we hit the continue, comes up here. Oops, oops, I did that backwards. Run some more, 
clear this out. So the continue could run many times, right? So we have the loop, loop runs a bunch of times. Then finally we hit the continue. Continue goes up to the top. If it's still true, we'll run the loop some more. Then you might hit the continue. Then you might go up to the top, come down, round and round and round and round, hit the continue again, go up to the top, yada yada. Now in this in this particular loop, this break eventually is down here, and that's how we get out. Okay. So the continue goes back up to the top of the loop. So these loops that we construct with the while keyword are what we call indefinite loops. I mean, looking at the ones that we've written, which are two lines or six lines, we can kind of inspect them and understand when they're going to stop. And we're going to know that they're possible to stop them. A loop that won't stop is an infinite loop. Um, sometimes these loops can be rather <coughs> complex, and you may not actually be able to look at them because they're many lines and... and uh, and and so we don't know, and so so it's real careful. You have to be real careful when you construct these to make sure that they stop as as things get more complicated. Now the cousin to indefinite loops are definite loops, and definite loops is something where we have a list of things or a set of things that are a kind of a known set of things, a finite set of things, and we're going to write a loop that's going to go through that set of things and do something to each thing in that set of things. And the keyword that we we'll use for this is the for. So we use the Python for keyword that says, we're going to write a loop, but instead of it just running until some condition becomes true or false or we hit a break, um, we're actually going to know how many times this is going to run. Now you can actually use break and continue in for loops. We call these definite loops because the how long they're going to run is kind of well known, basically. So here's a simple definite loop. And it's kind of like that while loop that we just got done looking at, where it's counting down and then saying blast off. And so the way we construct this loop is we have the for keyword, which is part of the Python language, the in keyword, and then we have an iteration variable. I've chosen i as my iteration variable. And basically what we're saying is, dear Python, run this indented block, and there's only one line in the indented block, run it once, for each of the values in this little list. This is a Python list. Square brackets make Python lists, comma separated values. So it says, I would like i to be 5, then run this code. Then I would like i to be 4, then run this code. Then I would like i to be 3, then run this code. i should be 2, then run this code. And i should be 1, then run this code. And so this is a, a pretty clear, and I like this word in. It says, you know, doop, 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 and then run this each time. And so out of that comes, Five, four, three, two, one, and then the loop is done. We Python is doing all the tricky bits here. Python's figuring all these things out for us and handling all this, and then we're done. And so it's it's if you look at it, we have an iteration variable, but we didn't have to increment it. We didn't have to do anything. Python took care of a lot of things for us. And so when we're looping through known list of things, or later when we read a file. We're going to be loop through the lines in the file, and so the for loop is a really nice, powerful, and it's syntactically cleaner. It's really quite nice. Now, it's important to realize that you don't have to just loop through numbers. I did that one with a set of descending numbers, so that was equivalent to the while loop that I started at the beginning. But this is a loop where what it's going to loop through, through is a list. Close square brackets are a list in Python. This is a list of three strings, Joseph, Glenn, and Sally. Their string constants and then commas are how we make lists. And so friends is a mnemonic variable. Python doesn't know anything about friends in particular, but I've chosen this variable name to be friends. And it's a list of three people, Joseph, Glenn, and Sally. And so I have an iteration variable called friend, and I'm going to loop through the set of friends. Now, Python doesn't know anything about singular. Python doesn't know anything about plural. I'm just choosing these variable names because it makes a lot of sense. This is a set of friends, because it has three of them in it. And this is a single friend. What it's really going to do is friend is going to take on the successive values, Joseph, Glenn, and Sally. And this little block of code is going to run once for each of those three items in the set. And the variable friend is going to take on the successive values of that set. So out of this comes three lines of printout. Happy New Year, Joseph. Happy New Year, Glenn. Happy New Year, Sally. And of course, this is the I bit right over here. But we just made it so, hey, Python, look. However many friends there are, run this code one time for each one, change this variable friend to be 
each of the successive ones in order. And then we print that we're done. Okay. So the for loop, sort of we go and try to make a picture of the for loop. The for loop is kind of a powerful thing. It's, it, does, it does two things. It decides if we're done or not, how do we keep going in the loop, or, well, I mean, and as long as we keep going, we're going to advance the i value, the iteration variable. It takes care of it, the responsibility of changing the iteration variable. We do not have to add lines of code in that change the iteration variable. Okay, and so if we take a look, you know, we come in. Are we done? We're not done. Set i to the right thing, then print it. Out comes five. Advance i, advance i, print it, advance it, print it, advance it, print it. Oh, now we're done, right? I was not the thing that decided when we were done. The for loop just keeps track internally as I moves through these things and it goes like, oh, I'm all done. I'll take care of that. I, 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 you finished. So it doesn't. There's no if in here. It's not like if i equals one, stop. No, no, no. It just says you told me to do five things. I'm going to do five things, and then we're going to stop. And so again, the for loop, the for loop here, is got sort of two functions: decides how long the loop's going to run and changes the iteration variable based on what you've told it to in this in clause. Okay. So I think in is a real elegant construct. It's just a keyword, but it's sort of, if you think about math, math, if you're familiar with sets, it's like something inside of a set of something. I think it's a real pretty way to think about it. Um, and you can kind of think of it a little more abstractly that you say, well, here's a little indented block of code, right? And I want it to run some number of times for each of the I values in the set, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. That's how I kind of think of it. So I, I think this is a real pretty syntax. Different languages have different looping syntax. I think this is really a very expressive, very pretty one. Yeah. So another way to th so 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 one way to think about this picture is that you know the for loop causes sort of repeated execution, and there's we're driving in the circle, and then we stop, right? The other way to think about this is to, to, not, to think about it a little more abstractly, right? To say, hmm, you know, at the end of the day, all I'm really telling Python is I want to execute this block of code five times, and I want the variable i to change from to these three values. So in a way, you could think of this as expanded as the for loop sets it to five, then runs your code. The for loop then sets it to four, runs your code. The for loop sets it to three, runs your code. For loop sets it to two, runs your code. Sets it to one, runs your code. These two ways of looking at it are the same from your perspective because you're just asking Python to do something. Whether it does it this way or whether it does it this way, you hardly can tell the difference. It's probably going to do it this way. But logically, it's not that different. It's not different from doing it this way. You're saying, run this block of code, change i in the following way. Cool. It's like we don't have to worry. I mean, we can use mentally either model of what's going on inside because it doesn't matter because they're the same. OK, so these definite loops are really cool. Uh, starting in a couple of chapters, we'll mostly use definite loops to go through lists or dictionaries or tuples or files. Uh, and so it's a finite set of things. It can be a large set of things, but it's a finite set of things. OK, so now I want to talk about loop idioms. Loop idioms are how we construct loops. And we're going to, the, the loops kind of have some kind of a goal in mind. Finding the largest, we played with that. Finding the smallest, counting the number of things, looking for lines that start with pound sign, something like that. They, they have a kind of a high level view of what they're supposed to do. And then we have to kind of build a loop to accomplish that. And, and this goes back to how we have to think like a computer, right? We have to say, hey, computer, do this over and over and over again, and then I'll get what I want once you've done that over and over again. You have to do something a million times. I'm not going to sit here and wait. At the end, I get what I want. So I call these kind of smart loops, or how, how to kind of build intelligence into loops. So for example, we want the largest number, right? But we have to construct a loop that will get us the largest number thinking like a computer. Okay, thinking computationally, thinking like a computer. So the idea is that we have some kind of a loop, and there's, we're going to go through this list, some list of things, 
and this is going to run a bunch of times. And But the way we're going to do it is we're going to set something up before the loop starts. We're going to do something to each of the things that's being looked at. And at the end, we're going to get the result we're looking for. Okay? And so in the middle, it's kind of like working. It's in the middle working. Da 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 da. And then here is the payoff. The payoff is at the end when we get the information that we're interested in. So I will sort of use in the next few examples this simple loop. And uh, right now it doesn't do much. It does a print before. And it has this variable thing that goes through the successive values of these numbers. And it prints it out, right? So that middle part says run this six times, once for each of those values, and then after. Okay, and so we will add some intelligence at the beginning, we'll add some intelligence in the middle, and we'll add some intelligence at the end. And then the whole thing will accomplish what we want. Right now this is kind of not that intelligent. So now what I want to do is I want to review the thing we did and I want you to remember what the largest number is and I'm going to show you a sequence of numbers in order. Ready? I'll do it kind of quickly because you've seen this before. So I'm only showing you one number at a time so you want to tell me what the largest number is. So here we go. The first number is 9. The second number is 41. The third number is 12. The fourth number is 3. The fifth number is 74 and the sixth number is 15. So what was the largest number? Did you have to go back? Or did you remember how to do it? Okay, well, I will give you a clue. It was 74. Okay? That's because I know. Okay, now if you did that, and you had to do that for 20 or 30 numbers, you'd have to create a mental algorithm in your head to approach it and stay concentrated focused. So you would have created a variable in your head called largest so far. I would show you the first number which would be 9 and you would go mm, well 9 is larger than one, negative 1 so I will keep that. That's the new largest I've seen so far. That's pretty awesome because it's way better than negative 1. 41 whew, I thought 9 was good but 41 that is a lot better so I'm gonna keep that one that's the that's the best it's the largest we've seen so far we've only seen two numbers but the best we've seen so far is 41 so 12 that's not larger who, who cares about that it's not as big as 41 so we'll just go right on to the next on to the next three that's lame when we're looking for large numbers so we skip whoa 74 74 that's a rockingly large number so we're gonna that's a lot that's actually the largest we've seen so far because it's bigger than 41, and 41 was the former champion largest we've seen so far. And there's 74, so we keep that one. I don't know how many letters we're, uh, these things we're going to see, right? We could see lots of them, but um, the next one we see 15. Well, pff, that's no good. We got 74 already. 74 is like totally awesome, right? So now, oh, we're done. So hey, we're done, and so 74 is the champion. That is the largest. It's not even the largest so far anymore. It's actually the the largest. It's the largest. So again, we had this thing at the top. We had this loop in the middle. And at the bottom is where you kind of get the payoff. And the payoff is not in the middle. While we were largest so far, largest so far, largest so far. But at the end, it turned out, once you've looked at all the variables, all the values, the largest so far is indeed the largest. OK, so here's the algorithm for this. And I have some variables. And remember that underscores are valid characters in variables. Now, <clears throat> I'm being a little ex over explicit in this. So I have a variable called largest so far. Then what I do is I set it to negative 1. Then I print before so we can see that largest so far is negative 1. Then we have a for loop. And my variable iteration variable is the underscore num. So that's going to take on the successive values 9, 41, 12, 3, 74, 15, and run this indented loop of code. Okay? And so the num will be 9 first time through. If the num, 9, is greater than largest so far, then grab the num and assign it into largest so far. Then print at the end of the, each loop largest so far and the num. So, so in effect, the num is 9. We compare it to negative 1, and negative one is, uh, 9 is higher, so we make largest so far be 9. 
Next time through the loop. Next time through the loop, num is 41. So we compare largest so far with 41. And we like it, so we store it. So we like it, we run it, and we print out 41 is the largest we've seen so far. Then we run again. We come in. The num now points to 12. The num, 12, is not greater than 41. And so we skip. So the largest so far stays 41, and we see 12. Similarly, the num advances to 3. We skip. So we saw 3, but the largest so far is still 41. Continuing, the num is now 74. It runs. 74 is greater than 41. And so we run this code. And so we say uh, 74 is stuck in largest so far. And indeed, then we print it out. And largest so far is now 74. We continue on. We go up one more time. The num points to 15. But 15 is not larger than 74. And so we skip. We print out 15 and 74. And then we come out. And at the end, at the end, we get the largest so far. It, the name no matter, no longer, I mean, it's kind of largest so far at the end is the largest, but the variable name. Okay? Got it? That's one idiom. So let's just switch to another idiom. Now counting. How many things are we going to, how many times is the loop going to execute? How many things are we going to find in the loop? It's all kind of the same notion. And the pattern is really simple. We start some variable zork. A better name for this would be count, but I want to call it zork. And then we have a loop. And then in the loop, we just add one to zork. And at the end, zork, and that should be light blue right there, zork should be the total count. Now, of course, we can look at it and say it's going to be six. But assume this loop is looping through a million lines in the file or something like that. So it's, so it's cheating to kind of look at it and say, oh, it's six, because we want to actually compute it. So it's really simple. You know, Zork starts at zero. It's going to run Zork as one now, and two, three, four, five, six, and then we've run out of stuff, and then we print out six. Okay? So that's kind of the idiom, right? Before, during, and after. Right? We do something before, we do something during. And, it, and in a sense, this Zork here is the number we've seen so far. And at the end, it becomes kind of the total number. Summing in a loop, very similar. Again, you have to think of this as there's a whole bunch of variables here. We start a variable at 0. Each time through the loop, we add whatever it is that we're seeing. Instead of adding 1, we're adding 9, 41, 12, 3, 7, 4, 15. And Zork would be best thought of as running total. So Zork is the running total. And so if we look at the numbers 9 as it comes, Running total is 9, running total is 50, running total is 62, 65, 130, 154. And then we skip out, and at the end, the running total becomes the total. Okay? So that's another of these patterns that sort of we do something at the beginning, we do something in the middle, and we have uh, something very nice for ourselves at the end. Finding the average of a sequence of values is the combination of the two previous patterns. This time I'm going to use more mnemonic variables, a variable called count. Everyone calls this count. Sum, now the total would maybe be a better word for this, the running total. And then, so the count and the sum start out at zero. And then each time through the loop, count equals count plus one, so we're adding one to count. Sum equals sum plus value, so we're adding one to, to sum. I mean, adding the value. Value, of course, being 9, 41, 12, 3, 74, 15. And then at the very end, we can print out the number. We have six things with a total of 154, and then we calculate the average. Of course, these are integer numbers, and so this is a truncating division. So 154 over 6 equals 25 and not 25 point something. If we were in Python 3000, Python 3, it'd be better. But so the average, the integer average is, of the numbers we just looked at, is 25. So sometimes we're searching, like for a needle in a haystack, uh, looking for something. Um, and again, you have to think of like you're handed some amount of data and you got to hunt for something. And there might be a million things and you might only want five of them. And you can either look by hand or you can write a loop that's got an if statement that says, found it. 
Maybe I found it at line seven or found it wherever. So this is filtering or finding or searching, looking for a needle in a haystack in a loop. And so the, the idea basically is, is that we have this loop. It's going to go through all the values, 9, 41, 12, 3, 74. But we put in the loop, we embed an if statement. If the value we're looking at is greater than 20, print, I found it. So when value is 9, this is going to do nothing and just go and make value be 41. And then value 41, oh, yep, there we go, print large number, so out this comes. Then value becomes 12, nothing happens. Value becomes 3, nothing happens. Value becomes 74, oops, this time it's going to happen, so out comes large number 74. Then value becomes 15, nothing happens. And then value is all done, and so it comes and finishes. So this is the searching or filtering or catching or or whatever, okay? We can also sort of, if we don't just want to print everything out, we want to say, is something in there? Go look through this million things and tell me if blah exists. And in this, we're going to introduce the notion of Boolean variable. Uh, Boolean is a true false. It only has two values. And we've already used it in the while true. So that capital true, that is a constant. It's just like 7 or 42 or 99 or Sam. Um, and so we're going to make this variable called found. Now found is a mnemonic value, variable. It's just a name I picked. So found equals false. This is going to be false until we find what we're looking for, and then it's going to switch to true. So it starts out and it's false. Then we're going to run this bit of code three times. Um, and if the value that we are looking at is three, then we're going to set found to be true. And we'll print found value each time through. So value is going to take on 9, 41, 12, 3, 74. So we get a line of output for each one. And the first time through, it's not yet found because we're looking at a 9. Second time, we've not yet found. We looked at 41. Still false. So it could stay false for a long time. Oh, we found a true. And then that means that this code's going to run once. And so you can kind of think of this found variable as sticky. It's going to stay false. And then the rest of the loop is going to stay true. And at the end, it is true. Now, the way we usually do these kinds of things is we don't bother with this print statement, so we wouldn't see all this stuff. All we would see is before, false, after, true. And after would just tell us that, yeah, we found it. There was a three somewhere in that long list of numbers. Okay, I'm just adding this print statement so we can kind of trace it. But basically, this loop sort of from here to here is asking the question, is there the number three in the list that we're about to go through? Okay? Now... How could, I'll just give you a second and ask you a quick question. You can pause if you want. How could you improve this loop using the break? Where might you put a break to make this loop smarter? It's okay if you didn't, if it doesn't jump out at you. So if you think about it, once you hit true, there's really little point in looking at the rest of them. There just is no point. So we could put a break right here inside this block. You say, look, I'm looking for a 3. All I care is whether I found it or not. If I find it, I mark it to true that I found it, and I get out of the loop. Why bother? Why do all these things? All right? Just get out. Okay. So don't worry about it. I'm just pointing that out. That that's one of the places where break could be used. The loop functions either way, it just, it just looks through all the rest of them as well. Okay, so here's this largest value one that I've used before. And, you know, away we go. We, you know, we have largest so far. We check to see if the one we're looking at is better. And if, if it is, we keep it. And then away we go. And we find that the largest is 17. What if, what would you have to change? in this code to make this search for the smallest of all the values. Like point, point where in the screen. Where, what would you have to change to make this look for the smallest in a list of values? What is the nature of what's making this about being largest? What would you have to change? Okay, pause if you like. So here is some things that you might do to make it work about smallest. 
So hey, one thing we would do, let's change the name of the variable. We had a variable named largest so far, and now we'll change it to be called smallest so far. Changing the variable name doesn't change the program at all. But it makes the program easier to read if the program works. So it's like smallest so far. Okay, but that didn't make it about being small. The thing that made it about being small is change this greater than to a less than. Because we're kind of thinking when we're doing largest so far, if the number we're looking at is bigger than the largest so far, we keep it. If the number we're looking at in the smallest is smaller than the smallest so far, then we want to keep it. So this is like keep. This line here is the keeping line. And this is the win line, win to keep. We'll keep it if it's smaller. Okay? So that's the key. And, I, and so, yeah, so I name it smallest so far, whoop de doo that, That's good. But the real thing that had this being about largeness and smallness was whether this is less than and greater than. And this was the repeated code that got rechecked over and over again. So, but this still has a bug in it. So let's run this visually. Okay, so now we've got a variable called smallest so far. We are going to check to see if a series of numbers that I'm about to show you are smaller than the smallest so far. So the first number is 9. Is that smaller than negative 1? No, it's not. Negative 1 is smaller. The second number is 41. Is that smaller than negative 1? No, it is not. The next number is 12. Is that smaller than negative 1? No. Negative 1 is smaller than 12. 3? No. Not smaller. 74? No. Not smaller. 15? Not smaller. So, we're all done. Yay! And the smallest number we saw on the list is... Negative 1? Negative 1 wasn't even in the list. So that's not a very good program. So let's take a look at what went wrong with this program. So we fixed it. We fixed it as best we could. All right, we made it. We changed the words largest to smallest. Yay, that'll fix. It just makes it more readable. It doesn't actually change the program. And we made this less than. So now what happens is it comes in. If 3 is less than negative 1, smallest so far, of course, is negative 1, it, this just never runs. This never runs. And so as we print, smallest so far stays negative 1. And, oops, that should be negative 1 right there. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot to fix that. Here, let me magically fix that. Boom. So let's take a look at what went wrong with this. So here we have the code. Smallest so far is negative 1. We have it fixed so that we're checking, looking for smaller numbers rather than larger numbers by turning this to less than. But the first time through, smallest so far is negative 1, and the num is 3. 3 is not less than negative 1, so we skip through. And the printout at the first line is negative 1, 3. And it doesn't take long to realize it's just going to keep doing this. Smallest so far is going to stay negative 1, no matter what we look at on this side. And then we're going to come out the end, and we end up with negative 1 as the answer. Not very good. So the question is, what should we make this value be? Negative 1, it barely worked in the largest because we were working with positive numbers. And so starting with negative 1 is the largest so far was a reasonable assumption as long as the numbers were all positive. But what would be a good number to choose here? Think about that for a sec. Pause if you have to. Let me clear it. Let me make it real clear. What's the right thing to put here? Okay. So, what? A million? That might work. Or a million might work. But what if this number, you know was, you know, what if, what, if, what if all these numbers were um, larger than a million, okay, then, then that wouldn't work. So the problem is, is there's no real good value unless you could make this be somehow infinity, okay? Uh, you could make this be infinity. But there's a way to do this in Python 
and it's a really kind of cool technique. It's sort of a way we signal ourselves. And that is we're going to use a special value. Not negative one, it's not a number. And the special value we're going to use is none. It's a different type. It's not a number, it's itself its own type. So what we're going to do is we're going to mark smallest as none. And, and, and sort of at a high level, what we're really saying is um, we haven't seen anything so far. The smallest we've seen so far is none. We've not seen anything so far. Now we have to change our loop, our little if inside the loop. And this is this intelligence in the middle. First we say if smallest is none. Is is an operator, part of the Python language. If smallest is none, exactly the same as none, then the smallest we've seen so far is the value. Now this is going to happen the first time. Because smallest starts out none, and then as soon as we set smallest to the value, it's going to be that first number. So it's going to be 9. Okay, so smallest is quickly going to become 9. Then we print out the, new sm the smallest is 9 after we've seen the 9. Then we go up to the top and we say, is smallest none? And the answer is, no, it is not, because smallest is now 9. Then this else if is going to ask, is the value we're looking at, which is 41, is the value less than smallest? Well, no, it is not. 9 is smaller than 41. And so in a sense, after the first time that's executed, after the first time the statement is executed, this is going to always be false, right? Because smallest is no longer none. And this is going to be the thing that really is operating. And then it's going to work. And when we, you know, smallest will become 9. The smallest so far is 9. But then we see the 3 finally. And the value of 3 is less than 9. And so then we take 3 and we stick it into smallest. And we end up with this. And then... The loop runs some more times, and when we're all done, we have three. So the trick here is we put this none in, and we have a little more if code to check to see if we haven't seen anything so far. This is what you can think of this as a way to trigger on the first, first iteration. Special code that's really going to, it could, it looks at it on each iteration, but it's never true after the first iteration. Okay? So that's just a technique. So this is and the is not operator, I think, is a real elegant thing. Um, don't start overusing it. It's um, at a low level. Its real meaning is exactly the same as in type and value. Um, there's a is and there's an is not. Um, but don't like say like if don't don't do things like saying if I equal. Uh, oops. <laughs> I won't even let myself type the bad code. If I is Four. Don't say that. Okay. Don't say that. Don't don't do if I is four. Um, it, it, it may work in certain situations. It's really best used in very limited situations where you're checking for some of these special values like none and false. Okay. The problem is is if you use equality here, it tries to kind of convert values and it may end up giving you a false yes. And so is is a stronger equality than simple equals. Um, equals is same value, same numeric value, whereas is is exactly the same thing. But don't, don't overuse is. Use double equals 95% of the time and use is when you're checking if it's one of these special constants like true or false. Okay? Okay, so this is a... Iterations. I mean, our loops are going to get more sophisticated, and we have more interesting things to do. But we, you know, we talked about some indefinite loops, definite loops, iteration variables, some patterns like maximum, minimum, summing, averaging. You know, we introduced the concept of none. You know, and and uh, and so this is we're getting there. We got a couple more chapters before we really start hitting the data analysis. So see you in the next lecture. Hello, and welcome to chapter six. This chapter we're going to talk about strings and stuff is going to start to get real now. So, as always, this material, this video, these slides and book, and copyright, Creative Commons Attribution. I want you to use these materials. I want you to, somebody else, I want to make more teachers so everyone can teach this stuff. Use it however you like. Okay, so we've been playing with strings from the beginning. I mean, literally, if we didn't work with strings, we could have never printed Hello World. And, and Lord knows, we need to print Hello World in a programming language. And so 
we've been using them, especially constants. Uh, now in this chapter we're going to dig in. So, oops. So a string is a sequence of characters. Uh, you can either use single quotes or double quotes in Python uh, to delimit a string. And so here's uh, two string constants, hello and there, and stuck into the variables str1 and str2. Uh, we can concatenate them together with a plus sign. Python is smart enough to look and say, oh, those are strings. I know what to do with those. Um, and you'll notice that the plus doesn't add any space here because when we print Bob out, um, hello and there are right next to one another. Um, if, for, for example, we've done some conversions, so when we're like reading pay and rate and hours and stuff, we've done some conversions. So this is an example of the a string 1, 2, 3, not 123, but the string quote 1, 2, 3, quote. Uh, and we can't add one to this. We get a uh, trace back, kind of at this point as we expected. And we would uh, convert that to an integer using the int function that's built in. See how much Python you already know? I mean, this is awesome, right? I can just say, oh, you call the int function, and you know what that is. That's, sorry, sorry, I'm just awesomed out. So you convert this to an integer, and then you add one to it, and then we get 124. So there you go. We've been doing strings all along, had to. I mean, literally, strings and numeric data are the two things that uh, programs deal with. So we've been reading and converting. Again, this is sort of a pattern from some of the earlier programs where we do a raw input, you know, and the raw input just takes a string and puts it in a variable. So if I take Chuck, then the variable contains the string C-H-U-C-K. Uh, even if we type numbers, that is a string. We can't, just because I put 100 in, I still can't subtract 10. We get a happy little trace back. Oh, happy little sad face trace back. Um, and, uh, and, but of course, if we convert it int or float or something like that, if we convert int or float, we can do that and subtract 10 and we can do that. So, so we've been doing this for a while. We've been doing strings and manipulating strings and converting strings all along. So the thing we're going to start doing now is we're going to dive into strings. We realize that strings are addressable at a character by character basis and we can do all kind of cool things with that and so uh, a string is a sequence of characters and we can look inside them using what we call the index operator the square brackets and we've seen square brackets in lists and you'll see that there's sort of similarities between lists of numbers and in effect a string is a special kind of list of characters so if we take the spring string banana the string banana starts uh, the first character starts at zero so mm -hmm. We call this operator sub, so letter equals fruit sub 1, and that is the second character. Now, this may seem a little weird that the first character is a 0 and the second character is a 1. It actually is kind of similar to the old elevator thing, where in Europe they're called the first floor is 0 and then negative 1 and the second floor is 1. All right, it's kind of the same thing. Actually, it turns out that internally 0 is a better way to start than 1. Um, it, you'll get used to it, and then after a while, there's some little cool advantages to it. But for now, beginning is zero. Just beginning is zero. It is the rule. Just remember it. Okay, so the zero is B, the one is A, the two is N, etc., etc. And we call this syntax fruit sub one, okay? So that is the sub one character of fruit, and then that is an A. So that fruit sub one says, look up in banana find the one position and give me what's in that one position. That's what the sub. And what's inside these brackets can be an expression. So if we set n to 3, n minus 1, well that'll compute to 2. And then fruit sub 2 is the letter n. Right? So that's fruit sub 2. Okay, It's the third character, fruit sub 2. So the index starts at 0. The, we read the brackets as sub. Fruit sub 1, fruit sub 2. Now, Python will complain to you if you use this sub operator too far down the string. Here is a character with 3, which is 0, 1, and 2. If we go to sub 5, it blows up. Now, you know, by now, I hope that you're not freaking out about traceback errors. Remember, traceback errors are just Python trying to inform you. And if we just stop looking at that as mean Python face, and instead look at that as, oh, index error, string index out of range. Oh yeah, I stuck a 5 in there and there's only 3. Oh, my bad. Thank you, Python. Appreciate it. Thanks for the help. So think of this as like, it's not a smiley face, but it's kind of like a, 
a quizzical face, right? It's like, eh, I don't know. So Python's confused, and it's trying to tell you what it's confused, okay? So don't look at these as sad faces. Python doesn't hate you. Python loves you. Python loves me, too. So strings have individual characters that we can address with the index operator. They also have length. And there is a built-in function called len that we can call and pass in as a parameter the variable or a constant, and it will tell us how many characters. Now this banana has six characters in it that are 0 through 5. So don't get a little confused. The last character is the fifth is sub 5, but it's also the sixth character. So the length is really the length. It's not length minus 1. Okay? So len is like a built-in function. It's not a function we have to write. As we talked about in chapter the functions chapter, there are things that are part of Python that are just sitting there. And so we are passing banana, the variable fruit, into function. We're passing it into function. And then into the len function. Then len shh, does magic stuff. And then out comes the answer. And that 6 replaces this. And then the 6 goes into the variable x. And so x is 6. I sure made that a messy looking slide. And so think of inside the len function, there's a def. Len takes a parameter, does some loopy things, and it does its thing. So it's a function that we might write, except we don't have to, because it's already written and built into Python. OK, so that's the length of the string. That's getting it individual characters. We can also loop through strings. Obviously, if we can use the index operator and we can put a variable in there, we can write a loop. This is an indefinite loop. So we have this variable fruit, has the string banana in it. We set the variable index to zero. We make a little while loop. And we ask, as long as index is less than the length of fruit, now remember the length of fruit is going to be six, but we don't want to make that less than or equal to because then we would crash because the last character is five. We can say letter is equal to fruit sub index, so that's going to start out being index sub, is going to be zero, so that's fruit sub zero. Then we print index and letter, so that means the first time through the loop we're going to see 0b. Then we increment our iteration operator. Then we go up. And then we come out with 1a and index advances until index is 6, but has printed out each of the letters. Now, we're not doing this to just to print them out. We will do something a little more valuable valuable inside that loop. But this gives us the sense that we can work through a loop just why, like we, 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 we can work through a string just like we work through a list of numbers. Okay? Now, so that was how you do it with an indefinite loop. In a definite loop, it's just far more awesome. Okay? Just like we did with the list of numbers, Python understands strings and allows us to write for loops using for and in that go through the strings. So basically, for letter and fruit, now remember, I'm using letter as a mnemonic variable here. It's just a choice, a wise choice of a variable name. So that says, run this little block of text once for each letter in the variable fruit, which means that letter's going to take on the successive B, A, N, A, N, A. When I look at that, I always worry that I misspelled it. I think I got these right. The if I rewrite this book, I'm not going to use banana as the example because I'm terrified that I misspelled banana because I don't know how many ends banana has in it. But be that as it may, we are abstracting. We are letting Python say, run this little block of text once in order for each of the letters in the variable fruit, which is BANA, and so it prints out each of the letters. So this is a much prettier version of the, the, the looping. So using the definite, the for keyword, instead of the while keyword. And so we can just kind of compare these two things. They kind of do the exact same thing. And it also is kind of a gives you a sense of what the for is doing for us, right? The for is setting up this index. The for is looking up inside of fruit. And the for is advancing the index. So the for is doing a bunch of work for us. And I've characterized that sort of in the previous lecture, how the for is sort of doing a bunch of things for us. And that's it allows our code to be more expressive and and instead of so this is a lot of this just kind of bookkeeping crap um, that we don't really need and so the for loop helps us by doing some of the bookkeeping for us okay so we can 
to all those loop idioms. We can find the largest letter, the smallest letter, the how many times. So I think I, what, how many N's are in this or how many A's are in this. And so this is a simple counting pattern and a, and a looking pattern. And so our word is banana, our count is zero. For the letter in word, again, boop, 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 that comes out like that. So it's going to run this little block. If the letter is A, add one to the count. So this is going to basically print out at the end the number of A's in banana. It would probably be more useful for me to print out the number of N's in banana because I never know how many N's are in banana. But it looks like there's supposed to be two, or otherwise I have a typo on this slide. So the in, again, I, I love the in. I just absolutely love this in. I love this syntax. This for each letter in the word banana. It just To me, it reads very smoothly. Cognitively, it fits in my mind what's going on. For each letter in banana, run this little indented block of text. Again, very pretty. I love in. It's one of my favorite little pieces of Python. So... Again, with the for, it takes care of all the iteration variables for us, and it goes through the sequence. And so here's, here's an animation, right? Remember that the for is going to do all this work for us, right? Letter is going to advance through the successive value, the successive letters in banana. So letter is being moved for us by the for statement. Okay? So that's looping through. Now, it turns out there's a lot of common things that we want to do that are already built into Python for us. Um, clear the old screen there. Um, we call these slicing. So the index operator looks up various things in a string, but we can also pull substrings out using the colon in addition to the square brackets. Again, this is called slicing. So the colon operator basically takes a starting position and then an ending position, but the ending position is up to but not including the second one. So this is, it's up to but not including, up to but not including. Just like the zero, you get used to it pretty quick, but the first time you see it, it's a little bit uh, wonky. So if we're going zero through four, that's how I read this, print s sub zero through four, or better, better said, s zero up to but not including four, that is print me out the chunk that is up to but not including 4. So it doesn't include 4, and so out comes mont. All right? So the next one is 6 up to but not including 7, so it starts at 6, up to but not including 7, so out comes the P. And even though you might expect that it would trace back on this, Python is a little forgiving. So here's a moment where Python is a little forgiving saying, you know, I'll give you a break here. If you go 6 but up to but not including 20, I'll just stop at the end of the string. So 6 to the end. So it, it, you can over-reference here and you cannot get, you won't get yourself in trouble. So that comes out of Python. So again, the second character is up to but not including. And that's the kind of the weird thing there. Of course, once you remember that the first character is 0, 0 up to but not including. Nice. If we leave off the first or the last number, leaving off the first number, the last number, and both of them, they mean the beginning and end of the string, respectively. And so uh, up to but not including two is MO. Um, eight colon means starting at eight to the end of the string. So that's THON. And then that means the beginning of the end, and so it's just the whole string, Monty Python. Now we've already played with uh, string concatenation. Just thing to emphasize here is the concatenation operator does not add a space. Does not add a space. If you want a space, you explicitly add it. So here there's no space in between the, the O and the T, but here there is a space between the O and the T because we explicitly added it. So you can concatenate more than one thing and you add your spaces as you want. Okay. Another thing you can do is you can ask questions about a string, sort of like uh, doing a string lookup using the in operator. This is a little different than how we use it inside of a for loop. This is a logical operation asking a question like less than or greater than or whatever. So here is an expression. So fruit is banana as always. Is n in fruit? And the answer is yes, it is. True. 
So this is a logical operation. It's a question. It's a true or false. Is M in fruit? No. False. And you can. this can be a string, not just a single character. Is N-A-N in fruit? The answer is true. And you can put sort of, you know, if parts of ifs, etc., etc., etc. So this is a logical expression that can be on an if. You can have a while, etc., etc., etc. So it's a logical, logical expression and it returns true or false. You can also do comparisons. Now the comparison operations equals makes a lot of sense, less than and greater than depend on the language that you're using Python. And so if you're using like a Latin character set, then alphabetical matters, uh, you know, the, the way the Latin character set would do. But if you're in a different character set, Python is aware of multiple character sets and will sort strings based on the sorting algorithm of the particular character set. So you can do comparisons like equality, less than, and greater than. And we've seen some of these things in previous lectures, actually. We've had to use them. So in addition to sort of these sort of fundamental operations that we can do on strings, um, there's an extensive library of built-in capabilities in Python. And uh, so the, the way we see these built-in capabilities are they're, they're actually sort of built into strings. So let's go real slow here. Here we have a variable called greet, and we're sticking the string hello Bob into it. Now greet is of type string as a result of this, and it contains hello Bob as its value. But we can actually access capabilities inside of this value. So we can say greet dot lower parenthesis. This is calling something that's part of greet itself. It's a part of all strings. The fact that greet contains a string means that we can ask for, hey, give me greet, which just gives you back what you're looking for. Like here, print greet is hello, Bob. Or you can say, give me greet lower. So this is giving me a lowercase copy. It doesn't convert it to lowercase. It gives me a lowercase copy of hello, Bob. So zap is hello, Bob, all lowercase. Now, it didn't change greet, right? And you can even put this dot lower on the end of constant. So why you do this, I don't know. But hi there, with H and T capitalized, dot lower comes out as hi there. So this bit is part of all strings. Both variables and constants have these string functions built into them. And every instance of a string, whether it be a variable or constant, has these capabilities. They don't modify it. They just give you back a copy. Now, it turns out there is a, a command inside Python called dir to ask questions like, hey, well, here's, you know, stuff is got hello world. We can say, I don't know, redo this. Come here. Stuff has a string. We can ask, hey, what are you? I am a string. Dir is another built-in Python that asks the question, hey, what are all the things that are built into this that I can make use of? And here they are. That's kind of a raw dump of them. You can also go look at the online documentation for Python and see at the, Pyth oops, at the Python website, you can see a whole bunch of these things. And they have the calling sequence, what the parameters are, etc. So when you're looking these things up, you can go, go read about them. Here's just a few that I pulled out. Capitalize, which uppercase is the first characters. Uh, center ends with find. There's stripping. So I'll look through a couple of these, just the kind of things to be looking for. Be a good idea to take a look and read through some of the things. Here's a couple that, that we'll probably be using early on. Um, the find function, it's similar to in, um, but it tells you where it finds the, the particular thing that it's looking for. And, um, and so we'll put fruit is banana. And I'm going to say pause, which is going to be an integer variable, equals fruit.findNA. So what it's saying is, go look inside this variable fruit, hunt until you find the first occurrence of the string NA. Hunt, 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 hunt. Whoop, got it. And then return it to me. So that's going to give me back 2. 2 is where it found it, right? So where is it in the string? That's what find does. And if you don't find anything, like you're looking for a Z, and no, 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 I didn't find the Z, then it gives me back negative 1. So just, again, this is just one of many built-in functions in string, the ability to find a substring, okay? 
or find, yeah, find a character or string within another string. There's a lowercase. There's also an uppercase. This might be better named shouting. Upper means give me an uppercase copy of this variable. So hello Bob becomes hello Bob. And then lower is hello Bob. Right? So these are both ways to get copies of uppercase and lowercase versions. Uh, you might think these are kind of silly, but one of the things that you tend to use lower for is if you're doing searching, and you want to ignore case, you convert the whole thing to lowercase, and then you search for a lowercase string. So it depends if you want to ignore case or not. So that's, that's one of the reasons that you have things like this. There is a replace function. Again, it doesn't change the uh, value. Uh, greet is going to have hello Bob. And I'm going to say greet dot replace all occurrences of Bob with Jane. That gives me back a copy in nster says hello Jane. So, so greet is unchanged. This replace says make a copy and then make that following edit that you that that we requested. <clears throat> now we can also say, well I mean the replace is going to do all occurrences. So greet is still hello Bob. This is kind of redundant here. I'm just doing it so you remember what it is. Greet is still hello Bob. I put hello Bob back in it and replace all the occurrences of lowercase o with uppercase x. And then that happens. So this says go through the whole string. Doing all those replacing. Okay. Now another common thing that we're going to have to do is we're going to have to uh, throw away white space. Sometimes you have a string that has characters, blank characters, or other characters at the beginning and the end, non-printable characters and we can strip them. And there's three character, three functions that are built into to, uh, to Python strings that do this for us. There is lstrip, which strips from the left. There is rstrip, which strips from the right, so throws away these white spaces, so hello Bob is gone. I mean, the, so it gets rid of these characters. Oops, these are the ones that are gotten rid of there. I need an eraser. And then oh, let's use white. And then strip basically gets rid of all the white space, both on the left and the right side, and gets rid of that. So we're gonna we're gonna be using these a lot. It one of the things you tend to do in Python is cleaning up data. Sometimes if you have spaces at the beginning or the end, you just want to kind of ignore them. So you strip them off. You throw them away. When we're looking for data, we sometimes are looking for a prefix, and there is a starts with function. <clears throat> that gives you a true or a false. We're asking here, does this variable line start with the string please? And the answer is true, because it does start with the string please. Or, and the next, we ask, does this start with the letter P? And the answer is false. It does not start with the letter P. Okay, so there's lots more of these things. And reading data and tearing it apart is one of the things that we're going to really focus on uh, for the rest of these first few chapters of the book, okay? Because that's one thing that Python's really good at. It's tearing data into pieces and pulling the pieces that you want. So, so let's take a look at this line. So this line that we've got here is a line from an actual email box. This is what, if you, if you looked at your email sort of on your hard drive, email boxes would have this kind of a format. And there's actually many lines, and in, in soon we'll be reading whole files full of email. But for now, let's just say we've got this one line somehow. And we're looking for, we don't know how long these things are going to be. The first character, the first thing is from, then there's an email address, then there's some detail about when the mail was sent. But what we actually want is we want this part right here. And that's the domain name of the mail address, right? We want to extract this out. We're faced with this line in a variable, and we want to extract that out. So this is kind of putting all these things together. So let's walk through how we do this. So here's this line, and it's a big long string. Mostly we would have read this from a file rather than just put it in a constant. But for now we put it in a constant because we files is the next chapter. And so what we're going to do is we're going to say, you know what? I'm going to look at this line, and I'm going to go find the at sign. And I want to know where the at sign is. So I call data.find at sign and put the result in at pose. And that gives me 21. It hunts 
until it finds the at sign and then tells me where it found it. Then what I want to look at is starting here for the rest of the string, I want to find the first space afterwards. So what I say is this sp pose is my variable for the position of the space. Data dot find a blank starting at the at. So this is starting at 21. So it says I'll start at 21 and I'll look for the next blank. And I find that at 31. So now I know where the at sign is and I know where the space is. And so what I'm looking at is I want the stuff one beyond the at sign up to but not including the space. So then I can use a slicing operation. I can use a slicing operation. Start at the at position, add one to it, so we advance one, that's going to be the letter U. And then a slicing operation up to but not including space. Up to, this is going to work out nicely all of a sudden, but not including. Okay? And then I'm going to take that slice, which is really this little bit of data right here, take that slice and put it in the variable host. Then we print that out and we get the piece. Okay? And so here we have some data we want to tear apart. We hunt for the at. We find it at position 21. We start at 21 and we look for the, the space after that, 31. And then we pull from 22 up to, but not including 31. And it, it wouldn't matter where this thing was, because these aren't all the same length when we start looking at them in files. But it would have found the at sign and the space after the at sign, and it would have reliably pulled out the host. Okay? So this is a basic pattern we call parsing. Parsing text. Like, find this, find that other thing, grab this thing out, then look inside that thing. and So it does all these things, right? So... So that's kind of strings. Up next we have files. Files are going to be lots of strings. So we're going to start putting all these things together. And, uh, and so the next chapter is a really, really important chapter where it starts to really start coming together. So uh, see you soon. Welcome to Chapter 7, Python for Informatics, Exploring Information. I'm Charles Severance. I'm the author of the book and your host. And as always, this is brought to you by, no, I'm sorry, uh, it's all creative copyright, creative commons attribution. The audio, the video, the slides, and even the book. So here we go. Oh, and, um, and so frankly, where we've been working all along is we have been writing code and talking to the CPU. Hang on, let me, let me go get my CPU and stuff. Hang on, be right back. Okay. Here we go. Here we go. Here's all the stuff. Remember the stuff from the first lecture? Ah, there we go with that. Remember the motherboard from the first lecture? This is kind of a picture of what's on the screen. The motherboard, the CPU plugs in here, memory plugs in here. And remember how the CPU is sort of the brains, as much brains as there is for the operation. This CPU is asking what next. The instructions come in through these little pins. There's data inside and it stores sort of semi-permanent data. Variables are all stored pretty much here in RAM. And we write our programs, and so your Python programs, they're sitting here in this RAM, and they're being fed to this CPU through those chips, uh, through those pins, right? The pins, I mean, it doesn't really connect like that. And so, so frankly, up to now, everything that we've been doing is just the Python programming language. And so the only place we've really been operating is here. We have been putting Python into the main memory, and the main memory... And we have been effectively feeding instructions to the CPU, the central processing unit, as it needed them. And then the program would stop. And everything we've done so far, everything, is just sort of fiddling around here. We have never escaped it. So now we are finally going to escape from the central processing unit and the memory. We'll still write 
programs and have variables in here. But now we are going to use the disk, the secondary storage, the permanent media, right? So if I go grab my Raspberry Pi, right, that disk goes right there. Here's my Raspberry Pi. So here we got the Raspberry Pi, which is the small version, which of course has a CPU, memory, and graphics processor all on this little chip right here. But the secondary memory for the is this little SD card that is the secondary memory for Raspberry Pi. So the structure of the Raspberry Pi is exactly the same as the structure of any other personal computer. It's just smaller and less expensive. And so in the Raspberry Pi, if you're programming in the Raspberry Pi, you're sort of finally escaping. All your programs were in here, your CPU is in here, and that's pretty much how, how far you got to run. But now, of course, when you save your files, you save them to here. But now we're going to start looking at data on the disk drive. And so it's time to escape to the secondary memory. Okay, Time to escape to the secondary memory. There's a Raspberry Pi, you go right there. Okay, so it's time to find some data to mess with. So a lot of what we've doing, been doing so far is just kind of the pre-work to get to the point where we can do this. And in here, we're going to have data files. Now, we've been making data files. You've been writing every Python program that you write on your computer gets saved as a file. Then Python reads the file and runs it. But now we're actually going to start messing with some data. And so files are where we're going to be working with. And so... The, one of the things about secondary memory is it's much larger. I mean, this is main memory of the computer is pretty large. It's just not large enough to hold everything that the computer is capable of holding. So the files that we're going to work with, now we're not talking about image files or QuickTime movies or things like that. We're going to work with text files because the theme of this course is digging through text. Sometimes we'll pull it off the internet. Sometimes we'll read files. But it's digging through and using all the things that we've learned so far, looping and strings and all those things, to make sense of a sequence of information. Okay? Now, to access file information, we have to do this thing called opening the file. We can't just say, yo, the information is just omnipresent. Because there are so much data that you can't have Python sort of know all the data. You literally have hundreds of thousands of files on your computer's hard drive. Um, and you, which one are you going to read? So there's a step that you have to do that you call this built-in function called open and say, oh, this is the file I want to work with of the hundreds of thousands. And then once you do, you've kind of got this little connector into it. And uh, the open is a built-in function inside Python. Hang on a sec, let's say goodbye to that. The open function is a built-in function in Python. And you, it takes two parameters. The first parameter is the name of the file, like mbox.txt. And then the second is how you're going to read it. Are you going to read it? Are you going to write it, etc. Now, most of the time, we'll be reading our files. So we call the open function and pass it in the name of the file we want to uh, open, and then how we want to read it. Now, you can leave this second parameter off, and it assumes that you're going to want to read the file. Now. When the open is successful, it doesn't actually read all of the data because the memory is small, small compared to the hard drive. And so you have to sort of step through the data. You'll tell it to, when to read it. So the act of opening it isn't not actually reading all the data. It is creating kind of like a connection between the memory and the data that's on the hard drive, right? It's connecting between, oh, let's do this. Oh, that's going to fall down. It's going to stand up that way. Oh, I should come up with a way to make that stand. Ah. So uh, it's a connection. So the, your program's kind of running in here, and the, and the file handle is just sort of a, it's like a phone call between your memory and your disk drive. It's not the actual data. The actual data is still sitting on the disk drive. Okay? So a graphical way to take a look at this is this file handle, the thing that comes back from the open request, the open goes and finds the file out on the disk drive, yada, yada, yada. And then the handle is something that lives in the memory that is sort of like the thing that maintains its connection to where all the data is on the disk or on the SD RAM that's in it. 
So the handle is not all the data, but it is a mechanism that you can use to get at the data. So if you print it out, it doesn't have all the data from the file. It says, I am a file handle. It's open this file, and we're in read mode. So it doesn't actually have the data, even though this is the data that's in the file. And then we have operations that we do to the handle, like open it, close it, read it, write it. So we do things. So, so the handle, and then through the handle, it actually changes what's on the disk or read what's on, reads what's on the disk. So the handle is kind of a thing that's not there. If you attempt to open a file and the name of the file, now the way we're going to do these is these need to be in the same folder on your computer as, in, uh, as your Python code. Now there are trickier ways to do it, but we're going to keep it simple. This is the name of a file in the same folder as the Python code that you're running. And uh, if it's not, then we get, of course, a traceback. And we're used to using reading tracebacks by now. No such file or directory stuff.txt. Oh, of course, I forgot to save it or I typed it wrong. So the next thing we have to learn is the notion of the new line character. We haven't seen this so far. But there's a special character in files that is used to indicate the end of a line. Because these text files that we've been writing, including the Python programs that you have, are organized into lines. Each line is variable length. And there's a special non-printing character that you just don't see. Now, you see it because you see a line, multiple lines, but you don't see the character itself. So, we'll, so it, it turns out that this character is very important because the data is just a stream of characters on disk and then it's punctuated by new lines that tell it when it's time to end the line. So um, if we're building a string, the constant for new line is backslash n. And so <clears throat> when we make a string that we want to have a new line in it, we'll say hello backslash n world. And then if you print it out one way, you actually see the backslash n, but then if you use the print to print it out, you see sort of like the it moves back down, you know, to, to the left margin and down. So so sometimes you see the slash n, and sometimes it's shown as movement, right? You move it moves it. The other thing that's important is even though we represent this as two characters, the backslash n is represented as two characters in a string, it's actually one character. So if we print it out, we see x new line y. And if we ask how many characters are in stuff, which is this string, it says three. That's important. Okay, There is one, two, three. The new line is a single character. This is just a syntax that we use to sort of encode a new line in a string. Okay, So even though these are just a long sequence of characters punctuated by new lines visually, text editors and operating systems show them show these files to us as a sequence of lines and after it doesn't take very long to just start thinking about them as a sequence of lines as a matter of fact maybe you never wish I never told you about new lines but when we start reading files we're going to have to deal with these new lines so the way that we sort of have to mentally visualize of what these text files look like is they have a new line that punctuates the end of the line now in reality if we look at this this R really comes right after it, right? This is all a bunch of characters, and the new lines are punctuation, okay? To say this is first line, second line, third line, fourth line. So you got to think that each of these things is here, sitting at the end of the line. And so the number of characters in this line include that new line. Now, the new line is one character, okay? So how do we read these files? Well, we've already talked about doing an open X file. And I'm just, this X file, again, that's just a mnemonic name that I made up. This is a handle. Remember, it's not all the data, but the handle is the way that we can read the data. We can use it as a access point. The coolest way to read a file, if it's a text file in multiple lines, is to use a determinant loop, a for loop, for cheese in X files. So this, remember, we would put a list of numbers or a string here. Now we've put a file handle here. Python knows automatically that each time we're going to run this loop, it's going to go to the next line of the file. Automatically. For, a cheese is just a stupid name that I came up with. It probably would be better to call it line rather than cheese. But for, cheese, in, and then it goes tut, 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 each file, and then stops when it reads the whole file. So this line will print out 
every line in the file. That's how you do it. These three lines open a file, read every line in the file. Okay? So a file handle itself is a special kind of a sequence, much like a list of numbers or a string is a sequence of characters. So one of the things we can do to combine one of our counting idioms is count the number of lines in a file. Okay, and so how we would do that is we would open the file, set a counter to zero. This time I'll use a mnemonic variable called count. Four line in F hand, that says run this indented text once for each line in the file. For each line in the file, add count equals count plus one. When the for loop is done, print the count. Pretty straightforward. Very few other languages are capable of writing that program in as quick and as dense, as succinct a way as Python is. Python does a really, really nice job of this. Okay, so that's how you count the lines. Open it, write a for loop, and then add one. Now be, we can't just say, we. so what you can't do, and this gives you a sense, is you can't say len f hand. And that's because this isn't really the data. That's sort of, you have to like pull the, pull it and read it to get the data out of it. Although we'll see another way of reading it later. Okay, so that's counting the lines in a file. It turns out you can also read the entire file. Now if you read the entire file, it's not broken into lines. You're getting all the characters punctuated by new lines and you get everything. Now you don't want to read this if it's too big. So it's going to all try to read it into the memory of the computer. And if the memory is not big enough, the computer is going to slow down to a crawl. But if it's a real tiny file, this works just fine. And so, so we have sort of real, uh, we open a file and we say fhand.read. This is basically saying, hey, dear fhand, read it all and return it to me as a string. So that's a string with all the lines of the file concatenated together with new lines which is actually exactly what's in the file. It's the raw data. That for loop sort of looks for the new line and does all the stuff automatically for us that's quite nice. So then we can, like, because imp is a string at this point, we can just print the length of it. And we can say, oh, there's 94,626 characters that came from that file. It reads the whole thing, whole file, reads the whole file. We can also do things like, you know, slice it now. And so this is the first... 20 characters up from 0 up to but not including 20. So this is this is our file. Okay? So that's reading through the whole file. So let me go back a little bit. This is the file that we're going to play with. This file here that we're going to play with in this class is a mailbox file. And this is actual real data and these are real people and these are real dates having to do with an open source project that I worked on called Sakai. I actually have a tattoo of Sakai here on my shoulder. Uh, maybe in an upcoming lecture I'll have a short sleeve shirt and show you my tattoo. But for now I can't because I've got clothes on. So, um, but this is real data. It's the mbox.txt mbox.txt file. So, so that's the file that we're going to use for most of the next few assignments. It'll be the same file. You'll get tired of it. And you get to know all these people. Steven and Chen Wen and all the people in the file. Okay, so we can search for lines that have a prefix. This is kind of the find pattern from the uh, looping lecture. So we're going to go through a list of, of lines in a file, and we're going to only print out the ones that match a certain thing. So again, we open the file up. We're going to write a for loop that's going to say for each line in the file, if the line, and then we can call a, a, a utility function inside of string, because line is a string. If line starts with from, print it out. So this means it's going to loop through all of the lines of the file, and it's going to print the ones that start with the string FROM colon. Okay, again, four lines, complete Python program to read this file and print the lines that have a prefix of from. So if you run this program, and I suggest that you do, this is what the output's going to look like. And it's like, Wait a second. I'm seeing the lines, seeing the lines that have the froms. But then I get these blank lines. And why is that? Why are these blank lines there? If I look at the program, I mean I'm not printing blank lines. I'm only printing lines that start with from. I'm not doing that. So why? 
What do you think? I'll give you a second. I've certainly done enough foreshadowing in this lecture. Well, it turns out these new lines are the problem. So it turns out that the print, and we've been doing this all along, you just didn't, we didn't make a fuss about it. The print adds a new line at the end of everything that it prints. So these yellow new lines are coming from the print statement. But when we read the file, each line ends in a new line. So these green new lines are actually from the file. They're the ones from the file. So what's happening is we're seeing two new lines, and so that turns in to a blank line. So how do we deal with that? Well, we've got a string function that conveniently solves that problem. Okay? And that is we're going to call R strip. If you recall, we had strip, L strip, and R strip to strip white space on one side, on the other side, or on both sides. So in this one, we're going to use R strip. We're going to say, we're going to read the line that this line is going to have a new line in it. R strip says pull white space, and the new lines are also counted as white space. Blanks or new lines are white space. And then we're going to replace this with no new line in it. Then we're going to ask if it starts with a from, and then we're going to print it out. And then we go and we're going to see exactly what we're looking for in this file. And there's no new lines. Now there, so the new line that's coming out here is the one from the print, not the one from the file, because the one from the file got wiped out by that particular line. Okay? So another general pattern of these file-based loops that we um, have done this is a skipping pattern. Now you can do the non-skipping pattern is where you're saying I'm going to look for lines that start with from and do something to them. Sometimes you want to do something to all to to the uh, to, to you want to say here's a bunch of lines I'm going to skip and then I'm going to do something. So the skipping pattern uses continue. And so the first few lines here are the same. We open a file, we read each line in the file, then we're going to strip off the white space. You're going to get tired of typing these three lines because you're going to do it a lot. Open the file, start reading the file, strip the white space for each line. And you can make it so that you can look for some fact. In this case, I'm going to say if not line starts with from, means this is true for all the lines that don't start with from, continue. And if you remember, continue goes up. So the continue says, I'm done. It finishes the iteration, and it doesn't do anything down here. Okay? And so it, this is, a, and then we can do something. So I've kind of flipped this where I said, these are the things I'm interesting, interested in. That's lines that start with from. So I'm going to skip the lines that don't. So I'm going to use continue. Either way, you can do it depending on the complexity or how much often when you're this is a good pattern when you have lots of lines of code down here that you're going to do a lot of cool stuff with you can also use things like in to select lines right so I'm gonna I'm gonna look for lines that have at uct dot ac dot za in them so again I'm gonna open it up I'm gonna open these go through each line in the file I'm gonna strip the white space out and <clears throat> if not UCT, if this, if this string is not in line, then I'm going to continue. So it's a way for me to skip all of the lines that don't have this string in it. So these lines do. Oops, that's, that one has it too. And then we're going to print it out. It will print out the ones that make it past here. Okay, so, but in is another way to do searching. I had starts with, etc. So one more thing that you might want to try is um, <clears throat> so we can count, right? And this is a pattern for uh, prompting for a file name. And so, so here you'll, you'll get tired of sort of changing your code every time you want to open a different file because you probably want to run the program with inbox once and inbox short because you just, just so you can test it with different things of data. So here's just another pattern. We add this line to say raw input enter the file name and there you go we'll type in the file name and then the thing that we open is whatever we entered as the file name and then the rest of it is pretty much yada yada so here I'm uh, it's reading the whole file if the line starts with subject count equals count plus one and then there were 1797 subjects lines in inbox.txt there were 27 subject lines in inbox short.txt okay so that's prompting for the file names now, 
open the open statement fails if the file name doesn't exist. So you might want to add a try and accept around that. If you want to, if you're just writing code for yourself and you assume that today is okay, then you don't have to write try accept. But if you want to catch it and catch a bad file name, then you take the open which is, and turn it into these four lines. So this is the code that we think might blow up. And it's going to blow up. We know it's going to blow up. If they enter a bad file name like Nana Boo Boo, right, this is going to blow up. So what do we do? We use try and accept. We put try around that. We're going to take out some insurance on that particular line. And then if it fails, we're going to print this message and then say exit to get out. So if you get a good file, if you get a good file, it works, skips the accept, then runs the thing, prints out the count. That's what's happening here. If, on the other hand, you get a bad file, it comes here, open blows up, runs the accept, prints this out, and then quits. So that's how this one works with a bad file. And now we know traceback, right? So, we are, it's kind of a short lecture. We're done with chapter 7. We open a file, we read the file, we take out white space at the end with R strip. we have, use string functions. So this is kind of putting it all together. And it's kind of short little programs now. And so it's not, and uh, you know, starting now, we're going to start putting these things together and start actually doing work. Because now we have, from the first few chapters, we have basic capabilities of Python. Now we have some data to work with. Now going forward, we're going to do increasingly sophisticated things with that data. So I can't wait to see you in the next lecture. Hello, and welcome to Chapter 8, Python Lists. So now we're sort of going to start taking care of business. We are doing to make lists and dictionaries and tuples and really start manipulating this data and doing real data analysis, starting the laying the ground for work for real data analysis. As always, these lectures, audio, video, slides, and even book are copyright Creative Commons attribution. So lists, dictionaries, and tuples, the next real three big topics we're going to talk about are collections. And uh, we've been doing lists already, right? Um, we've been doing uh, lists when we were doing for loops. Uh, a list in Python is something that has a square braces. This is a constant list. Now, when I first talked to you about variables, I sort of oversimplified things. I said if you put like x equals 2 and then put x equals 4, the 2 and the 4 override each other. A collection is where you can put a bunch of things in the same variable. Now, I have to find, have a way to find those things. Um, but it, it, it allows us to put multiple things in more it, more things more than one thing in a variable. And so here we have friends that has three strings, Joseph, Glenn, and Sally, and we have carry on that has socks, shirt, and perfume. So that's the basic idea. So what's not a collection? Well, simple variables. Simple variables are not collections. Just like this example, I say x equals two, x equals four, and print x, and the four is in there and the two is somehow gone. It was there for a moment, and then it's gone. And so that's a normal variable. They're not collections. You can't put more than one thing in it. But when you put more than one thing in it, then you have to have a way to find the things that are in there. We'll, we'll get to that. So we've been using list constants for the last couple of chapters just because we have to use list constants. You know, So we used uh, in the for loop chapter, we did lists of numbers. We have done lists of strings. That's strings, red, yellow, and blue. And you don't have to necessarily, um, you don't necessarily have to have things all of the same type. This is a three item list that has a string red, a the number integer 24, and 98.6, which is a floating point number. And here's an interesting thing, just as a side note. This shows that floating point numbers are not always perfectly represented inside of the computer. It's sort of an artifact of how they work. And this is an example of 98.6 is really 98.9999. So that don't, when you see something like that, don't freak out. Floating point numbers are the ones that show this behavior. So interestingly, you can always, although we won't put a lot of energy into this, you can also have an element 
of a list be a list itself. So this is a outer list that's got three elements, one, seven, and then a list that's five and six. So if you look at the length of this, there is three things in it. Not four, three, because the outer list has one, two, three things in it. And an empty list is bracket, bracket. Okay? Like I said, we have been going through lists all along. We have iteration variables, 4i in. This is a list. We've been using it all along. Similarly, we've been using lists in indefinite loops are a great way to go through lists for friend in friends. There we have goes through three times, out come three lines with the variable friend advancing through the three successive items in the list, and away we go. So again, lists are not completely foreign to us. Now, just like in a string, we can use the index operator, the square bracket operator, and we can look up items in the list. Sub 1, friends sub 1. Not surprisingly, using the European elevator rule, the first item in a list is sub 0. The second item is sub 1, and the third one is sub 2. So here when I print friend sub 1, I get Glenn, which is the second element, just like strings. So once you kind of know it for strings, lists and the rest of these things make a lot more sense. Just remember that we're in Europe, and things start with 0. Some things in these data items that we work with are not mutable. So for example, strings. When we ask for a lowercase version of a string, we're given a copy of that string. And that's because strings are not mutable. And we can see this by doing something like saying fruit sub zero equals lowercase b. Now you'd think that that would just change this to be lowercase b, but it doesn't. Okay? It says string object does not support item assignment, which means that you're not allowed to reassign. You can make a new string and put different things in that new string, but once the strings are made, they're not changeable. And that's why when we call fruit.lower, we get a copy of it in lowercase. And so x is a copy of the original string, but the original string, once we assign it into fruit, is unchanged. Can't be changed. This, on the other hand, can be changed, and we can change them in the middle. This is one of the things we like about them. So here we have a list, 2, 14, 26, 41, and 63. Then we say lotto sub 2. Of course, that is going to be the third item. Lotto sub 2 is equal to 28. Then we print it, and we see the new number there. So all this is saying is that we can change them, right? Strings, no, and lists, yes. You can change lists, but you can't change strings. So the len function, we've used it for several things. We can say, you know, use, len is used for, for strings and it's used for lists as well. So the same function knows that when its parameter is a string, and when its parameter is a string, it gives us the number of characters in the string, and when it is a list, it gives us the number of elements in the list. And just because one of them is a string, it's still one element from the point of view of this list. So it has one, two, three, four, four items in the list, okay? So, the range function is a special function. It's probably about time to talk about the range function. The range function is a function that generates a list, that produces a list and give it back, gives it back to us. And so you give the range function a parameter, how many items you want, and the range function creates and gives us back a list that is four numbers starting at zero, which is zero up to but not including three. Sound familiar? Yeah, zero up to but not, I mean, zero up to but not including four. And, and so the same thing is true here. So we can combine the len and the range to say, you know, to, to say, okay, well, len friends, that's three items. And range len friends is zero, one, two. And it also corresponds exactly to these items. So we can actually use this to construct loops to go through a list. We already have a basic for loop, right? We basically have a for loop that is our the the set the for each friend in friends and out comes Happy New Year Glenn and Joseph. If we also want to know where what position we're at as the loop progresses, we can rewrite the exact same loop a different way. 
and make i be our iteration variable and say i in range len friends that turns this into 0 1 2 and then i goes 0 1 2 and then we can in the loop look up the particular friend that is the particular one we're interested in using the index operator friends sub i and then print happy new year so these two loops these two loops are equivalent these oop not that one this loop and this loop this loop is preferred unless you happen to need this value i which tells you where you're at in case maybe you're going to change something you're going to look through something and then change it so but but for what i've written here they're exactly equivalent prefer the simpler one unless you need the more complex one they both produce the same kind of output we can concatenate lists much like we concatenate strings with a plus And you can think of the Python operators looking to its right and to its left and saying, oh, those are both lists. I know what to do with lists. I'm going to put those together. And so that produces a two, three long list become a six long list with the first one followed by the second one concatenated. It didn't hurt the original. A, C is a new list, basically. We can also slice lists feels a lot like strings, right? Everything's kind of like strings. For loops like strings, concatenation like strings, and now slicing like strings. And it is exactly the same. So one up to but not including. Just remember, up to but not including. The second parameter is up to but not including. So that starts at the sub one, which is the second one, up to but not including three, the third one. So this is one, two, and three. So that's 41 comma 2. Starting at the first one up to but not including the third one. We can similarly eliminate the first one. So that's up to but not including the fourth one. Zzz, starting at 0, 1, 2, 3, but not including 4. So that's this one. If we go 3 to the end, and again remember that they're starting at 0, so 3 to the end is 0, 1, 2, 3 to the end. The number 3 doesn't matter. So that's 3, 74, 15. And the whole thing. That's the whole thing. So these two things are the same. So slicing works like strings. Starting and up to but not including is the second parameter. There are some methods, and you can read about these online uh, in the Python documentation. We can use the built-in function. It doesn't have a lot of use in... Uh, sort of how we run when we're running programs but it's kind of useful I like it when I'm typing interactively like what can this thing do so I make a list list is a unique type and I say with dir I say what can we do with it well we can append we can count extend index insert pop remove reverse and sort and then you can sort of read up on all these things um, I'll show you just a couple um, we can build a list with the append so this syntax here stuff equals list that's called a constructor, which says, give me an empty list. You could also say bracket, bracket for an empty list. Whatever, you got to make an empty list. And then you call the append. Remember that lists are mutable, so it's okay to change it. So we're saying, okay, we started with an empty list. Now append to the end of that, the word book, and then append to that, 99. Wait a sec, that's a mistake. That's a mistake. So I have to fix this mistake. So watch me fix the mistake. Poof. Now my thing is magically fixed. Isn't that amazing? I have magic powers when it comes to slide fixing. I just snap my uh, fingers and the slides are fixed. So here we go. We append a 99 and we print it out and it's got book and 99, emphasizing the fact that they don't have to be the exact same kind of thing in a list. Then later we append cookie and then it's book 99 cookie. Okay, so this append, we won't do it in line like this so often. We'll tend to do it in a loop as we're building up a list. But that's a way you start with an empty list and then ch -ch 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 programmatically grow it. We can ask, much like we do in a string, we can ask if an item is in a list. So here's a list called sum with these numbers in it. It's got five numbers in it. Is nine in sum? True. Yes, it is. Is 15 in sum? False. 
is 20 not in, that's a, le a legal syntax, that is legal syntax. Is 20 not in some? Yes, it's not there. Okay, they don't modify the list. Don't modify the list, they're just asking questions. These are logical operations, often used in if statements or while, some kind of a logic that you might be building. Okay, so uh, lists have order. So when we were appending them, the first thing went in first, the second thing went in second, et cetera, et cetera. And we can also tell the list to sort itself. So one of the things that we can do with a list, now we're starting to see some power here, is say, sort yourself. This is a list of strings. It can sort numbers, it can sort lots of things. Friends.sort, that says, hey there, dear friends, sort yourself. This makes a change. It alters the list and puts it in this case in alphabetical order, Glenn, Joseph, and Sally. It is muted, it was, it's, it's been modified, and so friend sub one is now Joseph because that's the second one, okay? So the sort method says sort yourself. Now, sort yourself. And it sorts and then it stays sorted. So <clears throat> you're gonna be kind of ticked about this particular side because there's a whole bunch of built-in functions that help with lists and um, there's max, there's min, there's len, various things. And so we could, all those loops that I told you how to do, I was just showing you that stuff because I thought it was important. Um, this is the simplest way to go through and find the largest, smallest, and uh, sum, etc. So here's a list of numbers. We can say how many are there, that's the count. We can say what's the largest, it's 74. What's the smallest, that'd be three. What is the sum of the running total of them all? 154. If you remember from a few lectures ago, these are the same numbers. And what is the average? Which is sum of them over the length of them. Okay? So this makes a lot more sense. And if you had a list of numbers like this, you would simply say, what's the max? You wouldn't write a max loop. I just did that to kind of demonstrate how loops work. <clears throat> demonstrate how loops work. So here is a way that you can sort of change those kind of programs that we wrote. So there's two ways to write a summing program. Let's just say instead of the data being in a list, we're going to write a while loop that's going to read a set of numbers until we say done, and then compute the average of those numbers. Okay, so let's say this is our problem. Read a list of numbers, wait till the word done comes in, and then average them. So here's a little program that does that. We create total equals zero, count equals zero, make a infinite loop with while true, and then we ask to enter a number. We get a string back from this. Remember, raw input always gives us strings back. And then if it's done, we're gonna break. This is the version of the if that does not require an indent. We just put the break up there. And so that gets us out of the loop when the time is right. So when the time is right over here. And then we convert the value to float. We use float to convert the input to a floating point number. And then we do our accumulation pattern. Total equals total plus value, count equals count plus one. So this is gonna run, these numbers are gonna go up and up and up and up, and then we're gonna break out of it, calculate the average, and then print the average. Because that's a floating point number, so now the average is a floating point number. So that's one way to do it, right? That would be one way to write a program that does an average, is keep a running average as you're reading the numbers. But there's another way to do it that would exact, work exactly the same way. And this is when you can start using lists. So, come in, you say I'm gonna make a list of numbers, just a mnemonic name, numList, is an empty list. Then I create another infinite loop that's gonna read for enter a number, and if it's done break, that get, kinda gets us out of it. Convert the value to an imp, uh, convert the, the value to a float, the input value to a float, and then append it to the list. So now the list is going to grow. Each time we read a number, the list is going to grow. However many times we add the numbers, how many things are going to be in the list. So in this case, when we're at this point and we type done, there will be three numbers in the list because we will have run append three times. We'll have appended three, nine, and five. We'll have them sitting in a list and we will have exited the loop. So now you say, oh, add up all the numbers in that list and then divide it by the length of the list and print the average. So these two programs are basically equivalent. 
The only time that they might not be equivalent was if there was 10 million numbers, this would use up 40 megabytes of your memory, which is actually not a lot of memory on some computers, but if memory mattered, there, this does store all those numbers. This one actually just runs the calculation. So if there's a really large number of, of numbers, this would make a difference because the list is growing and keeping them all, summing them all at the end. This is actually storing very little data. But for reasonably sized numbers, like thousands or even hundreds of thousands of numbers, these two approaches are kind of equivalent. And then sometimes you actually want to accumulate something a little more complex than this. You want to sort them or look for the maximum and look for something else. Who knows what. But the notion of make a list and then append something to the list each time through the iteration and then do something with a list at the end is a rather powerful pattern. So this is also a pa powerful pattern. This is the accumulator pattern where we just have the variables accumulating in the loop. This one is one where we accumulate the data in the loop and then do the computations all at the end. De certain situations will make use of these different techniques. Okay, so connecting strings and lists. So there's a method, a capability of strings that is really powerful when it comes to tearing data apart. It's called the split. So here is a string with three words and has blanks in between here. And abc.split says parse this string, look for the blanks, break the string into pieces and give me back a list with one item for each of the words in the list as defined by the spaces. Okay, so it takes, breaks it into three pieces and gives us that back in a list. It's very powerful. Okay, so we're going to split it and we get it back a list. There are three words and the first word, stuff sub zero, is with. So there's a lot of parsing going on here. We could do this with for loops and a lot of other things. There would be a lot of work in this split. Given that this is a really common task, it's really great that this has been put into Python for us. Okay? So split breaks a string into parts and produce a list of strings. We think of these as words. We can access a particular word or we can loop through all the words. So here we have stuff again. And now we have a, a for loop for each of the, that's going to go through each of the three words and then it's going to run three times. Now chances are good we're going to do something different other than just print them out. But you see how that you quickly can take a split followed by a four and then write a loop that's going to go through each of the words without working too hard to find the spaces. You let Python do all the hard work of finding the spaces. Okay? So let's take a look at a couple of samples. Um, just a couple things to teach you a little more about split. Uh, split looks at many spaces as equal to one space. So if you split a lot blank, 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 of spaces, it still just throws away all those spaces and gives us four words. One, two, three, four, and throws away all the spaces because it assumes that's what we want done. So that's nice. You can also have split. You can also have split split on some other character. Sometimes you'll be getting data and they'll have used a semicolon or a comma or a colon or a tab character. Who knows what they've used and your job is to dig that data out. So you can split based on a different character. Here, if we're splitting normally with, with this is a normal split, it's not going to see the semicolons. It's looking for a space and so all we get back is one item in the string with the semicolons. But if we switch and we pass semicolon as a parameter to, in as a parameter to split, then it will know to split it based on semicolons and gives us first, second, and third back. Okay, and then it gives us three words. So you can split either on spaces or you can split on a character other than a space. Okay, <clears throat> so let's take a look at how we might turn this into some of our common assignments that we have in this chapter where we're going to read some of the mailbox data. Okay. So here we go with a little program. First three lines, we write these a lot. Open the file, write a for loop to loop through each line in the file. 
Then we're going to strip off the white space at the end of the line. One, two, three. Do those all the time. And we're looking for lines, if you look at the whole file, we're looking at lines that start with from followed by a space. So if the line does not start with from followed by a space, that's a space right there, continue. So that's a way to skip all the lines that don't look like this. There are thousands of lines in this file and just a few that look like this. Okay, And so we're going to look and we're going to try to find what day of the week this thing happened on. So, so we're throwing away all the lines with this little bit of code. Then what we do is we take the line, which is all of this text, and then we split it. And we know that the day of the week is word sub 2. So this is word sub 0, this is word sub 1, and this is word sub 2. So this is word sub 0, sub 1, and sub 2. And so all we have to do is print out the sub 2 and we get, we throw away all the lines except the from lines, we split them and take the, sec, uh, the, the, the third word or word sub 2 and we can quickly create something that's extracting the day of the week out of these. Okay, so it's, it's, I mean, it's quick because split does the tricky work. If you go back to the strings chapter, you saw that we did a lot of work to get this to happen. So here's even another tricky pattern. So let's say we want to do what we did at the end of chapter 6, the string chapter. Let's say we wanted to get back this little bit of data. Okay, so we can look at this and say, okay, let's split this, and this will be 0, 1, and 2, and 3, and 4, 5, and 6. We're splitting it based on spaces. Then the email address is <coughs> words sub 1, right? So that email address is this little bit of stuff because it's in between spaces, right? So that's what we pull out. The email address is word sub 1. We've got that. So that's sitting in this email address variable. Then we really, all we want, we don't really want the whole thing, we just want the part after the at sign. And we could do a look up for the oh, we could do a look up of the at sign. But you can also then do a second come back, come back. Zoop, there we come. You can also do a second split. Okay? So we're taking this variable here, email, which is merely this little part right here and we are splitting it again, except this time we're splitting it based on an at sign, which means it's going to bust it right here and find us two pieces. So pieces now is a list where the sub zero item is the person's name and the sub one item is the host that their mail address is held from. Okay, And so then all we need to know is pieces sub one and pieces sub one is this guy right here. So that's pieces sub 1 and so we pulled it out. So if you go back to how we did it before we were doing searching and we were searching some more and then we we're taking slices this is a little more elegant okay because really we split it and then we split it and we knew what piece we were looking at. So this is what I call the double split pattern where you split a string into a list then you take a thing out and then you split it again depending on what data you're looking for. This is just a technique. It's not the only technique. Okay, so that's lists. We talked about the concept of a collection where lists have multiple things in it, indefinite loops. Again, we've seen these things. We're kind of, it looks a lot like strings, except the elements are more powerful and they're more mutable. We still use the bracket operator and we redid the max, min, and sum except we did it in like one line rather than a whole loop. And, uh, and something we're going to play with a lot is using split to parse strings, the single split, and then the double split is a natural extension of the single split. So see you in the next lecture. Looking forward to talking about dictionaries. Hello again, and welcome to Chapter 9, uh, Python Dictionaries. As always, this lecture is copyright Creative Commons attribution. That means the audio, the video, the slides, and even my scribbles, you can use in any way you like, as long as you attribute them. Okay, so this is the second chapter where we're talking about collections. And the collections are kind of like a piece of luggage in that you can put multiple things in them. Um, 
variables that we've talked about sort of starting in chapter two and chapter three were simple variables, a scalar. They're just kind of one thing and as soon as you like put another thing in there, it overwrites the first thing. And so if you look at the code, you know, x equals two and x equals four, the question is, you know, where did the two go? Right, the two was there, x was there, there was a two in there, and then we cross it out and put a four in there. This is sort of the basic operation of the assignment statement. It's a replacement. But a dictionary allows us to put more than one thing, not using this syntax, but it allows us to have a variable that's really an aggregate of many values. And the difference between a list and a dictionary is how the values are structured within that single variable. The list is a linear collection indexed by integers 0, 1, 2, 3. If there's five of them, it's 0 through 4 very much like a Pringles can here where they're just stacked nicely on top of each other everything's kind of organized and we talked about it in the last in the last lecture this this lecture we're talking about dictionaries dictionaries very powerful it's and its power comes from a different way of organizing itself internally it's a bag of values like a just a sort of just stuffs in it it's not in any order big stuff little stuff things have labels you can also think of it like a purse with just things in it. It's like it's not like stacked. It's just stuff moves around as you're going, and that's that's a very good model for dictionaries. And so dictionaries have to have a label because the stuff is not in order. There's no such thing as the third thing. There is the thing with the label perfume. There's the thing with the label candy. There's the thing with the label money. And so there's the value, the thing, the money, and then there's always also the label. We also call these key value. The key is the label, and the value is whatever. And so these pink things are all labels for various things that you can put in the purse. So you could say to your, to your purse, hey, purse, give me my tissues. Hey, purse, give me my money. And it, it's in there somewhere, and the purse sort of gives you back the tissues or the money. And it's Python's most powerful data collection is the dictionaries and it's uh, when you get used to wielding them you'll see like whoa I can do so much with these things and at the beginning you're just sort of learning sort of how to use them without hurting yourself um, but they're very powerful it's it's like a database it's uh, it allows you to store very arbitrary data organized in however you feel like organizing it in a way that advances the cause of the program that you're writing and we're still kind of at the very beginning but as you learn more these will become a very powerful tool for you. Uh, they Dictionaries have different names in different languages. Um, Perl or PHP would call them associative arrays. Uh, Java would call them a property map or a hash map. And uh, C Sharp might call them a property bag or an attribute bag. And so they're, they're just the same concept. It's keys and values is the concept that's across all these languages, just a very powerful and if you look at the Wikipedia entry that I have here, you can see that it's just it's a concept that we give different names in different languages. Same concept, different names. So like I said, the difference between a list and a dictionary, they both can store multiple values. The question is how we label them, how we store them, and how we retrieve them. So here's an example use of a dictionary. I'm going to make a thing called purse, and I'm going to store in purse, this is an assignment statement, purse sub money. So this isn't like sub zero, this is sub money. So I'm actually using a string as the place. And so I'm gonna say stick 12 in my purse and stick a post-it note that says that's my money. Candy is three, tissues is 75. And if I look at that, it's not just the numbers 12, three and 75 as it would be in a list. It is the connection between money and 12, tissues is 75, candy is three. And in the key value, that's the key and that's the value. So candy is the key and three is the value. Now, I can look things up by their name. Print purse sub candy. Well, it goes finds it, asking, hey, purse, give me back candy. And it goes and finds the value, which is three. And so out comes a three. We can also put it on the right-hand side of an assignment statement. So purse sub candy says, give me the old version of candy and then add two to it, which gives me five, and then store it back in that purse under the label candy. So we see candy changing to five. And so 
this is a place. And you could do this with a list, except these would be numbers. You could say per sub 2 is equal to per sub 2 plus 2, or whatever. But in dictionaries, there are labels. Now, they're not strings. Strings is a very common label in dictionaries, but it's not always strings. You can use other things. In this chapter, we'll pretty much focus on strings. You could even use numbers, and then you would get a little confused. But you can. So here's sort of a picture of how this works. So if we take a look at this line, purse sub money equals 12, it's like we are putting a key value connection. Money is the label for 12. And then we sort of move that in. And it's up to the purse to decide where things live. If we look at the next line, we're going to put the value in with a 3 in with a label candy. And we're going to put the value 75 in with a label of tissues. And when we say, hey, purse, print yourself out, it just goes and pulls these things back out and hands them to us. And what it's really, it's giving us both the label and the value. And it's necessary to do that because it's just like 12, 75, and 3. What exactly is that? And so this syntax with the curly braces is what happens when you print a dictionary out. The same thing happens when we're sort of printing purse sub candy, right? Purse sub candy, it's like, dear purse, go and find the candy thing. Look at that one, look at that one. Oh, yep, yep, this is candy. But the, what we're looking for is the value, and so that's why 3 is coming out here. So go look up under candy and tell me what's stored under candy. These can be actually more complex things. I'm just keeping it simple for this lecture. And then when we say purse sub candy equals purse sub candy plus 2, well, it pulls the 3 out, looking at the label candy, then adds 3 plus 2 and makes 5, and then it assigns it back in. And then that says, oh, go, go place this number 5 in the purse with the label of candy, which then replaces the 3 with a 5. Okay. And if we print it out, we see that the new variable or the new candy entry is now 5. Okay. So if we just sort of put these things side by side, we create them sort of both the same way. We make an empty list and an empty dictionary. We call the append method because we're sort of just putting these things in order. You've got to put the first one in first. So it's not telling you where. You kind of know that this will be the first one because you're starting with an empty one and this will be the second one. We put in the values 21 and 183. And then we print it out and it's like, okay, you gave me the values 21 and 183. I will maintain the order for you. There's no keys other than their position. Their position is the key as it were. If I want to change the first one to 23, well, I say list sub zero, which is this, and then change that to 23. So this is sort of used as a lookup to find something. It can be used on either the right-hand side or the left-hand side of an assignment state. Comparing that to dictionaries, I'm going to put a 21 in there, and I'm going to put it with the label age. Then I'm going to put 182, put that in with the label course. So, so we don't have to like make an entry. The fact that the entry doesn't exist, it creates the age entry and sticks 21 into it. Creates the course entry, sticks 182 into it. We print it out and says, oh, course is 182 and age is 21. This emphasizes that order is not preserved in dictionaries. I won't go into like great detail as to why that is. It turns out that that's a compromise that makes them fast using a technique called hashing. It's how it actually works internally. Go Wikipedia hashing and take a look. But the thing that matters to us as programmers primarily is that lists maintain order and dictionaries do not maintain order. They, they, dictionaries give us power that we don't have in lists. I mean, they're very complementary. Now, there's not this one that's better than the other. They're very complementary. Different kinds of data is either better represented as a list or as a dictionary, depending on the problem you're trying to solve. And in a moment, we'll, we'll be writing programs that are using both. So if we come down here and I say, OK, stick 23 into assignment statement, into DD sub, DDD sub age, well, that will change this 21 to 23. So when we print it out. So you can. This part where you look something up and change the value, you can do either way. It's just how you do it here is a little bit different. Okay. So let's look through this code again. And so I like I like to use the word key and value. Key is the way we look the thing up. And in list, keys are numbers starting at zero and with no gaps. In dictionaries, keys are whatever we want them to be. In this case, I'm using strings. 
and then the value is the number we're storing in it. So we create this kind of a list with that kind, those kinds of statements. This statement creates this kind of a thing. Now, if we if we think of this assignment statement as moving data into a new into a place, a new item of data into a place, um, it's looking at this thing right here, right? It's like that's where I want to move it, and so it hunts and says, "Look, look the key up, and that's the one that I'm going to change." And then once it knows which it's going to change, then it's going to take the 23 and it's going to put the 23 into that location. And so that's how this changes from that to that. Similarly, when we get down to here, we're going to stick 23 somewhere. And this is this expression, this lookup expression, the index expression, dd sub age, is where we're going to put it. So we're looking here. Where is that thing? Well, that thing is this entry in the dictionary. And so now when we're going to store the 23, we know where the 23 is going to go. It's going to overwrite the 21, and so the 21 is going to change to 23. Okay, so so they're they're kind of similar. There there are things that work similar in them, and then there are things that work differently in them. We can make literals, constants with uh, curly braces, and they look just like the print. That's one nice thing about Python. When you print something out, it's showing you how you can make a literal. And basically, you just open with a curly brace and say Chuck colon one, Fred forty two, Jan one hundred, and we're making connections, key value pair, key value pair. We print it out, and no order. They don't maintain order. Now they might come out in the same order, but that's just lucky, right? All the ones I've shown you so far don't come out in the same order, which is good to demonstrate it. If it one time came out in the same order, that wouldn't be broken. It's not like it doesn't want to come out in the same order. It's just you don't. It's not internally stored, and you add an element, and it may reorder them. You can do an empty dictionary with just a curly brace, curly brace. So, I'm going to give you another example, and I'm going to show you a series of names, and I want you to figure out what the most common name is, and how many times each name appears. Now these are real people. They actually work on the Sakai project. Steven, uh, Jen, and, uh, and Chen, and me. So these are people that are in, actually in the data that we use in this course. Okay, and so I think I'll show you about uh, 15 names. And you're to come up with a way, I'm gonna show them to you one at a time, you need to come up with a way to keep track of these. Okay, so I'll just, with no further ado, I will show you the names. Okay, so that's all the names. Did you get it? You might have to go back and do it again. How did you solve the problem? What kind of a data structure did you build to solve the problem? Or did you just say, wow, that's painful. I think I will learn Python instead than solving that problem. Okay, so pause the, pause the video if you want and write down or go back Write down what you think the number of the most common name is and how many times. Okay, now I'll show you. So, here is the whole list. It's all of them. And now that we see all of them, we use our amazing human mind and we scan around and look at purpleness and, and all that stuff. And then we go like, oh, this is so much easier problem when I'm looking at the whole thing. Uh, and I think that the most common person is Jen. And I think we see Jen. I think we see Jen five times. And I think C Seb is one, two, three, and Chen Wen is one, two, and Stephen Marquardt is one, two, three. So the question is, what is an effective data structure if you're going to see a million of these? What kind of data structure would you have to produce? Because you can't keep it in your head. Even 
even this number of people, you can't, even this no, amount of data, no way you can keep it in your head. You have to come up with some kind of a variable, as it were, just like largest so far was a variable, some kind of variable that gets you to the point where you understand what's going on. And so this is the most common technique to solve this problem, where you keep a running total of each of the names. And if you see a new name, you add them to the list. So CSEB, and then you give them a 1. And then you see Zhen, and you give her a 1. And then you see Chen, and you give her a 1. And then you see CSEB again, and you give him a 2. And you see and a 2, and a 2, and a 1, right? <clears throat> and so then when you're all done, you have the mapping right, of these things. And you go, oh, OK, let me look through here and find the largest one. That's the largest one. And so that must be the person who is the most. So you need a scratch area, a data structure, or a piece of paper, as it were. And so that's what exactly what dictionaries are really good at. You can think of this as like a histogram. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a bunch of counters, but counters that are indexed by a string. So we use a lot of this. And so this is a pattern of many counters with a dictionary, simultaneous counters. We're counting a bunch of that. We're looking at a series of things, and we're going to simultaneously keep track of a large number of counters rather than just one counter. How many names did you see total? Whatever, 12. But how many of each name did you see is a bunch of counters. So it's a bunch of simultaneous counters. So a dictionary is, is great for this. A dictionary is great for this. We, when we see somebody for the first time, we can add an entry to the dictionary, which is kind of like going, oh, csev1, and then Chen Wen 1. Now these don't exist yet. Right, so we got csev1 and Chen Wen 1. So that creates an entry and sticks a 1 in it. And then mapping between the key csev and the value 1, the key Chen Wen and the value 1. And then we say, hey, what's in there? Oh, we got a csev is 1 and Chen Wen is 1. And then we see Chen Wen second time. So we'd add another number right there. So this old number is 1. We add 1 to it and we get 2. And then we stick that back in. And then we do the calculation. We do a dump and say, oh, there's. 2 in Chen Wen and 1 in CSIP. Okay? So this is a great data structure for these simultaneous counters. Like, what's the most common word? Who had the most commits? Da 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 da. Now, everything we do, we have to figure out like when you're going to get in trouble with Python. When Python's going to give you the old thumbs down and say, oh, you went too far. So one thing Python does not like is if you reference a key before it exists. We'll, we'll look at in a second how to work around this. But if you simply create a dictionary and say, oh, print out what's under CSEV, it gives you a traceback. It's like, I'm going to inform you that that's not there. And it says key error CSEV. Now, the thing that allows us to solve this is the in operator. We've used the in operator to see if a substring was in a string or if a number was in a list. So, so this in operator says, in operator says, hey, ask a question. Is the string csev a current key in the dictionary ccc? Is the string csev a current key in the dictionary ccc? And it says false. So now we have it something that doesn't give a trace back that can tell us whether or not the key is there. So if you remember the algorithm, the first time you see it, you set them to 1. And every other time, you add 1 to them. So this is how we do that in Python. So here's how we implement that program that I just gave you in Python. So here's our names. It's shorter, so my slide works better. Here's variable, our iteration variable. It's going to you know, go through all five of these one at a time. And within the body of the loop, we have an if statement. If the name is not currently in the counts dictionary, counts is the name of my dictionary. If the name is not currently in the counts dictionary, I say count subname equals 1. Else, that must mean it's already there, which means it's OK to retrieve it. Counts subname plus 1. We're going to add 1 to it and stick it back in. OK? And so when this finishes, it's going to add entries and then add 1 to entries that already exist and not trace back at all. And when we print it out, we're going to see the counts. And literally, this could have gone a million times, and it would just be fine, and it would just keep expanding. OK? So this pattern of checking to see if a key is in a dictionary, setting it to some number, or <clears throat> adding one to it is a really, really common pattern. 
it's so common, as a matter of fact, that there is a special thing built into dictionaries that does this for us. Okay, And there is this method called get. And so counts is the name of a dictionary. Get is a built-in capability of dictionaries. And it takes two parameters. The first parameter is a key name, like a string like csev or chenwen or markward. Um, and then the second parameter is a value to give back if this doesn't exist. It's a default value if the key does not exist and there's no traceback. So this way you can encapsulate in effect an if then else. If the name parameter is in the counts, print the thing out, otherwise print zero. So this expression will either get the number if it exists or it will give me back a zero if it doesn't exist. So this is really valuable, right? This is really valuable. That's a really bad smiley face. So this is really valuable because it, once, once we understand the idiom, it really takes four lines of code and turns it into one line of code. Because we're going to be doing this if then else all the time. Now, we, and so we can reconstruct that loop a lot easier and a lot more cleanly using this idiom, right? It's something that looks kind of complex, but you'll get used to it really fast, okay? So we have everything here is the same. We create an empty dictionary. We have five names to go through. We're going to write a for loop, and it's going to go through each of those. And then we're going to say count sub name equals counts dot get the value stored at name. And if you don't find it, give me back a zero. And then whatever comes back, either the old value or the zero, add one to that, and then take that sum and stick it in counts name. Okay. So this is either going to create or it's going to update. If there is no entry, it's going to create it and set it to 1. If there is an entry, it's going to add 1 to the current entry. Okay. So this is, this line is kind of an idiom. Read about it in the book, figure it out, get used to the notion of what this is doing. Understand what that is doing, okay? Because I'm going to start using it as if you understand it. So the next problem is a problem of finding the most common word. So finding the most common, the top five, is often a, a, a trigger that says use dictionaries. Because if you're going to have to count things up, you're going to, you, know, you, have to, you don't know what the most common thing is at the beginning. You first, first, you have to count everything up. And dictionaries are a great way to count. So here's a little problem. And I would like you to read this text and find me the most common word in the text and tell me what the most common word is and how many times it occurs. Ready? I'm going to give you a thousandth of a second, just like I would give a computer. I would expect it to be able to do this in a thousandth of a second. There you go. Okay, I gave you five seconds. Time's up. Did you get it? Or did you say to yourself, you know what? I hate that. It's no good. I think I'll write a Python program instead. And he'll probably show me a Python program if I wait long enough. So here's a slightly easier problem from the first lecture. Ready? It's the same problem. Find the most common word and how many times the word occurs. Get it? I believe the answer is, and I could look really dumb here. Oops. The answer is the, and I think it's seven times. So that's the right answer. Okay? Again, things humans are not so good at. So here's a piece of code that's starting to combine some of the things we've been doing in the past few chapters all together. We are going to read a line of text, split it into words, count the occurrence how many times each word occurs, and then print out a map. So 
So here's what we're going to do. We're going to say, okay, start a dictionary, an empty dictionary. Read a line of input. Then split it. Remember, the split takes a string and produces a list. So words is a list, line is a string, and then we'll print that out. Then we're going to write a for loop that's going to go through each of the words and then create, use this idiom, count sub word equals counts dot get word comma zero plus one. So this is going to do exactly what we talked about in the previous uh, couple slides back. Um, either create the entries or add to those entries. Okay, and then we're going to print them out. So here's what that program does when it prints out. Now this is actually one long line. I'm just cutting it so you can see it. Here's this line we enter and the words the, there's seven of them. Then it takes this line and splits it into a list and there is the beginning and end of the list. The list maintains the order. So the list simply breaks all these words into separate words in a list of strings from one string to many strings. This, this is many strings. And so the and the spaces are gone and so here's this list. And then what we're going to do is we are going to run through the list and we're going to keep running totals of each of the words in the list. And then when we're done with the list, we're going to print out the contents of that dictionary and we can inspect it and go like, let's look for the biggest one. No, 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 no. It's, a, it's kind of like looking for the largest and like, oh, seven, that's the largest and the largest word is the, okay? So that's how the program runs. It reads a line, splits it into word, a list of words, and then accumulates a running total for each word, and then we hand inspect to see what the most common word is, okay? Oh, no, no, I don't want that song again. There we go. And so, uh, and so here we have the, in this kind of a smaller fashion, um, we make a dictionary, this entering a line of text is here. It's all one line. We do the split and then we print the words out. And so that split creates a list of strings from a single string based on where the blanks are at. Chop, 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 chop. And then here at counting, we're going to loop through each of the words one at a time and use this idiom count sub word equals counts dot get word comma zero plus one which is going to create and or update. And then we print the counts out and that comes out there. Okay. So again, this, this is the new thing we've done. Everything else here we've kind of seen before. Now we can also loop through dictionaries with for loops. The for loop, we've been put all kinds of things over here. We've put strings over here. We've put lists and numbers over here. We've put files over here, and basically what it really says is, you know, if this is a collection of things, run this little indented code once for each item in the collection, and key then becomes our iteration variable, and key is very mnemonic here. It doesn't know that they're keys, um, and so keys, the key here is that, hmm, there's, there's a bit, the, the important concept here is that dictionaries are key value pairs. And so this is only one variable. And so it actually decides that they've decided it goes through the keys, which is actually quite useful. So key is going to take on the successive values of the labels, not the successive values of the values stored at the labels. But it's really easy for us to retrieve the contents at that label, counts sub key. So we're going to use the key, Chuck, Fred, Jan, to look up the 142100. And so it prints out the key and then the value at it the key and the value at it, and the key and the value. And so <clears throat> we're able to sort of go through the dictionary and look at all the key value pairs, which is the common thing that you really want to do. Okay? Now there's some methods inside of dictionaries that allow us to convert dictionaries into lists of things. And so uh, if you simply take a dictionary, so here's a little dictionary with th uh, three items in it, um, and we can say list sub and then give a dictionary name right there. And then that converts it into a list, but it's just a list of the keys. We can also say jjj.keys, kind of do the same thing. Say give me a list consisting of the keys. And then jjj.values gives you a list of the values, 1, 42, and 100. Of course, they're not in the same order. 
Now, interestingly, as long as you don't modify the dictionary, the order of these two things corresponds. As long as in between here, you're not changing it. So the first Jan maps to 100, Chuck maps to 1, and Fred maps to 42. So the order, you can't predict the order they're going to come out, but these two things will come out in the same order, whatever that order happens to be. OK, and so there's one more thing. So we got the keys, we got the values, and we got a thing called items. Items also returns a list. It's a list, but it's a list of what Python calls tuples. That's what the next chapter is about. We'll talk more about tuples in the next chapter. A tuple is a key value pair. So this list has three things in it. One, two, three. The first one is Jan maps to 100. The second one is Chuck maps to 1. The third one is Fred maps to 42. So just kind of bear with me for a second. We'll hit this a little harder in the next chapter. But the place that this, the, the idiom where this works really beautifully is on a for loop. Now, for those of you who have programmed in other languages, this will be kind of weird. Because other languages have iterations, but they don't have two iteration variables. Python has two iteration variables. It can be used for many things, but one of the things that it's used for that's really quite nice is we can have two iteration variables. This JJ items returns pairs of things, and then AAA and BB are iteration variables that sort of move in, in synchronized, moved, are synchronized as they move through. So AAA takes on the value of the key, BBB takes on the value of the 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 value, and then the loop runs once. Then AAA is advanced to the next key, and BBB is advanced to the next value simultaneously, synchronized. Then they print that out. Then it advances to the next one, and the next one, and they print that out. So they are moving in a synchronized way. Now, again, the order Jan, Chuck, Fred is not the same, but the correspondence between Jan 100, Chuck 1, and Fred, that's going to that's gonna work. And so, basically, as these things go, they work their way through whatever order they're stored in the dictionary. So this is quite nice. Two iteration variables going through key value. Now, if I was making these names mnemonic, and they made more sense, I would call this the key variable, and that be the value variable. But for now, I'm just using kind of silly names to show you that key and value are not special. They're not Python reserved words in any way. They're just a good way to name these things, key value pairs. OK? OK, now we're going to circle all the way back to the beginning, all the way back to the first lecture. And I gave you this program. And I said, don't worry about it. We'll learn about it later. Well, now later. At this point, you should be able to understand every line of this program. This is the program that's going to count the most common word in a file. Okay, So let's walk through what it does. And hopefully by now, this will make a lot of sense. Okay, So we're going to start out. We're going to ask for a file name. We're going to open that file for read. Then, because we know it's not a very large file, we're going to read it all in one go. So handle.read says, read the whole file, new lines and all, blanks, new lines, whatever and put it in a variable called text. It's just mnemonic. Remember, I'm starting this one. I'm using mnemonic variable names. Then go through that whole string, which was the whole file. Go through and split it all. New lines don't hurt it. New lines are treated like blanks, and it understands all that. It throws the new lines away and the blanks away and splits it into a beautiful list of just words with no blanks. And the list of the words in that file ends up in the variable words. Words is a list, text is a string, words is a list. Then what I do is the pattern of accumulating counters in a dictionary. I make an empty empty dictionary. I have the word variable that goes through all the words. And then I just say count sub word equals counts dot get word comma zero plus one. That, like we just got done saying, it both creates and or increments the value in the dictionary as needed. So now at the end of the at the at this point in the program, we have a full dictionary with the word colon count. Okay? 
and there's many of them. You know, all the words, all the counts, not in any particular order. So now what we're going to do is we're going to write a largest loop, find the largest, which is another thing that we've done. So not only do I need to know what the largest count I've seen so far, I need to know what word that is. So I'm going to set the largest count we've seen so far to none, set the largest word we've seen so far to none, and then I'm going to use this two iteration variable pattern to say go through the key value pairs, word and count, in counts items. So it's going to just go through ch -ch -ch all of them. And then I'm going to ask if the largest number I've seen so far is none or the current count that I'm looking at is greater than the largest I've seen so far, keep them. Take the current word, stick it in biggest word so far. Take the current count, stick it in the biggest count so far. So this is going to run through all of the word count pairs, word count key value pairs. And then when it comes out, it's going to print out the word that's the most common and how many times. So if we feed in that clown text, it will run all this stuff and print out, oh, the is the most common word, and it appeared seven times. Or if I print the stuff that was two slides back, words.txt, from the actual textbook, then it says the word two is the most common, and it happened 16 times. So I could easily, you know, throw 10 million, 10 million words through this thing, and it would just be totally happy, right? And so this is not that complex of a problem, but it's using a whole bunch of idioms that we've been using. The splitting of words, the accumulation of multiple counters in a dictionary, and so it sort of is the beginning of doing some kind of data analysis that's hard for humans to do and error prone for humans to do. And so this is, we're reviewing collections, we've introduced dictionaries, we've done the most common word pattern, talked about that, the lack of order, I've hit that a bunch of times, and uh, we've looked ahead at tuples, which is the next the third kind of collection that we're going to talk about, and they're actually in some ways a little simpler than dictionaries and simpler than lists. So, see you in the next lecture, uh, Chapter 10, Tuples. Hello, and welcome to Chapter 10 of Python for Informatics, the chapter on tuples. I'm Charles Severance. I'm your lecturer, and I'm the author of the textbook. As always, this material is copyright, Creative Commons attribution including the video lectures, the slides, uh, and the book. So, tuples are the third kind of collection that we've talked about. We've talked about lists, we've talked about dictionaries, and in the dictionary lecture we kind of alluded to tuples. Um, we don't have to talk too much about tuples, really shortening the lecture by telling you that they're a lot like lists. They're a non-changeable, they're a non-changeable list. And, uh, and, and the syntax of, of them is pretty much the same as a list, except that we use parentheses instead of square, square brackets, okay? And so, like, here is a, a three-tuple, tuple with three items in it, Glenn, Sally, and Joseph. They are numbered 0, 0, 1, and 2, so the second thing is 1. So x sub 2 is indeed Joseph. Um, you know, we can pass them in as sequences to things like max or min or sum. Um, and so the maximum of 192 is 9. Um, and we can loop through them. So here is why it's a tuple. It's uh, 192 and iteration is going to go through the three three values, right? And so it's going to print out 192. It runs the indented code once for each of the values inside the tuple. And so in this respect, they're very much like lists. But they're also different than lists in some uh, real valuable ways. Tuples are immutable. And so if you recall when we talked about lists, we compared them to strings because both lists and strings are a sequence of elements where the first one is 0, 1, 2, etc. But if we, if we look at a string, for example, and we have a three-character string, A, B, C, and we want to change the third character, Y sub 2, to D, it complains and says, no, you can't do that. But you can do it on a list. So if we have a list 987 and we say x sub 2 is 6, which is the third item, then the third item changes from 7 to 6. Okay, so this is mutable. This is not mutable. And tuples are also like not are not mutable. They are like strings. They're sort of 
like lists in terms of what they can store, but they're like strings in the fact that they can't be changed. So here we create a three tuple, a three item tuple, and we try to change the third thing from three to zero, and it says you can't do that, not mutable, okay? So, so it's, it's kind of like lists in the kind of data that we store them, store in them, and it's kind of like strings in that you can't change them once you create them. So this parenthesis, this constant, is the moment of creation. Once you put the things in, you can't fiddle around with it. There's a bunch of other things you can't do with tuples. You think, why am I even, why even use tuples? We'll get to that in a second. So here is a three tuple with the numbers three, two, one. You can't sort it because if you sorted it, that would change it. You can't add to it. You can't append the value five to the end of it because that would change it. And you can't reverse it. So none of these are allowed. Those are things you can do with lists, but you can't do with tuples. And you can read a documentation, but we can also use that built-in dir function, that really awesome dir function, where we make a list and we say, hey, Python, what will you let me do with lists? Well, you can append, count, extend, index, insert, sort, reverse, remove, pop. Lots of things. Now we make a tuple and say, hey, Python, what can we do with cup tuple? Well, you can do a count or an index, which means you can't do all these other things. So this is sort of a, a very much a reduction because everything you can do with tuples you can do with lists, but not everything you can do with lists you can do with tuples. So why? Why did I just waste all this time introducing tuples? All the R's have parentheses. What good are they? Well, it turns out that they're much more efficient because Python doesn't have to deal with the fact that we as programmers might change them. Python can make them quicker, they can use less memory, all kinds of things that save a lot of processing time in Python. So when would you use a tuple? Well, in particular, if you're going to create some list that you're never changing, we prefer to use tuples. And there's a lot of situations in programming where we create what we think of as a temporary variable. And if we're going to use, create it, use it, and throw it away without ever modifying it, we prefer tuples in those kinds of situations. Okay, so we prefer tuples when we create things that are just temporary. It's the, it's the fact that they're temporary variables. They're like temporary lists because they're efficient. They're quick to make and they're quick to get rid of and they're quick to go through. Now, another really neat thing about Python that I really like is the fact that you can do sort of two assignments in one by putting an a tuple on both the left and the right hand side of the assignment statement. So if we think about an assignment statement, I like to think of it as having a direction that says these things go there. Well, in Python, you can actually send two things at the same time. The four goes into the x and the fred goes into the y. This is a tuple. This is a tuple. You, you cannot have constants on this left-hand side. You can have variables or constants on the, or expressions on the right-hand side, but this must be two variables. Similarly, in this, the 99 goes into A and the 98 goes into B. Now, it turns out that you can syntactically eliminate the parentheses if you really want. And so this leads to a prettier syntax, I think. It's the exact same thing with or without parentheses, where we basically just say, hey, come back. A and B are assigned to the tuple 99, 98. And so you can eliminate the parentheses as long as it's very clear what's going on in the tuple. And so this, this might be a little disquieting when you first see it, but it's just a tuple with no parentheses, and the 99 goes to the A and the 98 goes to the B. Now, it turns out we already did this. I sort of blew by this in the previous lecture in dictionaries because it allows us to go through the dictionaries, keys, and values with two iteration variables. And so if you remember, here's a dictionary. We put two items into it. And, um, and we can call d.items and get a list of tuples, a list of two tuples. Two tuples are a quick way of saying a tuple with two things in it. It's a two-element list that consists each element is a two-tuple. And it's the key and the value, key and the value. And so if we just print this out, it's a list. So then when we put this on a for loop, it is a list, but the things inside the list are each a tuple. Each thing inside the list is a tuple. So 
when this iteration variable goes to there, it is like this tuple is being assigned into KV, which means the key, key goes into K and the value goes into V. The name I picked for K and V don't matter, do not matter. Um, it's, just, it's just the first one and the second one. So K, go, K and V point here, then the next time through the loop, K and V point here. And so that's how Chen 2, uh, CSEV 2 and Chen Win uh, 4 happen. And so this is really a tuple assignment or a tuple iterating through a list of a tuple uh, iteration variable or a pair of iteration variables walking through the list. Okay. We don't do this a lot in this. It's really quite, it's most heavily used for this situation where you're going through a dictionary and you want to see both the keys and the values. And then you use this method inside of dictionary called D items. Another thing that's cool about tuples are that they're comparable. So less than, greater than, equals. And so they look, they first compare the first leftmost thing. Then if that matches, they go to the second one. And then that one matches, they go to the third one. And so if we're asking, is 0, 1, 2 less than 5, 1, 2? And the answer is true. And it only looks at the 0 and the 5, and that's less than, so away we go. If we ask, is 0, 1, 2 million less than 0, 3, 4? Well, 0 and 0 match, so it goes to the second one. 1 and 3, well, they don't match, and they're less than, so 1 is less than 3. So it, so it's true, and it doesn't even look at these numbers, because it doesn't have to, right? In this one, it doesn't look at those numbers. And now if we say, come here, is Jones Sally less than Jones Fred? Well, it compares the, this, and they're equal. So then it has to look to the second one. Is Sally less than Fred? Well, no, because S is not less than F. And so that answer is false. Is Jones Sally greater than Adams? Sam, well, Jones is greater than Adams, so it never looks at these variables. And that turns out to be true. So these are comparable, which means we can use the less than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, equal to, or not equal to. So we can use these operators on whole tuples. Now this turns out to be quite nice because things that can be compared can also be sorted. Okay. So here is A, B, and C. A maps to 10, B maps to 1, C maps to 22. If I look at the items, I get back a list of two tuples, three two tuples. They are not sorted because dictionaries aren't sorted. A maps to 10, C maps to 22, and B maps to 1. The order that these come out in is not something that we can control. But if we put these items into a variable, call it T, T is the list of tuples basically, and then we tell it to sort, it can do comparisons between all these, and it can sort them, and now they're sorted in key order, A, B, C. Now you'll never get any keys that match, so it never looks at the second one, right? Because there's one and only one key A, or B, or C. The value 10 never gets looked at. So this ends up sort by keys. Sort by keys. Okay, so this is a way to sort by keys. We take a dictionary, we get back a list of tuples, key value tuples, then we sort that dictionary, I mean sort that list of key value tuples, and then it's sorted by key. Okay, so that's one sort. There is a built-in function in Python called sorted, which takes as a parameter a list and gives you back a sorted version of that list. So we can collapse these operations by saying, oh, well, D sub items is this list of tuples, non-sorted. But sorted of D sub items is that same list of tuples, but then sorted. So immediately, in one step, we have A, B, and C properly sorted. And we can combine all this into one nice little for statement, where we say 4KV in sorted of D sub items. So this is now going to first sort the key value pairs by key, and then KV is going to run through them, so K is going to be A, 10, then it's going to, K is going to be B, V is going to be 1, 
k is going to be c, d is going to be 22. So now we've printed these things out in alphabetical key order. Okay. So by adding sorted to d items, that means that this loop is going to run in key sorted order. Key sorted order. And that's because sorted takes a list and then returns as it takes a list as unsorted list as input and returns a sorted list. Okay? Now, if we're doing something like our common problem of what's the most common word, what if we want to say what's the five most common words? In that case, we probably want to sort in descending order by the values, not the key. Okay? So we want to sort by the values instead of the key. So this is a situation where we're going to create a temporary variable. So here's how we're going to do it. Here is our dictionary with A10. And we want to sort now by the values. We want to you know, maybe see the most common or sort by the values. And so we're going to make a temporary list. And then we're going to loop through the items. So, so this is going to just loop through them. And it's going to loop through them in non-sorted order. And we are going to add, using the append operation to this little list that we're making, but we're going to add the, a tuple that is value comma key. So if we make the value first and the key second in this tuple. So this syntax here of this parenthesis v comma k, that means make a two tuple with values from the v and k variable. And append a list. So you're going to end up with a list of two tuples. So if we, if we take a look, when we're all done with this, each of these is a tuple. 10a gets appended, 22c gets appended. And it was simply the opposite order. The, the tuple, each of the tuples now has the value first and the key second. Value first, key second, value first, key second. So this is a bit of temporary data that we've created. This is a bit of temporary data that we've created. Then what we do is we call the sort method. Sort, take this list. Lists are mutable. The individual tuples can't be changed, but the order of the tuples can be changed because they are in a list. Temp.sort, and then we're going to say reverse equals true, so we sort from the highest down to the lowest. Okay, And now temp has been sorted, and now it is in a new order. 22, 10, 1 is what caused it to be sorted, so we know that the biggest value is 22, the key of C. Next biggest is 10 with a key of A. And the smallest is a key of one, a value of 1 with a key of B. So the trick here is if we want to sort in some other way, we just construct a list where we put it in the order that we want it sorted. And this is more important now. The value is more important than the key. Now if we had um, another, like a, a 22F, it would sort first on the 22, and then it would it would sort the F1 after the C1, right? So we don't have any duplicates, but we could have this. Um, we could have the key of C to 22, and we could have F also to 22. Okay, so take some time on this. Get this one right. So now I want to show you a program that is going to show you the 10 most common words. We did a a loop before where we did the <clears throat> most common word by doing a maximum loop at the end by looking through all of the counts in a dictionary and then picking the maximum. But what if you wanted the top 10? Right? That, that, you don't want to write a loop for that. So we're going to use sorting. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to open a file. We're going to create an empty counts dictionary. Then we're going to write a for loop that reads each line for line in F hand. Then I'm going to split each line into words based on the spaces using the dot split. Then I'm going to loop through each word in each line and use our histogram or a, a dictionary pattern where I say count sub word equals counts dot get word comma zero. That basically says go look in counts. If word, if the word key exists, give me back the value that's in that. Otherwise, give me zero. So this both creates the new entries and updates old entries, all in one nice, simple statement. 
So at the end of this bit of code right here, we are going to have counts with keyword word count pairs. Okay, so this is something we've done before. It's just dictionaries, reading, splitting, and then this pattern of how to accumulate in a dictionary. Then what we're going to do is we're going to make a new list called LST. And now we're doing this key value in the item. So this is going to go through the key value pairs in this list, which is the key value pairs from the dictionary. right? But then we are going to create this temporary list of tuples that are val comma key. So val is like 20 the 14 hello. And that's what the list is going to look like, right? It's going to be tuples, but it's going to be the value and then the key rather than the key and the value. This one here is key value. This one here, LST, is, is value key. Now that we have a list that's value comma key, we are just going to sort it because now it's going to sort based on the first thing in that tuple and we're going to reverse it so the biggest values are near the top. And so when we're all done, this is going to be a list except it's going to be sorted based on the value. So that's just one step to sort it. So this is a good example of how we sort of go through some work. We get a data structure, a list, the way we want it, and now we can sort of leverage the built-in sort. We had to prepare a list so we could use the built-in sort. We could do this by hand, but it'd be very difficult. But it's easier to say, I think I'll make a list, and then I'll sort it. Okay, so I, I, you know, I made two lists, basically. I made the original one. Now I made this one just for the purpose of sorting. And now what I'm going to do to print out the top 10 is I am going to write a for loop, val key. Remember, this list, LST, is value key. And I'm going to say for val key in list, using list slicing, up, starting at 0, up to but not including 10, which is indeed the first 10 items. Now I'm going to print out key value, so it's going to be like, it's going to print out the 22, you know, Fred 16, and so I'm going to first print the first 10. So this list is in val key order, the tuples are val key order, and so I'm going to print it out in key val just so that I print out in a way that makes the most sense. And so this is a simple way to do a simple histogram of the occurrence of words in a file. So again, you should know this. You should know every line. You should know every line. Go back, review a couple times, but you should know you should know the meaning of every line of this. And if you do, that's really good. So as you become more powerful and capable inside Python, you will realize that there are sometimes even shorter ways of doing things. Now, what I'm showing you here is not that different than what was on the previous page. It's just really dense, but you have to concentrate. So if I want you to understand what's on that previous page. If you don't understand this, don't feel bad. I'm going to explain it to you, but don't feel bad if you don't get it. Okay? So I'm just going to explain it. If it doesn't feel right to you, go back and look at the previous page. Okay, so here we go. I'm going to have a dictionary, and then I'm going to print in one line, sorted by value. So <clears throat> we'll start from the inside out. So this is a thing called list comprehension. It looks like a list constant because we start with square brackets. But this is a Python syntax that says, construct dynamically a list of tuples v comma k and I would like you to loop through the items with k and v taking on the successive values. So this is creating that reversed list where value and key are the order of the items in each tuple and it's going to do that so this is going to expand. It's sort of like it goes expands this it makes a temporary list right now. Now, if you look on the previous slide, we called that thing LST. But here, we don't even call it LST. And then, once we have the list of tuples in value key order, then we simply take and pass that in to sorted. This is a function call, the sorted function. 
and then, now I'm not reversing it, but the print statement prints out its ascending order of the value, 1, 10, 22. Okay? So this, you can, you can make these more dense once you're a little more comfortable with what's going on. It's sometimes easier to construct something that seems to have steps where you can put, you know, you can put a debug print here, you can put a debug print here, you can do a debug print here, and you kind of see what's going on, right? Whereas once you really understand this, you can you can write some more dense Python. When you when you understand this, it's okay, right? Um, so I'm not saying you're supposed to understand this, but I just want to point out that it's possible to do this in a tighter fashion. So tuples are like lists, except that you can't change them, right? You can't change lists, and uh, you can compare them, you can sort them, you can sort lists of tuples. You can't sort the, within the tuple itself. The the two uh, the two values on the left hand side of an assignment statement, uh, we can uh, use sorted, and we've played with sorting dictionaries by key and value. So, um, that's kind of the end of this lecture, and. Uh, and so at this point, I just want to kind of congratulate you on making it through the first uh, 10 chapters of the book. So I'll, uh, I'll drink a cup of tea to you. Here's your cup of tea. Here's my toast to you um, in my Slytherin cup. And so uh, it's uh, time for a, uh, a graduation ceremony. So I'll give a, a little graduation speech here with my uh, graduation hat on. And this is my, uh, this is my Slytherin wand. And so, uh, so the reason I'm congratulating you at the end of this chapter is that at, at this point, you kind of know almost, you know all the fundamentals of programming. Programming really comes down to what's called algorithms and data structures. Sometimes we solve a problem by a clever series of steps that we put together, and sometimes we solve a problem by creating a clever data structure. And so the first few chapters were about algorithms, steps, loops, functions, very procedural, how you sort of create these threads of stepping and do things a bunch of times or skip around or whatever. And in the last three chapters that we've covered, we're talking about data structures. And programming power comes when you combine algorithms and data structures. Now in the next chapters, starting with chapter 11, regular expressions, we're going to learn sort of more clever ways of doing the same thing. So you kind of know how to do a lot of stuff now. From this point forward, you'll see, oh boy, that's more clever. Or we'll use a database, oh, that's more clever. But it's not fundamentally different. And so that's why it's important for you to understand before you leave this moment, to understand everything that we've covered so far loops, functions, strings, files, tuples, lists, dictionaries, because they're kind of the foundation and everything else will just kind of be a subtle refinement slash improvement. So um, once you understand that, you've kind of begun, you become a basic programmer and I like, I like poof, like I, uh, I, I like magically asperio you and turn you a pythonio and something like that. Okay, enough of the Harry Potter reference. Uh, thank you for uh, spending all this time with me. If you've gotten this far, I really appreciate it. Um, and of, of course, it's really just the beginning, but I hope that it has been a good beginning. Thank you. Hello and welcome to Chapter 11, Regular Expressions from the book Python for Informatics Exploring Information. As always, these slides are copyright Creative Commons attribution, as well as the audio and the video that you're watching or listening to right now. And uh, so regular expressions are an interesting thing. Um, you've seen from in the chapters up till now, I've, I've had a singular focus on sort of pulling information out of data, raw data, this mailbox file that perhaps you're getting tired of already. But it's a lot of fun because I can have you go look for something and and pick it out and you're doing something that like would be really painful to do sort of by hand. And while it's not all of computing, I mean there's games and there's comp you know things like weather computations that do calculations, um, pulling and extracting data out is a big part of computing. And so there's actually a library that's built specifically to do this. 
And, and if you start doing a few fines and slicing, it gets kind of long after a while. And that's like split, for example, really saved us a lot of time. But sometimes the data that you're looking for is a little more sophisticated than broken into spaces or colons or something like that. And you just want to like tell something to go find, I see what I want and I see where it's embedded in the string, go get it for me. And regular expressions are themselves a programming language. They're like a really smart, wild card for searching. So we've used wild cards in various things in search, but they're they're a really smart version of a wild card. And so regular expressions are quite powerful and they're very cryptic. And as a matter of fact, you don't even need to learn them if you don't feel like it, right? Um, I've got this little guide. I need a guide for myself when I do regular expressions. It sometimes takes me a few minutes to write a regular expression to do exactly what I want. So in a way, writing a regular expression is like program writing a program. It's highly specialized to searching and extracting data from strings, but it's like writing a program. And it takes a while to get it right. And you kind of have to like, ah, oh, change this. What about a slash there? And so you, uh, but they actually are kind of fun. And, and they're a great way to sort of exchange little program snippets to say, oh yeah, I'm looking for this. Oh, here's a little regular expression you might try. And then, so they're, they're like programs themselves. It is this language of marker characters. So when we look for regular expressions, some characters like ABC have meaning as ABC, but some characters like caret or dollar sign mean the beginning of the line or at the end of the line. And so we encode in this string a, a program, basically. And so it's a rather old school language. It's from long time. It predates Python, which is over 20 years old. And so it's... Um, it also marks you as sort of a little cool, right? It's a, it's a distinct marking that makes it so that you know something other people don't, right? So you can know how to program, but if you know regular expressions, they'll be like, whoa, I tried to look at those and they're kind of tough. In a way, knowing regular expressions is kind of like a tattoo. So I, it's a casual Friday and that's why I'm wearing a t-shirt today. And so I figured I would... Uh, come in today in a t-shirt but since how it's the first time I'm wearing a short sleeve shirt it's also the first time I can show you my so my real tattoo here so here's my real tattoo and in the middle is Sakai the open source learning management system always close to my heart and then you have the IMS logo which is IMS learning tools and interoperability which is a standard that means a lot to me blackboard uh, OLAT learning objects angel Moodle uh, instructure Genzabar and desire to learn. I call this the ring of compliance because these are all of the first six or seven learning management systems that complied with the IMS Learning Tools Interoperability Standard and Specification, which is something that I spent a lot of my life making work. So I figured I'd make a tattoo and just kind of part of my rough, tough image. And, and actually, regular expressions are indeed part of my rough, tough image because I'm like, I'm down with regular expressions and people are like impressed with my regular expression knowledge. But as impressive as I am, I still need a cheat sheet. So I'll have a cheat sheet that you can download hopefully on the Python Learn website or whatever. And I just, it doesn't have to be much. It's really just a kind of a, a, a crutch. And these are the characters that have special meaning like caret or dollar sign match the beginning or end of line respectively. So they're not really matching a dollar sign. They match, they, they mean something in our little mini string-like programming language. So, like many things that we do in Python going forward, once you want some sophisticated capability, it comes with Python, but it comes in the form of a library. And so the regular expression library, we have to say import re at the beginning of our programs to import the regular expression library. Then we call re.search to say I'm looking for search from the regular expression library. There's two basic functions or method, uh, two, two basic capabilities inside this library that we're going to look at. One is search that replaces find. It's like a smart find. And then find all is a combination of a smart find and automatic extraction. So we'll look at both of those in turn. And I'll do it by comparing them to existing Python that you kind of already should know at this point. So here's some code that's, say, looking for lines that have the, word fr have the string from colon in them. Right? So we're going to open a file. We're going to strip the white space. If we find, if we, we, we hunt within line for from, if it's greater than or equal to zero, then we'll print it. And so this is just going to give us a number. If it's if it's not found, it's negative one. So it's only going to print the lines that, that have from in them. 
Here is the equivalent using regular expressions. So these two things are equivalent. So we have to import the library, like I mentioned before. And all the rest of it's the same. The if test is re.search that says within the library re call the search utility and then pass in the line the string we're looking for and the line the actual text we're looking in so this is like look for from inside of line and return me a true or a false whichever depending on whether you find it or not now you might say I you just got done telling me that it it was more dense and the answer is there's a few more characters here but we'll see in a second how you can quickly add more power to the regular expression find you have to start adding more Python lines to make it more sophisticated where in the regular expression you start changing you change the search string to give more of the direction of what you're looking for and that's what we'll be doing pretty much is changing the search string so now if we wanted to switch to say wait 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 we don't just want the from anywhere in the line we want it to start with from so we would change line dot starts with from and that's either going to be true or false depending on whether or not the line starts with from. Now we do the same thing with regular expressions by changing the search string. So now we're in regular expressions. So this really just isn't a string. It's a string plus characters that are interpreted as commands by the regular expression library. So the caret, which is the first one on our, our little regular expression sheet, matches the beginning of the line. It's not actually a caret. So that says the first character, this two character sequence, caret f, means F but in column one in the first character of the line. So again, this is going to give us a true or a false if this regular expression matches. The, the beginning of the line, FROM colon, and it's the same as this. It's does it start with from. So again, these two are equivalent. But you see the pattern where we're going to do something to this string using these characters that have meaning. Okay? So the next thing that's most commonly done other than caret and dollar sign for the end of the line, is um, the wildcard characters. And so we've used wildcards possibly in like DOS, where we can use question mark or star in like a dir command, dir dot star dot star, if you're familiar with that, or even a Unix command like ls, you know, star dot whatever. Um, this is not how regular expressions work, and the problem is is that dot, dot is, the, it matches a single character in regular expressions. Asterisk means any number of times. So if, if I look at this, if I look at this and color code this to make a little more sense, um, the caret is actually kind of part of the regular, expect, reg, regular expression programming language. It says I'm, I'm, I'm a virtual character matching the beginning of line. The x is a real character. The dot is part of the regular expression programming language, any character. Star is part of the regular expression programming that says the immediate previous character many times, zero or more times, and then colon matches the colon. And so if you look at lines, these are the kinds of lines that will give me a true because they start with an X, followed by some number of characters, followed by a colon. So that's true. Start with an X, followed by some number of characters, followed by a colon. Okay? And so that's basically how this works. And so this little, this, in, in this five character string there are you know some of these things are like instructions and some of them are the actual characters we're looking for so the X and the colon are the are the characters we're looking for and the caret dot and star are programming right they are logic that we're adding to the string okay so let's say for example you're in part of any of these things and part of the stuff we've done so far has to assume that the data is some level of being clean. And so the data that I've been giving you, mbox.txt, is not inconsistent. Right? It doesn't have like too much weirdness in it. I'm not trying to trick you and, and mislead you. Although we've had situations where you sort of get a trace back because you think there's going to be five words, you you grab a line, you break it, and there's only two words, and then you get a trace back because you're looking at the fifth word, or something like that. But if your data is less clean, or even if you just are want to be real careful, you can fine tune your matching. So here's that same match. Uh, give me a character X followed by any number of characters followed by a colon, and that's what I'm looking for. Give me lines that match that pattern. So this X starts at any number of characters, colon, great. This 
any number of characters go great. Oh wait, and there's an email message that says X plane is two weeks behind schedule or behind schedule, colon two weeks. Well the regular expression didn't know that dash made sense to you, and you just assumed that everything that started with a capital X had a dash after it. So X is what it starts with, any number of any character, and then a colon. So this becomes true. This may not make you happy, right? It may not be what you're looking for because you haven't been specific enough in your regular expression. So we can be more specific in our regular expression. So for example, this is a more specific regular expression. It still says start with an X as the first character, then a dash. That's a real character, not a... Then this next thing, instead of being a dot, it's backslash capital S. It's on the sheet. Whoa. It's not on the sheet. I lost the sheet. Come back, sheet. I lost the sheet. I can't live without my sheet. Backslash capital S means a non-white space character. So that means spaces won't match. And then I changed the asterisk, zero or more times thing, to a plus. And that means one or more times. Here's a character, a non-white space. These two things kind of work together. A non-white space character at least one time, as many as we like. And then a colon. So if we look here, it starts with X dash, any number of non-white space characters, and ends in colon. Starts with X dash, any number of non-white space characters, ends in a colon. True, true. This one starts with an X, but doesn't start with an X dash. Oh, as a matter of fact, these characters are blanks, so this becomes a false. It does have an X and does have a colon and match the previous one, but this one here is more specific. Okay, so it's more specific, and so it matches what you want. Now, it depends on what you're looking for. Maybe you do want this line, and so you're looking for X. I don't know, but if you want, you can be increasingly sophisticated in what you're looking for in a regular expression. So now, let's talk about extracting data. So everything we've done so far is, is it there or is it not? But it's really common once you find something that you want to break it into pieces. So we can combine the searching and the parsing into one statement. And instead of using search, which returns for us a true false, we are going to use find all. So in this example, I'm going to show you a new syntax, the square bracket in regular expression language means a way to list a set of characters. So this says, this is a single character that says, I want to match anything in the range 0 through 9. Plus means one or more of those. So that says, so this is, this whole thing says one or more digits. That's a regular expression that says one or more digits. You can put other things inside here. You could put like, you know, you could make a thing that says A, B, C, D, and that would say I'm going to match a single character that's A or B or C or D. Or you could say like, you know, um, one, three, five, seven, bracket. That's a single character that's either a one or a three or a five or a seven. So the bracket is a list of matching characters, and the dash inside the bracket means range. We'll see in a second that you can stick a not inside the bracket. It's on the sheet. So, so again, remember, in this little mini language, we are programming, right? We are giving instructions to the regular expression engine, as it were. Okay? So, if we do this, and here is an expression that says, I would like to find you know, things that are w one or more digits. And so, <clears throat> so it's one or more digits, and, and so it's going to look through here, and it's going to find it as many times as it can. So there is one or more digits, there is one or more digits, and there is one or more digits. And so what find all gives us back is a list of strings. So it found it, where do I match, where do I match, where it's looking the whole time, and then it says, oh, I've got it, 2-1942. So it actually extracts the strings that match and gives you a Python list of strings. Python list of strings. Kind of like split, except it's like a super smart split, right? 
it's split, but I've directed it what to look for. And if, so here's an example of, you know, that's the one I just did, find me one or more digits and then extract them, so 2, 19, 42. Here I'm saying, using the same bracket syntax, to look for a single character, a capital A, E, I, O, or U, and one or more of those. And if you look, there are no uppercase vowels in my string. So it says, I'm going to find all the things that match A, E, I, O, U. So things like A, A would match, and, you know, O, U would match. And so that's what we would get if they were in the string. But because there are none, we get an empty string. So even if there are none, you get an empty string. So it always returns a string. It may be a zero length string, and that's what you'd have to check. Okay? Okay. Now, matching has this notion of greedy, where when you put one of these pluses or asterisks, it kind of has this outward pushing feeling, right? And so when you say, I'm looking for something that starts with an F at the beginning of the line, followed by one or more characters, followed by a colon, you can think of this as pushing outward. So if we look at a line here that has from colon using the colon character, it will try to expand, so it, it certainly has to match the F, and it's looking for a colon, any number of characters, but it's trying to make the string that matches as big as possible. So it skips over this colon and goes to that colon, and so the thing that we get is here. And so it ignored this and said, I will make as large a string as I can. So the, that's the plus that's doing it. Dot plus pushes. It's like, I got a colon, but is there another colon out there? So you can push it. Okay? So that's greedy matching. It can get you in some trouble, um, like being greedy in general. And both asterisk and plus sort of behave in a greedy way because they're zero more or one or more characters so they can sort of push outward. Okay? <clears throat> now you can turn this off. It's a programming language. We can tweak it. Okay? And so we add a question mark. So this is a three character sequence now. So if you say dot plus question mark that says one or more of any characters push but instead of being greedy and pushing as far as you can, this means stop at the first. Stop at the first. Oops. Stop at the first. I can never draw on this thing fast enough. Stop at the first. Okay? And that's it. Just don't be greedy. Don't try to make the string as large as possible. Go at the smaller one. The smaller possible one. We still need to find an F and we still need to find a colon, but when you find the first colon, stop. And so what this does is this changes it so that what we match is from colon instead of going all the way. So the greedy match pushes as far as it can. The non-greedy match is satisfied with the first thing that meets the criterion of the string. So this is a little three-character programming sequence. Any character, one or more times, and not greedy. If, for example, we were trying to solve the problem of pulling the email address out of a string, right? <clears throat> we can make good use of this non-blank character. And so the at sign is just a character. And then we can say, I want at least one non-blank character before it and at least one non-blank character after it. So the way regular expressions does, it says, oh, okay, I find my at sign and I push in a greedy manner outwards on, as long as they're non-blank characters. Push, 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 push. Oops, stop. Push, 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 stop. Okay? So it's some number of non-blank characters, an at sign, followed by some number of non-blank characters. So it's uh, that's using greedy matching. It It's doing that. Okay? And so this is where we get Stephen Marquardt. We can, and, and we would know if we, there wasn't there by the uh, empty list, right? And so we'd get Stephen Marquardt at uct ac.za. 
Now, we can also fine tune what we extract. Right in the previous slide, we ext extracted whatever matched. Right, whatever this matched, it looked across the whole string and found it, found the thing, shoved it over, and gave us what it matched. But it's possible to make the match larger than what's extracted, to extract a subset of the match. And we'll see that on this next slide. Okay? So here's this same thing, which is an at sign, followed and then with non-blank characters as far as the eye can see in either direction. But I'm going to add to it caret from space. So so this has to be start with the first character has to be a, a caret. This it's got to have the word from. It's got to have one space and then immediately it's got to find this. Right? It's got to find a series of non-blanks followed by an at sign, followed by another series of one or more non-blanks. And then what we do, so this if we didn't put these parentheses in, it would match and we would get all of this data. It would go to here. But what we can do with the parentheses, the parentheses are part of the regular expression language, saying, okay, I want to match the whole thing. The parentheses aren't part of the uh, string up here. I want to match the whole thing, but I only want to extract this part in parentheses. So this whole thing is a regular expression that's matched, and then the parentheses part is what's retrieved for you. And so this makes it so that the only time it's going to look for at signs is, are on lines that start with from space, it is going to want the immediate next character to be a non-blank, some number of non-blank characters filed by an at sign, some number of non-blank characters, it's going to stop right there, and it's only going to extract from here to here, and so we get out Stephen Marquardt. But this is a pretty narrowly scoped thing because the first four characters have to be from space. And so that's a way to combine a stricter match even though you don't actually want all the data. So you can add those things all over the place. Okay? Okay. Then we, we, we can compare the different ways of extracting data. So if we look at how we extract the host name. Remember how we did this many chapters ago. So we did a data.find which says, oh, the first at sign is a 21. So the first at sign is a 21. Then we say we want to find the space after that. So that's the at position, that's 31. And then we want to extract the data that's one beyond the at up to, but not including the space. And that is the variable that we're going to print out host. And so we've extract this bit of information and out comes the host. Quite nice. Okay. We also saw another technique. And by the way, all these techniques are okay. All these techniques are fine. Another technique we saw once we sort of played with split and lists was what we what I call the double split version of this, where the first thing we do is we split that line. The first thing we do is we split the line, and then we know in blanks that the second thing, which is the sub one, word sub one, is the entire email address. Then this is the double split. We take the email address and we split it by an at sign and then we get a list of the pieces of the email address, the email name and the email host and then we grab the, the sub one of that and then we have the host. So that's a double, the double split way of doing this, right? Now in this we still haven't um, done the from yet but it is the double split way uh, to, to do this. So. If we think about how we would do this in a regular expression, okay, <clears throat> we're going to say look through the string, find all, we're going to here's the find all, and the regular expression exploded up says look through the string for an at. Do -do 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 -do. Got an at. Then, oh, start extracting and extracting. And then this is another form of the sync. This is one character. It's a single character. Match any non-blank character and zero or more of them. Okay. So find an at sign, start extracting, end extracting, match. This is one character. That is a set of possible matches. And that's some character 
This means not. Okay, not a blank. That's a blank right there. That's a blank character right there. Not a blank as many times as you want. You might want to, you might want to turn that into a plus to guarantee at least one. So that might be better done as a plus right there. So this would probably make more sense as a plus to say. I want at least, after the at sign, I want at least one non-blank character. And the parentheses simply say, I don't want the at sign. So the, the at sign, I really want those non-blank characters after the at sign. Okay, So that's what I want to extract. So it's like, go find the at sign. Okay, great, find the at sign. Start extracting. Look for non-blank characters. End extracting. So pull that part out and put it right there. Now an even cooler version of this that you probably kind of imagined right away is we say, you know what? I would like this first character, to, the first part of the line to be from with a blank, followed by any number of characters, followed by an at sign, so the at sign is real, then start extracting, then any number of non-blank characters, and extracting. So this is a, <laughs> this is like eight or nine lines of Python all rolled into one thing. Okay. All right. So start at the beginning of the line, look for string from with a space, then skip a bunch of characters looking for an at sign, skip characters until you encounter an at sign, then start extracting, match any non-blank, a single non-blank character, so this is kind of like one non-blank character, one non-blank character, but once you suffix it with the asterisk, that changes it to be many non-blank characters. And then stop extracting. Okay? And so, you know, so it's like, find from followed by a space, great. That's the first part. Now throw away characters until you find an at sign. Then start extracting. Keep going with non-blank characters until you hit the first blank characters and pull that part out. Now the result is we get the exact same data, but with this added to it, we're much more uh, narrow in the kind of things that we're looking for. And if we get noisy data that like something like, you know, meet at Joe's, right? We don't want that, that won't match, right? We want that to be like a false. And, and it allows us to sort of really fine tune our matching and extracting. And this is just the beginning. They're very, very powerful. So the last thing that I will show you is sort of a program that is kind of like one of the programs that we did in a previous section, except now we're going to use regular expressions to do it. So if you remember, we had this thing where we're doing spam confidence, where we're looking for lines and, um, you know, and pulling this number out and then calculating either the average or the maximum or whatever. And so here is a, we import the regular expression library, we open the file, we're going to do this with appending to the a list. A, we'll put the list. We'll put the numbers in a list rather than doing the calculation in a loop. Um, we strip the data. Now here's the key thing, right? We're going to have a regular expression that says, "Look for the first character being x, followed by a dash, followed by all this. This all this exactly has to match literally, followed by a colon, and then there's a space, and then we begin extracting, and we're looking for." the digit 0 through 9 or a dot and we're looking for one or more and then we end extracting so that's the the parentheses are telling us what to pull out so that just means that we're going to pull out those numbers all the digits and the numbers until we get something other I mean all the digits and the period and we we'll get something other than a digit and a period and we'll, and then we'll be done okay and so if we and so this is going to pull those numbers out and give us back a list. Now the thing about it is we have to realize that sometimes this is not going to match because we're sending every line, not just the ones that start with X, we're sending every line through this. And so we need to know when we didn't get a match. And that the way we know we didn't get a match is if the list, the number of items in the list that we got back is zero, then we're going to continue. 
So this is kind of our if where we're searching for the needle in the haystack. But then once we find what we're looking for, the actual number that we're interested in is already sitting here in stuff sub zero. Okay? And then we convert it to a float, we append it, and then when the loop is all done, we print out the maximum. Okay? And so this is sort of encoding a number of things and ending up with a very um, a very solid and safe matching. So we're really it's hard for this to find a line that's wrong. And you could even improve this a little bit to make it even a little tighter where it would go find a number like 0 0.999. You could say, oh, it's all the numbers are um, 0 dot. So you, you could make this a little a little more um, precise. So it wouldn't, so it would even skip things. It, 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 you can make it so it looks exactly the way you want it to look. So I emphasize that this is kind of a weird language and you need some kind of thing. We talked about all these. We have the beginning of the line, we have the end of the line, matching any character, uh, matching space characters, matching non-white space characters. Star is a modifier that says zero or more times. Star question mark is a modifier that says zero or more times non-greedy. Plus is one or more times plus question mark is one or more times non-greedy. When you have bracket syntax, it's a set, it's a single character that's in the listed set, so that's lowercase vowels. You can also have the first, if the first character of this is a caret, that flips it, so that means everything except capital X, capital Y, capital Z. So it's everything that's not in the set, capital X, capital Y, capital Z. And then you can also put dashes in to represent ranges, Bracket A through Z and 0 through 9 in lowercase letters and digits will match. But again, this is a single character. Now you can put a plus or a star after these guys to make them happen more than one time. And you can even put them in twice. So if I wanted a two-digit number, I could say 0 0-9, 0 0-9. Oops. This is one character, this is one character, and this is the possible things. So that's, you know, 0, 0, 0 would match, 1, 0 would match, 99 would match, etc. Okay? And then the parentheses are the things that if you are in the middle of a big long matching string and you don't want to extract the whole thing, you can limit the things you're extracting to, to the stuff that's just in there. With all these characters that have all this meaning, we have to have a way to match those characters. So dollar sign is the end of a line. But what if we're looking for something that actually has a dollar sign in the string? And that's what the backslash is for. So if you put the backslash in front of a otherwise meaningful character, you don't, it becomes the actual character. So this is saying match a dollar sign. Those two characters say match a dollar sign. And then this says one character that's 0 through 9 or a, or a dot. And then we put the plus modifier to say at least one or more times. And so that sort of is a greedy, of course. So that will get us this and extract it, including the dollar sign. So the escape character is the backslash. OK. So there we are. Now we're done. So this is a little bit cryptic. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's kind of a puzzle. It's kind of fun. And it's extremely powerful. And uh, you don't have to know it. You don't have to learn it. Um, but if you do, uh, you'll find that it's uh, very useful as we sort of dig through data and are trying to write things that are pretty quick. And, and, and they, the thing I like about regular expressions is that they tend to be, if you write them well, they tend to be less sensitive to bad data. Um, they tend to ignore data. They're, you can put more detail. I exactly want this. Whereas you're, if you're writing find and extract, you're making a lot of assumptions about the data that it's clean and you're not going to, you know, miss hit on something. So, okay, well, good luck in uh, your use of regular expressions and uh, we'll see you later. Hello, this is uh, Dr. Charles Severin and uh, we're talking about chapter 12 of the book Python for Informatics, Exploring Information. And now we're going to really talk about how to write programs that interact across the network. As always, this material is uh, copyright Creative Commons attribution. So we've been sort of working through our 
in our internet protocols. We've talked about HTML, we talked about CSS. So we have a, our internet in the middle. We've talked about the request response cycle. And we're gonna actually start writing clients now is what we're going to do. And so their client's gonna make a request to a server. The server's gonna process that, give us back some information. And unlike where we've been a browser before, now we're actually going to be a program as a client is what we're really gonna start looking at. And so we're going to learn today a lot about the request response cycle and get and post and what's a socket and what's the hypertext transport protocol. So let's do a quick review of uh, network architecture. And so if we go back to our internet discussion, we have uh, four layers in our network architecture. We have the top to the bottom. The link is the lowest lever, level that gets the data across one physical connection, maybe wireless or fiber optic or ethernet. The internet is sort of like the worldwide post office that is an end-to-end -end protocol in terms of addressing, but uh, each router makes decisions and forwards it across. Um, and when it's said and done, we have this transport layer that creates a seemingly perfect end-to-end uh, -end in order error corrected stream of data uh, we call it a pipe and so tcp ip provide tc the tcp layer built on top of ip provides us with a our application can make a connection to some other application on the internet and assume that all the magic you know m billions of dollars of engineering below it in the transport internet and link layer um, just work and so it's it's all about We've got this pipe, and so we can permit, we can sort of ignore everything else and just talk application to application. And we're going to write one of these applications, and we're going to talk to a web server as the other application on the other end. And so this is basically some end-to-end -end connection that we can ignore the details of what's going on inside. So we call these sockets, or pipes, but sockets. Socket is sort of like you plug something into the wall and so there's some magic in between and uh, but somehow everything works and so the socket is our abstraction it's an abstraction that's it's like a file um, a file is our way to talk to the complex detail of how hard drives work and the socket is our abstraction our our, our uh, handle that we use to connect to another process across the network so in computer networking an internet socket or network socket is an endpoint of a bi-directional inter-process communication flow across an internet. So, socket. So, we, also to review, uh, in addition to host names, we use port numbers. It can be think, thought of as uh, phone extensions or apartment numbers. You have a building, but it also has an apartment number within the building. And it is an application or process-specific number that really identifies more closely the communications endpoint. And it allows multiple networked applications to coexist on the same server. And when we connect, we connect using that port number so that we can decide which of the applications that we want. And there's a list of well-known port numbers. So if you want to connect to the web server on www.umich.edu, you know that unless you're told otherwise, the normal port that you will talk is port 8080. And so there's a w list of well-known port numbers that was has been evolved over time as new common applications like mail or file transfer or HTTP, the web, uh, were evolved. They kind of sat around and decided what port number to use. And, and if you look at the list of port numbers, you'll find that um, there is sort of a historical perspective to the port numbers. Um, you know, the, the lower the number, the likely, more likely that that port number is... Uh, is an, an antique from the early, earliest of times. So here's an example where we have clients on the right and the server on, on the left, and we have a number of applications, one to process incoming e email sitting on port 25, one to process login on port 23, uh, a web server sitting on port 80 and 443, and, uh, and a personal mailbox. If, uh, if you use, uh, download your mail, perhaps from Google to your uh, iPhone, uh, you maybe have used IMAP or POP as the way to pull that data 
uh, off of the Google servers and pull it in. And they function, uh, POP happens to function on ports 109 and 110. And again, it's just like a phone extension. It's just a way so that one IP address like 74.208.28.177 can host many different network applications. And from the outside, we can pick which of those applications we want to connect with using the TCP port. So here's a list of the common ports. I mentioned Telnet, HTTP 80 is the one we'll focus on the most, Mail is port 25, um, POP, domain name, file transfer. Again, while it's not guaranteed, the, uh, the lower the number, the more antique they are. And if you're talking and cruising around on the web and you see in the host area of a URL, colon, and then a number, what that's saying is we're going to connect our browser to a web server on a port other than 80. And so in this case, it's 8,085. And, and it's common for developers to run uh, test instance, instances of applications on ports other than uh, web applications on ports other than 80 uh, so that the production can be on port 80 and test instances, instances can be on other ports. So just because 80 is the convention, it doesn't mean it's the it always the exact port that it runs on. Um, you can connect a web server application to a different port. So in Python, we have a powerful set of primitives. And part of the goal of Python library is to make it so that we only write, have, have to write a few lines of code. We hide all the complexity, all the IP, all the TCP, everything under as simple as interface as we possibly can do. And so, um, so here we have uh, three lines of Python. Import socket, and then we create the socket. Now, for this line here, don't even try to worry about what the parameters are. We're creating an internet socket, and uh, we want it to be a stream rather than a packet-based socket. Um, but for all intents and purposes, just Make a socket with exactly this syntax. I mean, you can name it whatever you want as a variable, but basically this is just like make a socket. Now the key is, is it actually is not connected. This socket is sort of local. It is, you created a socket to be connected. And the next thing you do is you call my sock, which is the variable that you've used to got back from the socket call to create the socket, dot connect. And you give it a tuple. So this first parameter is a tuple. That's why it's in parentheses. And the tuple has two values. One is the host name that you're going to connect to, the domain name that you're going to connect to, and the other is the port. Now, port 80 is the normal place that you would naturally make this connection, port 80, right? So we're connecting to www.pi4inf.com, port 80. And this sort of just emphasizes that one of the goals of Python is to give us extremely powerful primitives with a library. In this case, we've imported a socket. And in the case of the uh, famous Python XKCD uh, comic, uh, the, the person who's uh, floating up there uh, simply typed import anti-gravity on their Python interpreter. And here they are uh, floating in the air. So the idea is we'll make everything as simple as possible. Like how to float in the air is simple. You just import the library for anti-gravity, and that's what makes this fun. You may or may not think this is fun, but for us nerds, this XKCD comic is a is an absolute stitch. So we have this socket, and so you can think of the socket basically as um, the socket opens up a connection to here. That's okay. I'm about ready to make a connection, and then the connect, the second step, makes the connection to the far end. Okay, and so it really is create a socket and then make the socket. And our question now is, now that we have a two-way connection between this other application, or it might blow up if there's no application there. I'll show you how that works in a sec. We have a two-way connection. How do we talk? And this is where we have to invent an application protocol. And IP is a protocol. It's a lower-level protocol, and all the routers sort of know IP the same way. But the application router, uh, application protocols is different. For, uh, they are all different for each application. The World Wide Web protocol is quite different than the email protocol, which is quite different from the Telnet protocol. But they're all application layer protocols, and you have to talk a different protocol depending on what application you're talking to on the far end. 
So you have to go read some documentation about the protocol. HTTP is the one we'll focus on, obviously, because it's uh, hypertext tra transport protocol is the dominant one on the internet. You know, it was invented by Tim Berners-Lee and Robert Caillou, and they were going to retrieve HTML documents. And they were in a hurry. Um, as Robert Caillou says in his video, uh, they were a small group, and they were trying to make a documentation system, and, and they didn't have a lot of programmers, so they made a simple uh, yet very elegant um, protocol. And, and frankly, that's part of the reason it's taken over the universe, is that um, it's so simple. And, uh, of course, we've later extended it to use the exact same protocol to send data back and forth. And the, the, the protocol is extremely simple because you pretty much only have to send one line. Um, you make a connection, which all sockets and all applications do to a particular port. You request a document with a sending a command on that connection, and then you wait and retrieve the document, and then the connection closes. Now, there's lots of sophistication beyond this, but the basic operation of the protocol is so simple that we can actually do it by hand if we so desire. So it's really a set of rules that browsers, which is the primary application that consumes HTTP, um, retrieving web documents over the internet. So a protocol is really just a set of conventions. In this set of pictures, I've got a left-hand steering wheel from Australia and the UK and Japan, I think, is on the left-hand side. And then, um, yeah, in the U.S., we drive on the left side. So the top one is the U.S. There we go. I mean, we drive on the right side of the road, sit on the left side of the car. But it's just a set of rules. It's a convention. So one of the things in, in an application protocol that's very important is who talks first. You establish a connection. Now, who's listening and who's talking? Because... You know, when the phone rings and the who's, so when you dial someone on the phone and their phone rings and they pick up, that's the moment that the connection has been completed. The question is, who talks first? We know, of course, what the protocol is on the telephone call. Who talks first? The person who answers the phone talks first. They say, they always say the same thing. And what is it? Hello? And then you go, hello. So you exchange a message. And then you go, who is this? You go, I'm Chuck. Or unless you have caller ID, then you just say, you pick the phone up and say, hi, Chuck, or, or whatever. So, so we have a protocol. A phone is a good model for a connection. Right. And so phone, the dialing and the ringing and the pickup are what the connect is. So when you grab your phone, that's kind of like the socket creation. The dialing, the ringing, and the pickup is like the connect. Once the connect is successful, you've got to start sending stuff back and forth, and we have to know who's going to talk first. So that's what a protocol is. It's the rules of who's going to talk first, what are they going to say, and once they say what they're supposed to say, what are you supposed to say? On and on and on and on. <clears throat> so when we look at URLs, we can parse these URLs and we look at the HTTP colon slash slash and that is a way that we indicate which protocol to make the connection to. We have the host name and we just parse these out with standard string operations, www.drchuck.com and then the document that we want from that host slash page one dot htm. Okay, and so if you remember the video from Robert, he's talking about the URL captures um, what host to talk to what to say to that host, and what to retrieve, all in one string. It's, it's, it's inelegant and kind of clunky, but the fact that it's one string that captures the protocol to use, what, connect, what computer you're going to talk to, and what you're asking for in that computer all in one string is actually amazingly powerful, even if it has a colon and two slashes unnecessarily. So... When you're using a browser and you click on a link in a page, you are telling the browser to go make a connection to a server and re retrieve a new page. And so in the, in the href equals of that anchor tag, it has a either a relative or an absolute URL, but in either case, it knows what host to talk to, and it issues what's called a GET request, and then the server returns the HTML document for that GET request. So let's, uh, let's show you um, an example, uh, so, so we connect to uh, a server like drchuck.com, 
and then we send a document request, the get, and you're supposed to uppercase get, so it's capital G, capital E, capital T, so the first characters you're supposed to send are G-E-T, followed by a single space, followed by the URL of the document that you're looking for. So here we are in a browser, and we're going to click on this first this first link. And if, if you look sort of down here, you see that we're going to re go to www.drchuck.com slash page2.htm. And so you click on that, and the click goes to the browser, and the browser says, oh, I need to retrieve a new document. So it then, <clears throat> that click goes to the browser application running on your laptop or your PDA or whatever. Then the browser makes a connection to port 80 on the web server, in this case, www.drchuck.com, and then <clears throat> sends the command get space http colon slash slash www.drchuck.com slash page 2 dot htm. Server grinds through, goes reads the files, whatever it's going to do on its server thing, and it sends back a document in the form of HTML in this case, because we are getting a web document. And then your that comes back across that socket connection. You can you read from the socket, and then you take that HTML and the browser formats the HTML according to the rules of HTML and CSS, and then shows you a brand new page. So we call this the request response cycle. This is the request half. And this is the, res the response half. Request, response. You click, request, response. Request, response. I can't really say that enough because I love the request response cycle. So let's go ahead and write a simple web browser in Python. So remember, we've got our client on the left-hand side. And we've got our server on the right-hand side, and we're going to make a request response. In this case, I'm going to go horizontal here. Request code in the server response. Right. Request code response. But now what we're going to do is we're going to be this piece of code, and we're going to rewrite this browser as in Python. Now, if you didn't have this really cool lecture and the really cool book, you'd have to go read a complex document. Um, and, and that complex document would describe the interworkings of the um, <coughs> the inner workings of how HTTP works. So we'd have to go find the IETF's RFC for the Hypertext Transport Protocol. So here is an example of that protocol, and um, and you can see that it's a uh, it's well there it's quite a large document. This particular one I'm looking at is a uh, version uh, from 1999. I'm sure there are a few tweaks since then. But here is the URL. And if you download it and take a look at it, it's, uh, it's of course, quite a piece of work. If we go down far enough, it describes to us as what the request is. And it's a method followed by the request URL. That's followed by a space, followed by the request URI, followed by a space, followed by the HTTP version, followed by carriage return line feed. And so this is what we do. So we're going to, we, we can eliminate from some servers which uh, version of HTTP, but this is what our command to the server is supposed to look like. So we can hack this by, instead of using a browser, we can use Telnet. Rare. Telnet, right here, Telnet. So I'll show you how to do this. So this is sitting on a Macintosh. Uh, you may not be able to do this on Windows. You may have to install something to get a Telnet to work on Windows, but you, it works the same. You simply have to tell it to Telnet to the host you're interested in and then add a, a parameter at the end, 80, which is Telnet to port 80. So Telnet will make a connection, and this is like the phone ringing, and when you see this connected, that means they've picked up. Now you'll see when we do this that it's just sitting there listening. Okay. Then we type the get command and then it responds and then closes the connection. So let me show you how that works. Okay. So I'm sitting here in my happy little um, happy little <coughs> tell, uh, command line, telnet. Uh, 
comment to www.drchuck.com on port 80. So here we are. And so now we're talking to a web server. It's sitting somewhere in some giant hosting facility, and it's waiting for us to talk. We can type anything we want. If we were didn't read the RFC, we'd be like, um, howdy, my name is Chuck, how are you, Mr. Web Server? And it says, bad request. Your browser sent a request that this server could not understand. The request line contained invalid characters following the protocol string. Stop doing that, right? Because howdy, my name is Chuck, how are you, Mr. Web Server, does not comply with the application protocol, HTTP. So we have to go back to the drawing board, and we have to actually read what it is that you're supposed to say to this thing. Well, so we go do that. We go read it. So now we're going to try again, and we're going to say get, followed by a single space, exactly what the specification said, HTTP colon slash slash www.doctor doctor-chuck.com and page one dot htm. I'll leave off the version number. You can you can put the version number on it's http some slash one point zero. But I'll leave that off for now. We're going to do a early. And now it actually sent us back a page, and there it is, and it's HTML. And if I tell that again, and I say get space http colon slash slash www doctor chuck.com slash page 2.htm. Here we get another page. So we just pretended that we were a browser, grabbing one page and then clicking on a link and responding to that page. So if I go here, uh, let's see. So if I go to www.drchuck.com slash page 1.htm, I am now, when I hit enter, saying, go please retrieve that page. So it does, oops, let's go like this, move this over here. So now I'm telling my browser to effectively do this. So if we were to watch the traffic, we would see this command go from my browser across the internet. Retrieve the page, and bang, here's the page. Now, if I click on this, it's going to do this. My, if we were to watch the packets go back off my laptop, it would send that line when I click on second page. It would then ret retrieve and re be returned this information, and that's what it displays. Okay, and so that is each of those clicks is causing a request response cycle. Or if I type a URL in here, that's going to trigger a get as well. So uh, href causes a get to be called, and a typing in the URL box causes a get to be called. Hitting the refresh causes a get to be called. So we send a get and then retrieve the data and then display it and make it look pretty. So all the, all the browser is really doing is, you know, it has a bunch of rules as to how to format HTML. And, and that means that H1s are supposed to be big and tall and paragraphs are supposed to do this and H, you know, see, it, it, links are supposed to be purple after you click on. All those other rules, right? That's just how you display it. We're now talking about the protocol of how you request it and how you retrieve it. So that's hacking. This protocol is so simple, and that's, again, part of its elegance, that we can actually test it by typing parts of it by hand. Very few of the other protocols are all that simple to be tested by hand. Some of the older mail protocols, pre-security, were testable by hand, but now any of the secure protocols is just so complex. Any of the secure protocols are so complex that we generally don't exercise them by hand. So. <clears throat> If you watch this URL, you can see uh, one of my favorite scenes uh, where uh, Trinity is hacking the power grid in Matrix 2. And, um, and, and so you kind of see her doing this uh, telnetting and SSHing and connecting using the exact same uh, terminal windows that we're using. And so this is a, 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 something that I find really fun to see when uh, hacking is done accurately in the movies as compared to when it's uh, done with some beautiful uh, user interface screen. <clears throat> so
So if we look at a more complex web page, like the University of Michigan web page, um, that we can tell net to port 80 on www.mich.edu. We can ask for the main page. Some browsers will take it without the URL. Uh, some web servers, I mean, will take a, uh, a get request that only has slash. We can try this one in a second. Um, let's, let's go ahead and try it right now. And so um, telnet www.umich.edu port 80. Can't type. Get slash. There we go. So if we look at this, we see we got the entire HTML of the University of Michigan web page. Okay, get slash. Now, not all browsers, I'm um, not all web servers will take get slash as the sort of local version. Sometimes you'd have to say get http colon slash slash www.mich.edu slash. Now, the problem is, is deep inside here, if you take a look at this, you're going to see all kinds of images and CSS, like external style sheets. And so as we would read through this, as the browser would read through this, it would see other documents that have to be retrieved. In this case, you know, we don't have to go very far. We see some CSSs that are being pulled in. We see some images that are being pulled in. And, and so what happens then is it has to make further request response cycles. So those two little page one and page two dot htm were fully self-contained pages. But real pages on the internet usually have quite a few links. And so you can think of it as the first, when you type www.mich.edu into your browser, it first requests the, the HTML, but then it has to request in some number, 15 or so other files, pictures, CSS, other things. And you just, it, and you can see it updating the status um, as it updates the status, as it's pulling these things, and it assembles the web page for you. Now, it's all pretty quick usually, and some of this information is kept locally so that the CSS, you don't have to re-retrieve it every single time you click on a different part of the University of Michigan web page. Now, if we, you have a Firebug installed in your Firefox browser, just go to a Firefox add-ons page and look for Firebug. It can actually show you dynamically all the different things that a page has requested um, in addition to the beginning uh, HTML text. And, and you can use that to figure out, um, you know, you can use that to see how long something takes and each one is timed and it's a, a really powerful, powerful thing to find the HTML pages it requests, the image files that it requests, the JavaScript files it requests, and the CSS it requests. And, um, and so you go into uh, uh, Firefox, and then you hit, uh, you turn on the, the console, and then it shows you down here at the bottom, uh, you know, it grabbed the first page, and then it grabbed the CSS, and it grabbed that picture, that, this picture right here. It grabbed some more uh, J JavaScript. It grabbed this thing and that thing, and, and, you know, blah, 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 blah. And so it, and you can see that it takes a certain amount of time for each one of these things, and you can see where it's actually pulling this information down from. And, and, and it really lets you reveal and get a sense of um, the intricacy of some of these web pages. But each of these lines here is a new request response cycle. So let's continue writing our uh, first browser in uh, Python. And so the first thing that we have to do is the, what we did in the last program, and that is import the socket library create a socket library, and then connect, it, connect ourselves to port 80 on a server across the network. Now, it's like they've answered the phone. The socket exists. The, the, um, the socket creation creates it on your system. The connect makes the connection all the way to port 80 to their web server on the far end. And then you can make send calls and receive calls. It is a two-way socket. You can read and write simultaneously, actually. And so what we're going to do is the, the protocol says that the, it's going to listen. The far end is going to listen, and we have to send a command. So we are going to send a command, get, space. Again, the rules are very strict. The document that we want, and another space, and then the protocol. We're talking HTTP 
1.0 in this case, and then two new lines. And if you go back and look, this is exactly what you're supposed to do according to the RFC. So that sends a command to the server, the get command, and then the server does whatever it does, looks files up, does this, that, does the other thing. And at some point, it starts sending data back. And what we do to pull data out of the socket is we do a receive. We don't get back the data we sent. We get back the data it is sending in its send call. And so it's, the, it's really two pipes. One is sort of an outgoing pipe for each of the two servers and an incoming pipe. And so uh, we're going to write a little while loop, and we're going to say while true. And that's a little infinite loop, of course. And we are going to receive 512 characters at a time, up to 512 characters. Um, we are going to receive in a data string. And if the socket is done and been finished and closed, then we'll see no data. The length of data will be less than one. Um, if, and then we'll do a break to get out of the loop. And if we get data, we'll print it. And then we'll go up and grab some more. So it'll run this loop a few times until it's retrieved all the information. And then at the end, when we got all the information, we tear down the socket, close it on our end, which closes it on the other end, and, and make it freeze up uh, scarce resources. And so that's a, a simple web browser. So let's let's see how this runs. Okay. And so <clears throat> if we run it, this is the output we get. Okay. <clears throat> and this is the loop that's running, and it might take a few calls or whatever, but it, it gets back a, a data. Now it's not getting it a line at a time, it's getting it with new lines in place. So each of the end of these lines has a new line in it. If you really wanted to split it in lines, you'd have to split it in lines. Okay, so we're getting it with new lines intact. <clears throat> now, the one thing that we're seeing here, it's a little bit new, is this purple stuff. And that's because we've asked for the HTTP 1.1 protocol, which sends a bunch of header information that's metadata about the document. Now, this is different than the head area of the HTML document. This is actually, because not all data comes across the Internet as HTML. This is metadata about the remaining data. In this case, we're not even getting a um, HTT, HTML document back. We're getting a plain text document for this uh, Romeo.txt. The actual contents of the document are those four lines, the Romeo.txt. So if you type that URL, uh, Romeo.txt URL, into a browser, you will only see this bit. But if you use Firefox, you can actually see these HTTP headers. And so we asked at a very low level to send everything, so it sent headers. It knows the difference between the headers and the text by a blank line. So it goes header, 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 as long as it needs to get a blank line, and then it's the body of everything. And that body actually could be an image for all that matter. Now, that's a real simple web browser, and we're making a socket call, and we're reading through a socket call. Now, we can make this a little simpler with an even more powerful library called URL lib. Okay, And URL lib is part of Python. And we can accomplish the same thing in far fewer lines of code by using URL lib. And like everything in Python, we have an import statement to get access to that library. And we it treats a URL like a file. We don't really care about the port anymore. We don't have to worry about sockets. We don't have to worry about connecting. That's exactly what's happening inside the URL lib library, library but we're not we're responsible for it. We just call URL lib.url open and pass a URL. And at this point, what we get back is like a file handle. So this is a way of turning a URL on the Internet into a file-like object in Python. And at that point, we just write a for loop. And now the new lines and everything are being taken care of for us as well. So this is a line loop rather than a data loop. The socket original one was a data loop, not a line loop. And we simply print it out. So there we go. So if we run this program, this is what it looks like. So the loop's going to run. We're doing a strip because we will get new lines. It's breaking it into lines, but we're going to get new lines when it's all said and done. So we've got to strip them. But that's the entire thing. Now, it's also smart enough to throw away the headers because it thinks we're just looking for the data, which is a, a completely reasonable assumption. So the headers aren't coming out. And so all we see are the four lines of text from uh, Python for Informatics slash code slash Romeo dot txt. So this is also an extremely simple four-line web browser written in Python. 
And so it really treats it like a file. So with urllib, you can do anything that you would normally do with a file. And so we put these two lines, we import urllib, we open it, and then we write one of our completely stock loops that's going to count the frequency of words in Romeo.txt. We make a dictionary, we loop through for line in F hand, we split the line into pieces for word in words, we update the counts using the standard dictionary and we print it out. This code here is the same as if we had done a file open up here, but instead we've done a URL open. So Python has made this extremely easy for us. We can also just read web pages, and we read web pages like files, and now the lines matter, and so each time through the loop we're going to get a different line. All right, so we're reading page one dot htm. We get line, 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 line. Okay, so that's a very simple loop to read through a web page a line at a time. Now if we wanted to look at the text, we could, and we could build a simple web crawler that would retrieve a page, then look for the links on that page, and then retrieve the link, the other pages that the pages that our current page points to. All we have to do is we have to find a way to parse out those links. Now we could do that with regular expressions. We could do that with a bunch of string calls. Um, but those would be kind of hard because there's a lot of different ways that you can make things look. And somebody has probably already written a bit of code that tears this apart. So if you think about it, this is what Google does. The simple Google is, you know, retrieve a web page, read through the web page, look for links, and then retrieve the pages that are pointed to by that, and on and on and on and on. So this is a basic web crawler. We have, we're starting to have the basics of a web crawler. So now we want to talk a little bit about how you parse HTML. Now, again, we could do this with regular expressions. We could do this with uh, just low-level Python pr string primitives. Uh, parse, this is also called web scraping. It's kind of like we're pretending to be a browser and scraping off the little tiny bit that is the HTML that comes back. So it's scrapings when a web program or script pretends it's a browser and issues browser-like requests and then parses the content and looks at it as if it were a human and then clicks virtually by retrieving uh, documents. And if you do this enough, you spider the web or crawl the web. Is the, is the common terms of, of doing this. So you gotta be careful too, you can get in some trouble if you overdo this. So if you think about it, that we're taking advantage of the fact that there is an extremely simple protocol between the browser and the web server, the request response. And you send a get command and you get back HTML. We can basically in Python do the same thing with a URL open, do a get request and get back the HTML, except that we get it in a, in a string instead of getting it in um, on our browser. Now, from the web server's perspective, it sort of hardly can tell the difference between a browser talking to it and a program talking to it. Now, they, they can figure subtle ways out, but on the whole, we just emulate what the browser does. And if the server's too smart, we can fake whatever the browser is doing if they get that nasty, that they want to do something to automated robots that are reading their data, they, and they can do that, and some do do that. So why might you want to scrape data? Well, you might have a research project and you can't get the raw data uh, from some system, but you can hit the next button and hit the next button, but you do it virtually inside of a program. Uh, you also might find some system like blogger.com or something where you've run a blog for years and years and you want to switch to a different blogger and they won't give you the data back. You just write a program to pull all your blog posts and extract them. Um, you might have an automated process that monitors a site for new information. Or you really have a, a research project that's going to watch trends in Facebook friends where you look at uh, some pages. Maybe I should use MySpace friends because Facebook di discourages this. And so you, or you might be making some kind of highly specialized search engine. 
So there's a lot of controversy about um, scraping. Uh, some sites get really upset about it, in particular those sites that are advertising, advertising driven and want users to see their ads in addition to their valuable information. Facebook and Google are examples of this. If you go <clears throat> build a search engine by uh, sending search requests to Google and retrieving what they come back as the search request and then make your own search engine, uh, they will come down on you like a load of bricks, right? Um, and and you can uh, and Google go search for Facebook scraping block and here are a bunch of people that are like, ah, Facebook was mean to me because in Facebook to scrape, you have to log in on an account. So not only can they shut you down, but they knew who it was that was doing the abusing as an individual. And so, you know, the Facebook considers its information all theirs. Google thinks it's all theirs. And you just can't, just because it's technically possible to do it, doesn't mean that you have the legal right to do it. So you've got to be really sh careful. You can get entire domains uh, shut down. And so you got to read the terms of service, and you got to write your crawler to be reasonable sometimes. Facebook, you know, explicitly says you're not allowed to do this unless you have explicit permission. Um, <clears throat> so we got to parse HTML. And like I said, we could use regular expressions or string search or any other way. But there is a bit of wonderful free software called Beautiful Soup that has done this. And HTML can be so bad. And you might be able to parse simple and beautiful HTML a little bit with some strings or some regular expressions. But by the time it's all over, you will just spend the rest of your life trying to figure out what's going on. So the easier thing is to just download this Beautiful Soup. And it's the reason it's called Beautiful Soup is it's like a tag soup, a soup of tags. I mean, I don't know if that makes sense or not, but that is why they called it what they do. So you download this file from uh, crummysoftware.com, and um, and basically you put the beautifulsoup.py in the same folder as your Python code. There's a way to make it part of a library, but for now, just make it right in the same folder, and and we're going to import it in a second. So here is how we write a simple, uh, beautiful soup program. So we're going to import URL lib, and from beautiful soup import star, this is just a different form of the import command. Um, we are going to use a raw input to prompt the user for a URL. We're going to call URL open on that URL, and we're going to immediately call the read request. Now this time we're not actually going to get the handle back. We're telling it not only do we want you to make the connection, we want you to read it all and give the entire page back to us as one big long string with new lines and all. Okay, And so what we get back here in HTML is an entire web page with you know, you know, less than HTML, less than head, everything from top to bottom. And we've told URL lib to just read it all. We don't want to write a loop to go through it ourselves because we got the whole HTML. Then it's really simple. We tell Beautiful Soup to parse it. Here's the HTML from the page. Start up Beautiful Soup, read through the entire thing, make a parsed version of the web page. And that comes back as a variable which we call traditionally soup. It's a soup of tags. It works a little bit like a uh, dictionary. And, um, <clears throat> And so I can go in and I can say, in this soup thing, now this is the syntax that Beautiful Soup basically says, say, you know what, I would like to retrieve a list of all the tags. I would like to retrieve from the soup, <laughs> as it were, from the variable name soup, but it's, we think of it as from the soup of all those tags that we just extracted using Beautiful Soup, um, give me the anchor tags the A tags. If you wanted the paragraph tags, you'd ask for the P tags. If you wanted the, mm, I don't know, UL tags, you'd ask for the UL tags. And so soup, parentheses, quote A quote, says, give me all the A tags as a list of tags. So it's a list, so we have to write a for loop to go through it. So we're saying for tag in tags, and then each tag is like a Python dictionary of the HTML attributes. So if you think of an A tag, A, this is really ugly, href, ah, 
equals blah, 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 blah. This is an attribute, right? That's an HTML attribute. Style equals, href equals, source equals, all these things that are key value pairs in between the start of the tag and the end of the tag are what we can get. So we can say tag.get, which is a dictionary lookup in Python, give me the href. And if there is no href, remember the get, the second parameter of get is the default value. So give me none if there is no href. And so this loops through each of the tags in that document in order and then prints out the href attribute from that tag. And we didn't have to look for double quotes or single quotes or less thans or greater thans or anything because Beautiful Soup did all that and made sort of a dictionary of dictionaries of dictionaries that we're reading through in these three lines. Okay? <clears throat> and so Beautiful Soup is doing a lot of work for us. Right? It reads these things, it finds the A tags, it understands them, and then it extracts the href part and gives us only the href text. And so if we run this, you know, urlinks.py, and we tell it to go read page 1.htm, it prints out page 2.htm. So here we are in about nine lines of code. We have written the first bit of a web crawler that can retrieve a page and then loop through that page and find every link in the page. And it's a short step to then make a list of those links and then retrieve those links and you've got yourself a web crawler. Enough of a web crawler to get yourself in trouble probably. So, in summary, we've talked about the hypertext transfer protocol. We start with TCP IP, which gives us clean, in order, error corrected sockets between applications. And we have application protocols like HTTP, we send the, at the protocol, of send the GET request, wait for what comes back. And HTTP is this elegantly simple protocol, so simple that we can do it by hand if we really want to. By sending the telnet and the get command, it's very simple, yet powerful and very extensible. And Python has a library for both sockets and URL lib and um, parsing HTML with, uh, with... Hello and welcome to our lecture on uh, web services. These slides are copyright Creative Commons attribution. And what we've been playing with uh, in chapter 12 was the basic idea of using HTTP or the REST request response cycle to send data to a send a request to a server and get something back. Uh, when we looked at HTML, we parsed it, we took out tags. So we're kind of starting to treat this as data. And in web services, we really are switching to let's produce this data as data with the intent to have it consumed by an application as data. And basically in doing this, we have to come up with a format for the document that comes back when we ask for the, for the data so that we can parse it and make sense of that data. And there are two commonly used formats for that data that we'll take a look at both of them. And so if you sort of imagine the problem of exchanging data between, between two applications, we have to deal with the fact that these applications may not be the same language. One might be Python. You might have some data in a Python dictionary, and we might want to send it into Java. And Java doesn't have Python dictionaries. It has hash maps. And so we have to agree on a format. And that is the format that we convert the data from the Python dictionary, we do some kind of conversion, we send it across the network, and then we sort of parse it and interpret it, and then come up with an internal structure within the, the other system, right? And so we call this a wire format, a format that is on the wire. It's not always a wire, but we call it a wire format. And so we can agree. One of the formats that's commonly used that we'll talk about is called XML. And XML consists of less thans and greater thans. It looks a lot like HTML. That's because they both were inspired by an earlier thing called SGML. And so we call the act of taking something from an internal format and sending it, making it into a wire format, the act of serialization, and then reading a wire format and then getting it back into some internal format in some destination system and some destination language, we call that deserialization. And XML is one of the two formats that we're going to talk about today. The other is JSON, JavaScript Object Notation. 
And so the difference with JSON is in its choice of how to represent the data on the wire, it uses curly braces, colons, and, and, and square brackets, which are not in this particular example. And so these are just two techniques for serializing and deserializing data. Two techniques. They're the two ones that are the most common, and we will talk about them, both of them, in the class. So we'll start talking about XML. And so the first thing to observe about XML is that um, these tags, much like in HTML, they have start tags and end tags. So people slash people. This is called an element. We might also call it a node. And then within a node, there are other nodes. And so within the people node, here's one person, and then here's another person. There, And this one starts with person and ends with slash person. And then within the person element, there's a name element and a phone number element. So elements within elements within elements. And the term that we'll use for this is simple element and complex element. And the basic difference between them is a simple element is one that has no sub-elements. It is just like the end. It's just the name, Chuck. There's no other elements inside of it. And a complex element is like people or like person that has more elements within it. So complex elements constructed of uh, uh, element, has elements within it as well as data. So let's talk a little bit about XML. Now, there's a debate as to which is better, XML or JSON. And the answer is they're, they're probably better for different applications. XML is really good at representing hierarchical structured data that needs a lot of description. And it was a started from this thing called SGML, which was a generalized markup language using less than and greater than. But it was intended to be a little more easily legible. And so it's, it's commonly used to do things like word processing documents or whatever. So as I mentioned, uh, XML has start tags and end tags. Um, name and slash name is also a start and an end tag. And then it has some text content. The text is that which is between the start and end tag that's not itself another element. So the, this phone number is a text, a bit of text element. <clears throat> In addition to the text element, which is between the start and end tags, there is also the notion of an attribute. And an attribute is on the start tag if in the case of email here it's a self-closing tag, type is their set of key value pairs, type equals and then the value in double quotes. Okay, so hide equals yes, and type is international. Those are called attributes. So we have start tags, end tags, content, attributes, and self-closing tags are the ones that, self-closing tags are the ones that don't have slash email, they just end in slash, and they're totally self-contained, but they can have attributes on them, if you like. So white space doesn't matter in general. It's, uh, we tend to format these with little bits of indentation to make our lives easier. And so these two, these two representations that I have here are uh, roughly the same. Uh, and the fact that I've got these uh, nicely indented uh, makes no difference. So line ends don't matter and it's generally discarded on text elements. And we indent only to be readable, and it's very common to indent to be readable. So here's just a bit of XML from an example. Give you some, so we have a, a recipe tag, and everything's gonna be closed. Recipe tag, uh, the recipe hat tag has a number of attributes on it. Again, they're key value pairs. Name equals bread, pep time equals five minutes, cook time, three hours, etc. Your title tag, an ingredient tag. Flour is the text bit of this ingredient tag, and then it has some attributes, some more ingredients, some instructions, a step tag, and an end step tag. You kind of get the picture, right? So we can represent lots of things. And in and, and XML, one of its advantages and disadvantages, the disadvantage is kind of wordy. The advantage is it's a little more self-describing than JSON is. JSON um, is, is sort of simpler and more direct, but uh, uh, XML is, is in some ways more self-describing because we can kind of look at this and based on the names, ingredient, instruction, step, they can make some sense to us. So tags are the basic less than, greater than bits that the indicate the beginning and ending of elements. 
Attributes or key value pairs on open tags. And serializing and deserializing is this act of taking an internal structure inside of a Python program and producing the less thans and greater thans in the right proper format so they can be sent across the internet to the destination. So one of the ways we can think of XML as we have these complex elements that have more complex or simple elements is we can think of them as nodes in a tree. Another name for this little B guy, B slash B, is as a tree, as a node in a tree. And so we can think of the B as this node in a tree. Its parent node is A. It's part of A. Its immediate sort of containing element is A. C, its immediate containing element is also A. It's a node. And C has two child nodes. So when we think about a node like C, we think of A as the parent node and then the child node and the child node, right? So, so this is like a tree, or these are more moving down toward leaves, and these are sort of the trunk. It's a bit of an upside-down tree, if you think about how trees actually grow. Now, we often think of the text bits that are sitting in here as the children of a node. So the... Clear that. So D... Had, D is part of C, its immediate parent is C, and its child is that text bit Y. Okay? And so that's one way to think about XML as, as a tree. And, and as we start pulling stuff out of XML, we'll go grab a node and then we'll say, oh, let's, let's go through the, child, the immediate children of that particular node. Or I'll grab a node and I'll find the, uh, the text child of that node. And so we tend to sort of pull our way through these things in trees, thinking about I am at a node and I'm looking down from that node. And, and so that's the tree terminology, the node terminology. Another way to think about this, <coughs> if the, I mean, sorry, the, the attributes are also best thought of as sort of associated with the node is kind of children. So this W attribute is like a child of the B node. The B node is this whole thing. It has a child of the text bit and a child that is the attribute. Another way to think about this is as paths. And the way the paths work is you just take a how to find this text X. Well, it's really the child of B, which is the child of A. And then we use sort of a slash notation like we might use for folders on a file system. Slash A slash B is where in this tree. So slash A slash B is where we would find X. And slash A slash C slash D is where we would find y. <clears throat> slash a slash c slash e is where we find e. So these are the paths to pieces of the document. That's another way that we think about them, starting with sort of this outer, outer node, a, and then sort of working in as far as we have to go. So that's basic XML. Another thing that we often use in XML is a technology called XML Schema. And XML Schema defines a contract that tells us what legal XML really is. And so it itself turns out to be XML, but its purpose is, is to describe a set of XML documents that can pass the schema. So, the, so it's a set of constraints on the structure, what the name of the tags are, how many of the tags you can have, what tag lives inside of what other tag, etc. And the goal of a schema is to use a schema to validate, to look at some XML and says that and say that is legal XML or that is not legal XML based on the schema that we've got. So the validation step is it takes a XML document that we're wondering if it complies with the schema. We take a schema and we hand it to this piece of software called a validator. And the validator either says, yes, it's validated, or no, it's not validated. The real value in this is if we have two applications, they are going to exchange data, they should be able to come up with a contract as to what is valid and invalid. An XML schema is a good way to describe valid and invalid XML. So here is a very simple example of XML schema in action. So here's an XML document. It's got a person with a last name, an age, and a date born. Okay? And so here's an XML schema contract. And I mentioned it was XML. So it's got less thans and greater thans, and it's got tags, 
It's got attributes. And so what it's really saying here is that, that the outer part of the XML is supposed to be a tag by the name of person. That says the outer thing. And then within that, there is a sequence. And there's supposed to be an element that's last name with a type of string, an element age that's a type of integer, and an element called date born, which is a type date. And so we can sort of know that these are the proper names for these things. And this is supposed to be a string, this is supposed to be a number, and that's supposed to be a date. So we can look at that, look at the two documents, a possible bit of XML that either complies or doesn't comply, a contract that tells us whether or not, or what the, what the contract is, and then a validator that sort of mechanically checks to see if the XML meets the contract or not. So there's a number of different XML languages, schema definition languages. We're talking about one called the W3C XML schema. Often ends up with a file suffix on your file system of XSD. So I won't talk about the other ones. I'm talking about A, the most common one, and probably the easiest one to understand. And that probably is a reason why it's probably the most common one. So we're going to focus, focus on the schema that came from the World Wide Web Consortium. Like I said, the file names tend to end in XSD. So this one we went through before. Person is a complex type. So we say it's a complex type with a, name, with a tag name of person. Then within that, there's a sequence of tags. That XS sequence says you can expect a series of tags. A simple element, a non-complex element, is just an XS element. And then we have the name and the expected type for the three elements. And this particular one validates nicely. There's a couple other things that we can put on as the XSD uh, starts to become uh, richer. Uh, I mean, th there are more things that you can describe. Uh, in this example, we are seeing uh, the use of min occurs and max occurs. And that basically is a constraint on the cardinality of these things. And so what this is saying is that we have a tag called full name. It is a string and it's required, meaning that the minimum number of occurs, it it occurs is one and the maximum number of, occurs of, of times it has to occur is one. So that means it's exactly one. And so we have that. If we look at this child name tag, like this one here, we have four of them. It says it's a string and the minimum number of times we should have it is zero and the maximum number of times we're allowed to have it is 10. So we're allowed to have this tag repeated between zero and 10 times and in this particular example, it is repeated exactly four times and so that validates. That is a happy validation. That looks like kind of a mean validation. So let's change it to be a happy validation. So it reads this, reads this, reads those two things, and it's happy because it meets the validation. I'm having trouble drawing happy faces. Just a few more data types to talk about in this XML schema. My goal is not to have you be able to write XML schema. I'm just kind of showing you a little bit of it so that you can understand how it works um, and maybe look at a simple one and understand how and understand it makes sense and, and ask your questions. Does this meet it or not? So we have that we talked about string. I will talk about in a second the date format. Date format is generally year, month, day. Uh, there is a date time, which is year, month, day, the letter T hour, minute, second, and then optional time zone. You can have decimal numbers, which means they have um, uh, you know, points after the decimal place, and you can even say integers. And so you can have some types of things that we can put in a schema to constrain the data that we see in the XML. So I mentioned the date time format. There's a special standard called ISO 8601 that talks about this date time format. It is, it's, I like this format because it is easily sortable because the, the top part is the year and it's always the same number. You put zeros in year, month, day, then the letter T, then hour, minute, second, and then the time zone. 
The most common time zone that we tend to use is a time zone called Z. Normally this would be like GMT or EDT for Eastern Daylight Time or EST. Most computers don't like using that. Most computers want to use a time that is the same around the world. And so they tend to use Greenwich Mean Time, otherwise known as Zulu Time. And so you might have a local time on the East Coast. And I don't even know what these numbers are, but let's say it's uh, 10 o'clock at night. And that's, that's a bad time to pick. Let's see. Let's pick like 2 p.m. in the U.S. East Coast. Well, in England, I think it's six hours later, it's actually 8 p.m. in the U.K. This is Zulu time. Greenwich Mean Time, Universal Time, Zulu Time are all the same thing. They are the time in the UK. And again, if, if you want to see something happen an hour ago or two hours ago, you don't want to have to calculate back and forth between lots of time zones. So we really prefer to, to use this Zulu time and map the stuff that we store as we send data from server to server, which might be in different time zones. So we tend to use Zulu time, otherwise known as Greenwich Mean Time. Here's another example of some XML schema. Um, and this is most, most of this is pretty much the same. Yada yada, we got some min occurs here. Um, we got strings, string, string. And now we have this thing called country. And it is a simple type. And it's a string, but this excess enumeration gives us the legal values. So it's not just any string. It's got to be F, R, D, E, E, S, U, K, or U, S. And so if you're validating this XML for country, you look at the string and check to see if it's a member of that set. So again, that's another kind of thing that you can do with XML schema. Here's another Example of some XML schema. Let's see, we've seen most of this. XML complex type, XS sequence, a string, complex type, sequence, string, 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 string. Uh, this one, max occurs unbounded. That means you can have an infinite number of these things. String, min occurs zero. Excess uh, positive integer. So this is this means that negative 14 would not be allowed. Decibel we've talked about, oh, u equals required, that means it must be there. So this just gives you a sense, and I'm not gonna expect you to know all these, but just I'll give you a couple of questions that are uh, relatively straightforward on these. Just a sense of, you know, take a look at some XML and see if that XML meets it or not. Okay. So we're not gonna spend a lot of time in Python um, uh, doing too much with XML, we're going to do most of the stuff in Python and JSON, but this is just a little bit of XML code that you can download from the website that there is an XML parser built into Python and it's called element tree. There are actually several ones that you could use and I'm just going to use the one called element tree. So I'm making a data, a triple quoted string. So here's my little XML bit and it's just sort of some well-formed XML, the stuff we've been playing with before. So this import statement gets us the element tree library. And to parse this data, we do et from string and pass in the string. This is a string. Now let's talk about what tree looks like. Well, tree is, again, we could think of this as either nodes or, or uh, paths. There's a person node. Then there is a name. Then there's a phone, then there's an email. And name has a chuck underneath it. A phone has the, the number and an attribute underneath it. And email has an attribute under it. And these are nodes. I probably should have made a better slide for this. And so what we do is we find our way to a node. So tree is all of this. Okay, so tree is 
person on down. So I can say tree.find the name thing. So what that does is that goes and finds this guy. Tree.find, so go in the whole tree and find the thing called name and give me the text element in it. So that is going to print out Chuck. Tree.find email finds this little guy. Or another way to say it is it finds this little guy. And then it says get the attribute hide. And so this is going to print out the string yes. Okay, so that prints out the string yes. So tree is all of that. Find the name thing. So that's the name guy. Find the name. Find name. Dot text. Well, that is this text right here. Then tree dot find a dot email. Well, that's this whole thing. And then that within that, to get the attributes, you use dot get and then the name of the attribute. And so that's going to give me back the string yes. So this will print out Chuck and yes. So you basically go down this tree, you go find pieces, and then you pull pieces out of those pieces so you can parse this uh, from a tree. Okay. Here's another example of a little bit of XML. And so the difference between this XML and the previous XML is we have another tag called stuff, and then there is a tag called, um, oh, this is not in indented all so well. There is a users tag, and then there within that are two users. So the difference between the previous one is we just went down a set of nodes. Now what we have is we have a, a stuff, users, and then we have a series of users And there could be several of these. So you could think of this as in here there's dot 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 dot. There's there could be hundreds of users. So now what we're going to do is we're going to say, I would like to do find all, find all these users. Not just find one, but find all the users. Stuff is we parse it. And then we do a find all of user slash user. Users slash user. And that's finding all the user nodes, let me change color here, find me all the user nodes underneath users. And so that gets me all of these. And I get this back as a list. And in the list is each of the nodes. In my example, I'm only going to get a list of two nodes, but I'm going to see uh, if there's hundreds, I would get hundreds. So the thing I get back from stuff.findall is a list of nodes, and there's stuff under here as well. Right? Each of these nodes has things underneath of it. So stuff find all users slash users gets me a list of all of the user objects. And because list is a LST is a list, I can see how many things that I've got. And then I write a little loop for item in list, and that's gonna make an iteration variable, item, is going to go through the success elements of this list. And then item is a node. So each item, we're getting a little, getting a little complex here. Each item, let me switch over here. Another way to say this is list find all gets a list of all of the user objects. And there turns out to be two of them. So there's a Here's the, here's the sub zero, and here's the sub one in the list. We get a list of user objects. Then we're going to have this iteration variable item iterate through each of those things, and it can pull out item.find, item.find, name, get me the name thing, and then find the text within that. So that's going to be Chuck. We can say item.findid.text, and that'll be the 001 bit. And then item.getx, which will pull out 
item.getx will pull out that value right there. Let me draw that again. So item.find.name will get Let's give you a better picture. So item, item is that. Item.find.name.text is Chuck. Item.find.id.text is 001. And item.getx, that's find the attribute x on the item the tag of what we're looking at, and that's going to get the two. So you're sort of looking at these things and pulling the bits out. You can, If there's more than one of them, you can write a for loop to go through them. Okay? So that's XML. I just, we're not going to do much with XML. We're going to do more with JSON. So that's one form of serializing data to move back and forth. Another is JavaScript object notation. So JavaScript object notation is is a notation that it's really the constant syntax, the syntax to make JavaScript constants is what it turns out to be. It was named JSON by this fellow, uh, Douglas Crockford. And um, it is really exactly how you represent objects. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop now and have you take a look at the video from uh, Douglas Crockford, okay? So I hope you enjoyed that uh, video of uh, Doug Crockford. He's a, he's a pretty funny guy. He's got sort of a, an irascible sense of humor. You can uh, find some more of his talks on, uh, on YouTube. Uh, one, of, one of his probably the, the funniest things is this, uh, this picture that's wandering around the, around the, the internet. Uh, Douglas Crockford wrote a book called JavaScript, The Good Parts. And, uh, and so the, what we see here, of course, is here is the book that talks about JavaScript, the definitive guide, which is like everything. And then the uh, book called JavaScript, the good parts is, uh, it's much smaller than JavaScript, the definitive guide. Um, part of the reason for that is JavaScript is a really, really, uh, deep and powerful language, as you probably have seen with the video, if I've shown you the video of, uh, Brendan Eich, it's a very, he was very thoughtful when he designed the language to seem simple on the surface, but yet be, uh, subtly complex and powerful, uh, just under the surface. And so that's why there's a, there's sort of a big difference kind of like doing JavaScript at, at the light level and doing JavaScript in an awesome level. And so as Doug, uh, mentioned, JSON, it, he didn't exactly invent it. He just came up with a term to legitimize the notion. And JSON.org describes it, and he hasn't changed it barely at all since he came up with the idea. And and that, as he said, is one of the charming things. So in the debate of XML versus JSON, um, XML has its advantages. Uh, JSON has a lot of advantages, and in, in many situations, uh, people would push XML where JSON would have been more appropriate. So there's a bit of a backlash against XML, but there's there's still places where XML is useful. But when you just have two applications and they really just want to send some lists and dictionaries back and forth, JSON is a much better way to do it. Both applications kind of know what they're looking for. Um, and so JSON represents data as nested lists and dictionaries. This is another sort of form of sort of composite data structures where you know, we, before we talked about data structures, it's a, a list or a dictionary. And then we got to the point where we had a list of tuples, which is more of a composite data structure because it's a data structure that within it has data structures. Well, in JSON, we just kind of go crazy. It's turtles all the way down, uh, as, as the joke says. Um, and it really has two basic primitive structures that are repeated over and over and over again. And that is... They map exactly on to Python's dictionaries and Python's lists. And the, this, this particular bit of JSON is using just the dictionary format. Of course, it's a triple quoted string, but the open brace and close brace are the indication that we are uh, starting a JavaScript object, which is a set of key value pairs. So this is name maps to Chuck, 
it's a dictionary, comma, and then phone maps to, but this is now another dictionary, type maps to international, number maps to this string, and then that's the end of this thing. <clears throat> and then email is another dictionary with only one key and one value. So this is a dictionary that contains two dictionaries within it. Okay, and so this is a sort of a composite data structure. Okay, and much like what we had to do with XML, we load a, the library using import, import the JSON library. JSON is built into Python uh, in the more recent versions that we're using. And you basically take the string data and you do json.loads, which parses this and turns it into internal Python data structures. But the difference is, unlike XML, which is kind of this tree structure, it actually is exactly Python structures at this point. So this means that what we get back in info is a dictionary. And if we want the word Chuck, we want the word Chuck, we simply say info subname. So info is this outer dictionary, and the key name and the value is Chuck. So it's like give me info sub Chuck. No querying, no nothing. Right? It just is a Python dictionary when we get it back. So if we then take a quick look at how to get at this value right here, well, info sub email, well, that's this bit right here. Actually, it's this bit right here. Ah, let me start that again. Info sub email is this dictionary. So info sub email is itself a dictionary. Then we say sub hide to look deeper into it. And then this value is yes. So you see that the JSON just, it just, there's no sort of querying or finding or find alling or looking up. It's just there. Now you'll also notice that this is not nearly as self descriptive. We don't have the less than person and all that other stuff that gives us a clue as to what's actually going on in here. But if we know what we're looking for, and we're just looking for the name thing, and it's always going to be the name thing, we just write info sub name. And so JSON really is a very direct representation of lists and dictionaries as a wire format. And that's why it's very, very popular compared to XML when you really just are sending data between two cooperating applications. Here's an example of a uh, list of dictionaries. And so in, Py in, uh, in <coughs> Python, well, Python the same way, JSON and Python kind of look the same. Um, here we have square brackets, just like a Python list. And the first item in this list is this dictionary, followed by that comma, followed by the second item in the list is this dictionary. So we have a two item list. So when we parse this whole thing using json.loads, we get back info is a list of dictionaries. Because this is a list of dictionaries. In this case, there's only two of them in the list. Our dictionary, our dictionary, I mean our list contains two dictionaries. And then each dictionary has some key value pairs. And so we dereference these things. Actually, I probably should uh, uh, add a little example. A simple dereference would be info sub zero sub name. Because info is a list, sub zero is that one right there, and then within that, Chuck is subname. Okay, so again, this is just Python syntax. Info is a list, sub zero is the first element of that list, and the thing that is the first element of that list is a dictionary, so we, to look up the name value, we do subname. We could also 
take info, which is a list, right, a list of two dictionaries, and now we can have a for loop for item and info. So that means that item is going to be an iteration variable. It's going to first look at this, and then it's going to look at that. Item is going to be a dictionary. So we can say item sub name, which is this bit right here. We can say item sub ID, which is this bit right there, and item sub X, which is that bit right there. So you just tear these things apart, right? The curly brace things turned into dictionaries, and the square brace things turned into lists. And, and, and again, like I said, it's, it's not as self-describing, but if you know what it's supposed to be, then your Python code looks really simple as you take this stuff apart. Okay, so once we have a serialization, we use sort of HTTP to move this data back and forth. One application produces data and another application consumes data. It leads us toward a notion called a service-oriented approach. And a service-oriented approach is a place where we break our applications into multiple pieces and often run them in multiple servers. Take something as complex as Coursera, they have lots of servers that do special purposes and your user interface that you see is pulling data from many servers, different, different kinds of servers and pulling them together. One might be a server that tells who's registered in what courses. Another might be the threaded discussion server. Another might be the video server. And so what you have is you have, you break your application into multiple services and then you basically sort of compose those together to produce what seems to be an application. Another good example of this would be um, airline reservation systems that try to sell you hotel rooms and rental cars. Well, airlines don't have rental cars and they don't have hotel rooms. They just call a rental car web service, a a rental car service and a hotel room service and they got their own data and so somehow in this thing you can buy a flight a rental car or a hotel room and they're you know they book them book them by making calls to those services so this is called a service oriented approach where you don't try to build on every application to do every single thing it does its thing and it takes services from other applications and when we are going to use services, especially those that don't belong to us, like if many airlines want to talk to the car reservation system, they have to come up with a standard that says, okay, if you're an airline company and you want to talk to our car reservation system, here is a standard. These things are called APIs or application program interfaces. So using these APIs, we can standardize and make it easier so that by the time it's all said and done, once our airline system talks to one car company, car rental company, it can talk to 50 different car rental companies. And so the act of studying these APIs and standardizing these APIs to make things simpler, to reduce everybody's cost, is an important part of uh, IT development. The building of standards is an important part of IT development. As a matter of fact, it's one of the things that I do a whole bunch of my time. So here's a video. So here's a video um, that sort of gives an idea of the value of this uh, service-oriented approach about how we use services across multiple parts of an application and exchange data back and forth and then apply standards at each of those service boundaries. So I think a key to uh, understanding application programming interfaces and web services is uh, well demonstrated by that video in that... Um, it's sort of a, it's not one of these things that's instantaneous. You start, you know, with one system and then you break it into two systems and then you realize that this data is actually useful across many systems, so we kind of have to standardize it. And it's, uh, it's, it's often an evolutionary process. It's not this instantaneous thing where you figure everything out and you know exactly what to do in advance. Um, it's often a very evolutionary process. And, and so you'll find that uh, systems where you're using their API will have multiple versions and they will have gained some experience and so they'll want to uh, switch you. Things like Twitter and Facebook and Google make APIs all the time 
And like the Google Maps API is the version 3 at this point. And that's because the whole thing evolves and they figure things out or how to make it perform better or other kinds of things. So it's a it's important to not oversimplify the fact that, oh, um, uh, we're going to break this up and we're going to make a standard and it's all going to be wonderful and everyone lives happily ever after. It's actually more of a dynamic evolutionary process. But applications uh, that make use of these kinds of services, one way or another, we call these services web services. Uh, I, guess, I guess we sort of call them web services because we access the services using web protocols. As I mentioned, application programming interfaces are kind of that definition at the cut point where you will say, Google will say, you can use our Maps thing, here's our API. You must comply to our API, you follow the rules of the API, and we will let you use our Maps thing. So there's a number of different web service protocols that you'll come across if you go out into the into the real world. Um, there's really one that's very XML based uh, called SOAP, which most people are very tired of because it uh, it's very complex and requires a lot of infrastructure and uh, and more modern uh, programmers and programming languages. Uh, tend not to like it, and I don't. I don't like SOAP very well. I'm not going to talk about it, other than the fact that I'm going to tell you you might run into it, and they might force you to use it. And if someone forces you to use SOAP, you should charge them a lot of money to punish them for using SOAP. Um, the better is what's called REST or representational state transfer, state transfer, where you're sort of moving resources around. We'll we'll show more of a REST-like user interface. So the example that we're going to use is the Google's geocoding API. Now, in an earlier version of the class, in an earlier version of the book, I used the Twitter API. But the problem was is the Twitter API used to be free and open, and now the Twitter API has a, a tremendous restrictions and requires API keys. Now, I've got some examples in the book of how to use Twitter because you use this really cool protocol called OAuth, and we'll talk about that in a bit. But the main example that I'm going to use is the geocoding API. Now, this can do a lot of things. But the, the one thing that it can do is it can take a like something you might type into a search box on a map, like Ann Arbor, Michigan, or um, I don't know the uh, Kensing, Kensington Station, and it will do a Google search with the sense of where that thing is. And it will give you back a bunch of precise data about it. Best guess. It'll actually give you a series, a list of results, right? It won't. It'll give them in, in, in its best guess order. So sometimes it'll give you one, sometimes it'll give you ten, and it's like it's just like a search engine. But it's a great way. Now, what I use this for is I use this um, because uh, when I teach classes worldwide and I ask students where they live, I can't really come up with a drop down or a checkbox or anything sufficient to capture the detail of where somebody lives. So you just give them a text box, let them type in where they live, but then you gotta figure out where that is. So you can use the Google Geocoding API to figure this out. So here's how it works. Now the fun thing about these REST style services is that you can actually go to these URLs. And so if you carefully type this URL in, you will actually be running a query against Google's geocoding web service. I mean, just type it in. And in your browser, you will see the return JSON for the geocoding lookup. Now, I've, I've, I've shortened this so that it fits on the screen quite nicely. And so if you look at it, it's telling us a few things. Status OK. And then results is a list, right? It's a list of, and then an object, And within that object, there is more objects. And if you want the geometry, there's there's a results list. Then there's geometry, and there's location. And within location, there's latitude and longitude. So it's a object. There's an object. There's an object. So it's object within object within object within list. It's a list of objects. And and again, I'm only showing one result here. Um, probably, yeah, I'm only showing one result. There would be more dot, dot, dot right here if you had more results. But we can find it's Google's best guess 
at the latitude and longitude of this location, Ann Arbor, Michigan, we can, we can find that out. That's a comma right there, Ann Arbor, comma, Michigan. And that is the latitude and longitude. All we have to do is hit that URL. So now we can write Python that will do this. Okay, so let's take a look at the Python that we can use to do this. And of course, you can download all this from geojson.py on the Python Learn website. So here's our little program. And the way it's going to work is it's going to prompt for a location and whatever the user types, it is going to hit that URL and retrieve some characters and then extract the latitude and longitude out and print it out as well as the location. So I probably have to go sliding back and forth here. Um, and so if we take a look at our, our program, we're going to call URL lib to do the HTTP request response and JSON to parse the data that we get back. We take this URL, all the part except for the parameters. We ask the user for a location and that's just Ann Arbor, Michigan. And then we basically <coughs> take and concatenate this on, we say address equals, which is the address, sensor equals false, URL lib, URL code, it's, it's the thing that makes these percent signs, it's just something you gotta do. Then we do a URL open, and then we do a URL read. And if you recall, that throws away all of the headers and gives us just the data back, which means that this data, that string, will be this. Whole thing will be in a string variable at that point from urllib.read, okay? So urllib.read puts in data, all the JSON, curly braces, spaces, double quotes, all that stuff, right? Then we print out how many characters we've got, and then we parse it. This here is the important thing right here, parsing. We extract the string with the curly braces, and we say read all that stuff, and turn it into lists and dictionaries, and dictionaries within lists, Yada yada, all the stuff we talked about before. Okay, so, so we check that status. <coughs> we, we, we take this stuff into this variable JS, which is the JSON. Now that's a, well, let's see what it is. It is a object. So the outer thing is an object. And if the, if the status is not in there, which means something probably is wrong, or the status is not equal to OK, well, then we print out something and we print it out and quit. But otherwise, in this JSON dump, that's just to make it look pretty on the screen. But we're going to go into the JavaScript. And this is the outer thing is an object. I need this all on the same page. The outer thing is an object, sub results, which is then a list. JavaScript sub results is a list. Sub zero is the first object in that list. So this is a list. So the first object in the list is this thing. Oh, I gotta go back and forth. Oh, you'll get this. Then sub geometry, sub location, sub lat. So if we look at this, The first item in the results list, the geometry, then location, lo location, and then lat. And that pulls this number out. And so in it, it's a, it takes a little bit of work. And you'll probably have to do this a couple of times with some print statements to, before you get this little sequence right. But you're basically with nothing more than square brackets, either square bracket string or square bracket number, with nothing more than square brackets here you are parsing the JSON. You, are, you look at the structure of the JSON, you can look at lists, you can look at objects, you can pull keys out, and then if you have an object within an object within an object, I mean dictionary within dictionary within dictionary, you just key, sub key, sub key, and you're sort of digging your way down, and when it's all said and done, out comes the number, the 42.28, yada, yada. And then I do the same thing for the longitude. And then I can go down and find the formatted address. And so this is all it takes to parse that JSON. 
So this is a little tiny search engine that's going to just ask for locations and you can run it with various things. Try things like Lake Michigan, try things like Ann Arbor, try things like famous restaurants like the Louvre, right? All kinds of things and see what Google will do. And each time it, you type an address, you pull the data from Google and then you parse the data and then you extract the information that you would like from that JSON data. Okay? Okay, so this this will make sense probably when you're looking at the code and when you're playing with code, more sense. It's a little hard to get it all right uh, up on the screen here. Okay, so I mentioned that uh, the, the Twitter API used to be a public API and uh, Twitter has decided that um, these resources are not free and this data turns out to be really valuable. And they decided not to just give everybody in the world free unlimited access to all the Twitter data on the planet. Too many people were making too good of money just sort of republishing Twitter data. So Twitter at some point said, we're going to change the rules. Here's an API. And as of such and so a day, that's not the API anymore. Here's the new API. You can't call the API. If we made it. We're going to shut it off. So Twitter basically has changed the rules and everybody changes the rules. Google had a, a V1 maps and a V2 maps and a V3 maps. Just they figured out things they wanted to do better in each successive version of the Google Maps stuff. And so, you know, it's, it's not like we should dislike them for this. It's nice to have these free services. So one of the things that they tend to want to do in these situations is either rate limit the APIs or force you to, to establish identity so that they at least know who's giving the data or they give you a certain amount and they give someone else a certain amount so they won't if you have asked to, for too much data they'll shut you off so they might have uh, various security things so if we take a look at the the uh, documentation for Twitter uh, now this is the documentation sorry for Google Maps so the Google Maps API is pretty uh, friendly you can do 2500 requests per day Okay, you don't have to have any kind of an API, keeps track of all kinds of things. It will tell you if you've exceeded your number of requests per day. Now the interesting thing is, you're only supposed to use this API in conjunction with displaying them on a map. So that's a, an interesting thing. Now, we're not, we didn't display them on a map, we're probably not going to get in trouble for doing five of them, but that's just an interesting thing to give you a sense of these APIs and their purposes and what these companies are expecting, how, you, how these companies are expecting to use it. If we take a look, for example, at Twitter, you have to go and um, learn about the Twitter API and there's some special things that you have to do to, uh, to make use of the Twitter API. So you, uh, it, and you can read about this in, this in this API documentations about authorization and authentication. So there's all kinds of data structures that you can look at, um, like tweets, for example. And so they give you a series of endpoints that you can talk to. And so, for example, this is a way to get the statuses and the mentions on a timeline. And then you get back the data in JSON format. And so here is an example of retrieving data from JSON. Okay. Um, and I'll cover some of the security in a bit. <clears throat> so we can look in the documentation and find out this is a way to get a friends list in Twitter. We can prompt for a Twitter account. Then we can connect the Twitter account, the screen name, and then this little TWURL augment. This is a thing that I wrote that I'll, I'll talk about in a second that adds a bunch of stuff to this URL, which we'll talk about in a second. So, but then it hits this URL, it retrieves it, opens it, reads it all up. The headers, this is how you get the headers if you've retrieved the document using URL lib. And we're going to look for a header called the rate limit remaining. And it will tell you, this way, it will tell you how many calls that you have remaining before it's going to shut you off. Then we parse the JSON data, and then we read through the structure of the JSON data. Okay, and so I won't go into the exact structure of that JSON data, but that is reading through and parsing the JSON data. 
So if we uh, run this, this is what we see. It makes this long URL. It has a outer a, a, an, a, an outer object that has a users attribute in it, and that's a list of users. And each user we see their screen name, their regular name, their last status, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we can pull these things out. In this case, I just am showing like five of my friends and their most recent status. So, so if I can get the security right, I can pull out my information and print it out. So this is using the Twitter API. Now, Twitter wants to know who you are. Twitter uses a technology called OAuth, which is a way to sign web service requests with a signature in a way that data can't be sort of tri um, messed with by the man in the middle. So, so it knows that your application is actually authorized to see it. So there is a page that you go to when you sign in. And so to, to do what I'm doing here, you actually have to sign in on your Twitter account. And then what you do is you authorize an application. And I made an application called Python on my laptop. And then it gives you a set of keys and tokens. And so these keys and tokens are yours. Now, you're, you're supposed to protect them because they're like your password to access the Twitter APIs. Now, you can reset them anytime you like, and you can revoke them anytime you like by just logging in on the Twitter account and then just going, Psh, get rid of the application, or you can reset the keys. But at the end of the day, you go in, you log in, and you create, you grant permission to an application to, your, to use your Twitter identity, and then it gives you some keys to do that. Now, there's a file called hidden.py, hidden.py, where you are supposed to put, when you download these tools, if you want to run these Twitter examples, you have to put these in. Now, don't check these into a public repository, because these things are your identity, okay? Now, if you mess them up and somebody finds out about them, you can always reset them. So this hidden.py is... Use creating, you're creating a variable that has the four pieces of identity information that Twitter is going to demand to see to make sure that you are who you say you are. So I can't behave as you, you can only behave as you because in your Python program, you put these keys that came from the Twitter screen. Okay, so there's a little documentation that says, um, you know, read these things from the screen and put these things in the right place. If you want to get the Twitter examples working, you've got to set up this hidden.py. Okay? So you authorize an application, in this case a piece of, piece of Python code running on your desktop, to access Twitter on your behalf. This is you, Then each request has to be signed using a technology called OAuth. Um, and I should have a thing, um, OAuth net is the documentation for this. And so I wrote a little, uh, little bit of code that you can use um, called augment in this file twurl.py. You take the URL and you augment it. And it reads all those tokens and all the keys from that little hidden.py file and adds a bunch of stuff. So the things that we're adding in our web service call is we're talking to this and the screen name, but all this green stuff has been added by this augment call. And it's calling a bunch of stuff and reading the consumer key and the secrets of the token and all this stuff. Don't worry about this. This is, this is just, you know, ignore this. It's necessary. And just know that augment takes a URL that sort of looks like this and adds all this green stuff based on those keys and secrets that you put in hidden.py. And then, when you send this URL with all this extra stuff, then Twitter knows, oh, that's coming from you. And now I will keep track and I will decide how many requests I will let you have. So you people who are not authorized or applications that are not authorized to read data, Twitter data on your behalf can't do it. This means it is authorized, but it also means that Twitter is deciding how much data to give you in a particular period of time. 
Okay, so you can uh, run those samples on your own. Uh, the book has some examples of how those things run, and you can take a look at that work. So, so in this in this lecture, we sort of got you started. We talked about uh, serialization formats, XML, JSON. We talked about sort of simple and basic parsing of both XML and JSON. Then we talked about XML schema, which is a way to build contracts around the exchanged XML to say this XML complies and this XML does not comply. Then we talked about service-oriented architectures where uh, we break an application up into multiple parts. Then web services. We talked about SOAP. Mostly I said I don't like it. Then we talked about REST and we example, looked at uh, uh, two examples of REST APIs. One is the Google Geocoding API which doesn't require any fancy security, although it is rate limited, and then looked briefly at the Twitter API that is both rate limited and requires OAuth security. And so uh, that kind of summarizes uh, our lecture on web services.